kiss you, boy. Come on. Two Dope Kitchen. Today we're going to be making some bourbon teriyaki salmon. So we're going to start off this recipe with some vegetable oil, a little bit of salt. We're going to use some coarse black pepper. Now I would only suggest using coarse black pepper or a pepper that you grind directly onto the salmon. Do not use any sort of fine uh, black pepper. We're gonna also add some Cajun seasoning. It doesn't matter what brand of Cajun seasoning you use. Um, I just happen to make my own. We're gonna do the same exact thing on the other side. Um, just add some vegetable oil. Um, and also we're gonna make sure we season it up. take this to the pan now in a non-stick pan um, we're gonna get some a vegetable oil pretty hot before we add in our salmon we don't want to add in our salmon to a cold pan skin side down of course now, as you can see it will start to sizzle and cook immediately all right I'm using a non-stick pan so I don't really have too many issues with my skin sticking but I do like to make sure that like a nice amount of the oil does get under. Um, now at this stage, you wanna add some butter and also you wanna add some garlic if you don't. All right, so we're gonna start a teriyaki sauce. We're starting a saucepan with a little bit of oil, a little bit of fresh garlic. We're gonna also use some fresh ginger. You can use garlic paste or ginger paste if you have that as well. Next, I'm gonna add some scallions. Thank you. 
everybody and welcome back to Tudo. We're making some bourbon teriyaki salmon. So we're gonna, or a pepper that you grind directly onto the salmon. Do not use any sort of fine uh, black pepper. We're gonna also add some Cajun seasoning. It doesn't matter what brand of Cajun seasoning you use. Um, I just happen to make my own. We're gonna do the same exact thing on the other side. Um, just add some vegetable oil. Um, and also we're gonna make sure we season it up. Go take this to the pan now in a non-stick pan um, we're gonna get some a vegetable oil pretty hot before we add in our salmon we don't want to add in our salmon to a cold pan skin side down of course now, as you can see it will start to sizzle and cook immediately all right I'm using a non-stick pan so I don't really have too many issues with my skin sticking but I do like to make sure that like a nice amount of the oil does get under. Um, now at this stage, you wanna add some butter and also you wanna add some garlic if you don't have any garlic herb butter or any sort of infused butters. Um, but I just happen to have some garlic herb butter so I didn't really have to, I didn't really want to put any fresh garlic in because I had some already infused in my butter. So we're gonna start our teriyaki sauce. We're gonna start in a saucepan with a little bit of oil, a little bit of fresh garlic. We're gonna also use some fresh ginger. You can use garlic paste or ginger paste if you have that as well. Next, I'm gonna add some scallions. Now I'm gonna go ahead and add my brown sugar. Also some soy sauce. Go ahead and mix that all up. You can see the glaze forming already to be honest. Now we're gonna add some oyster sauce. And we're gonna also add some hoisin sauce. Now we're gonna add lastly our crushed red pepper. And really, our glaze is already there, but we have one more ingredient to add. The bourbon. Now you can use any sort of bourbon you'd like. Uh, I just am just using some Jim Beam. But if you're gonna just be cooking with this and you don't plan on drinking it, definitely just get some cheap bourbon. Not a big deal. All right, now our glaze is finished. Garnish it up with some sesame seeds or something, some parsley, whatever, whatever you like. All right, guys. All right, so we're gonna jump right into this one. I'm seasoning two fresh salmon fillets with a little bit of salt and pepper. That's all you need for this because these are fresh and the flavor of these are amazing. All right, so I'm gonna flip these over. Now, if you wanna keep the skin on, then you're more than welcome to. I like to keep it on just because I like to eat the skin. That's some weird shit, but I really love eating the skin. It is delicious. Um, next, we're gonna work on our crust. Um, I have some crushed almonds right here. Um, you can buy some fresh ones and like put them in the blender. Also have some seasoned Italian breadcrumbs. I have some butter so I can bind it all together. I have a tablespoon of thyme. Also, a uh, fourth teaspoon of uh, fresh garlic. And go ahead and mix all of that up. Mm -hmm. 
Now to make, to cut through the richness and the fattiness, I'm using some lemon zest. It really makes everything pop. I mean, lime zest, I'm so dumb. You can use lemon zest too, actually, if you want. But I like, I'm using lime zest because that's what I had at the time. This shit is amazing. Like, I'm not joking with you whatsoever. I know I tell you that vegetable oil all the time, but please use olive oil. It just tastes much better and it just fits everything perfectly. Go ahead and get that nice and hot. Then we're gonna put our fish in there. It has to be, um, I wanna get a nice little beautiful sear on that fish. And this is the problem you're gonna deal with when you keep the skin on. Um, especially if you have a non-stick pan like me. Uh, the skin will start to come off. But for someone who doesn't know, like if you don't know how to fillet a fish or like to remove the skin, this might be the best way because it's just gonna come off. It's gonna peel off easily versus having to cut it and possibly cut the flesh of the, you know, of the salmon and all that stuff. See, I, I like it crisp up, it's so delicious. I'm, I know I'm weird, I really am weird, but it's delicious, like it's amazingly delicious. Oh shoot, don't allow your fish to do that. Like, this is fresh salmon, it is not cheap. Do not let your salmon break. But yeah, go ahead and add your crust to it, to the top. Um, now I did turn off the heat, even though it seems as though I did it. I did turn off the fire um, because we're gonna put this whole pan in the oven. Now you can transfer this to like a a uh, some type of baking sheet or something, but I don't. I like to touch the fish as less as possible, you know. Um, but I'm just packing on my crust tightly, and I'm gonna put it in the oven. And when it comes out, it'll look nice and golden brown like that, and that is delicious. Now just go ahead and add some parsley to the top. You can add some chopped cilantro or something, and there you go. Almond crusted salmon fillets. Welcome back, guys. Today, we're gonna start off with the spice pan. We're gonna use two tablespoons of salt, one tablespoon of coarse black pepper, two teaspoons of garlic powder, maybe three, two teaspoons of onion powder, Also, we're gonna use a teaspoon of cayenne. Also, a teaspoon of adobo. And lastly, a teaspoon of lemon pepper. Now go ahead and mix this all up. Um, nice and incorporated. If you have a few clumps, that's okay, I guess. Just try not to have them in there. Try to get those out. Next, we're gonna go ahead and use this on our salmon. Now, this is like a very, very, very developed seasoned salt that is can be used for a number of things, in particular seafood, um, like fish and whatnot. Um, but remember that it is pretty salt heavy. So just keep that in mind. So you could also just use this and then maybe hit it with a little bit of garlic powder or something like that if you wanted to. But honestly, you could just do like I'm doing and just only use that. Now I like to drizzle my skin with just a little bit of oil before I put them in the pan. Um, and now I have my cast iron skillet heating up. It is getting hot, you guys. Now it's not on high, but it's somewhere around like medium high. If you just want that joint hot. And you want to be able to add your salmon to the pan. And when you add it to the pan, skin down, uh, it should start to immediately start to sear. You'll hear it, it's loud. Um, and when it's ready, it will, uh, it will flip. It will let you know when it's ready. I promise you, I promise you it will let you know. You can go ahead and test it. You can see, you can feel how crispy this skin is. Next, I'm gonna add a half stick of butter. Let that entire stick of butter start to melt. Um, don't worry, now we're gonna add about four crushed cloves of garlic. Also, I'm using a little bit of shallots here. Next, I'm using some fresh sage, some fresh rosemary, some fresh thyme, and a little bit of fresh parsley. <clears throat> parsley. Um, now, this is the stage where you kind of treat it like a steak. You know, this is butter basting essentially. So, you know, just really letting those ingredients cook in the butter. And then I'm incorporating those ingredients on top of my salmon. So not only is my skin getting super flavorful, but it's getting even more crispy. So like, y'all just keep watch. Like, this is the way to do it. Um, 
Look at that. Keep it going. All right, now that's pretty much it. Um, you can take them out of the pan. You don't want to overcook your salmon. So, you know, after you butter base them, they are pretty much done. Because remember, we started off on the skin side, so we pretty much cooked it halfway on the skin side. So yeah, guys, um, that is a nice herb butter salmon. And as you can see, my skin is crispy. You might want to use a knife. But yeah, salmon flakes is delicious. What's up everybody and welcome back to Tudo Kitchen. Today we're going to be making lemon pepper salmon with a nice butter sauce. So I have here a small little salmon filet, nothing huge. Um, just one of those like little five, six dollar salmon, uh, individual salmon you can get from the grocery store. Um, just go ahead and cut that in half. Next, I'm just going to go ahead and season it up with some nice kosher salt. Now I'm gonna go ahead and just put some oil on it. I forgot to put this on first. If you wanna put it on first, go ahead. Do it in a different order, but just add some oil, some salt, some pepper. And don't be afraid to season this nicely, but make sure you season, even, season evenly as well. I'm gonna go ahead and add some garlic powder. This is not a super crazy recipe, y'all. Super simple, super easy to make, and super quick. All right, now I've made my own herb seasoning. I'll put the recipe for that below. Um, but if you don't have an herb seasoning, just use like potentially like Italian seasoning mixed with garlic powder, basically. All right, now go ahead and take a lemon. We're just gonna go ahead and zest it on top. If you don't have a lemon zester, you can attempt to use the smaller side of a cheese grater. It should work basically the same way. Go ahead and rub that in. It's super easy. Like, as you can see, we're pretty much halfway done with our recipe already. Um, only thing we haven't added just yet is our seafood seasoning, so pretty much any sort of old bay. Um, but basically, just do the exact same thing to the back side, the skin side. All right, now let's go ahead and put these in the oven uh, at 400 degrees for no more, no more than 15 minutes. All right, now we're gonna add a quarter cup of lemon juice. Um, I'm also gonna add a quarter cup of white wine. Also, I have some shallots and uh, garlic chopped up here. Um, if you don't have any shallots and garlic, uh, at least shallots, make sure you use yellow onion or white onion. Um, now, we're just gonna pretty much let our mixture start to simmer. We're gonna add a half a stick of butter in there now. Um, now this is on low to medium heat, so you just want it to go really, really low and slow. Um, it'll start to form a nice thick butter sauce after it melts and starts to thicken up, as you can see here. Mm -hmm. Now everything will try to separate, but you just keep it moving and that's it. All you gotta do is keep it low, keep it moving, and it will start to emulsify, which means basically just kind of combine together. Then boom, look at this. We have a nice butter sauce to go on top. Uh, so delicious. Now you could add some extra things in your butter sauce too, like maybe a little Parmesan if you wanted to. Um, whatever. But um, I hope you guys enjoy, y'all. This was a really delicious recipe. Really quick. Really easy. Um, yeah, y'all. kitchen today i'm going to teach you guys how to turn this boring ass box of jiffy cornbread mix into something that could easily rival the best homemade cornbread whenever i'm using something that is mm, i would say like store-bought 
and I want to alternate it. I just usually just look at the ingredient list and kind of go from there. But I'm using two boxes of Jiffy cornbread mix for this recipe. And the particular store I bought them from, they were a little bit lumpy. So just, just get rid of some of the lumps. That's okay. Um, the little lumps are going to be there, but the big lumps you definitely want to get rid of. Not a big deal though for the small ones. Next, I like to make a little bit of a divot in the middle. Um, I make that divot so I can easily incorporate my wet ingredients. I'm using two eggs for this because I'm using two boxes of Jiffy cornbread mix. Next, I replace the heavy cream. I mean, the, the whole milk with heavy cream. So I'm using two, -third, two thirds cup of heavy cream instead of the whole milk. And also I add two thirds cup of sweet and condensed milk. This stage is not actually optional if you're following this recipe. That's the secret ingredient which really makes this go to the next level. Now I'm using a spatula just to fold the ingredients. I don't really like to whisk them or mix them. So if you have a spatula, please try to use that. Now I'm using a 10 inch cast iron pan for my vessel, but you can use any sort of pan that it'll fit in. Um, yeah, I'm using two tablespoons of butter. Try to get all of that butter in the pan. It's important, every single drop of it. Next, we're gonna go ahead and just put our batter in this cast iron pan. Again, if you have like a muffin tin or even a nine by 13 pan, uh, that's perfectly fine. Yeah, go ahead and just, you know, even that out. Now I've preheated my oven to 400 degrees. Um, so I'm gonna take my cornbread mix and I'm gonna put it on the bottom rack. Now I'm putting it on the bottom rack starting off because I want it to just start to get a nice, a little bit golden. Um, I did that for about 12 minutes. So now we're gonna take a half a stick of butter and we're gonna start to brown that in a, in a saucepan. Now I'm using a fourth cup of brown sugar and also a fourth cup of honey. We're gonna turn this into a glaze. This is gonna be a bit of a glaze butter, a butter glaze, honey butter. A brown butter honey glaze. Ah, there we go. I like that. Um, so we're going to go ahead and just mix that up. And we're going to, I'm doing this on about medium heat. Now I like to also add a tablespoon of vanilla in there just for some added flavor. After about 12 minutes, 12 to 15 minutes, you want to go ahead and put your cornbread maybe away from the direct heat just so it can start to get nice and done in the middle. And as we can see, it comes out perfectly clean after about 20 minutes total in the oven. Um, now, if you notice the position of my my little holes with my fork, it's perfectly, almost perfectly in, in line with how I will cut my cornbread. As you can see, they disappear. Voila. <laughs> now I'm going to just, I was able to cut it into eight perfectly sized pieces. So yes, keep that in mind. Um, now let's go ahead and take our brown butter glaze and we're just going to pour it over the top. Mm. So amazing. Like, I didn't actually realize it would taste this delicious. Really, like you couldn't tell that it wasn't homemade to be honest with you. Now look at that. Go ahead and try to get you a slice and go ahead and test it out because it's just, look at that. It's moist, it's warm sweet. Now go ahead and get you a bite. Welcome to episode two of what's in your kitchen today. I'm going to be using some leftover hot dogs. I got also have a little bit of bacon left and I also have just this box of lonely eyes cornbread mix that I planned on doing nothing with. Um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and take these out and I'm just going to just cut these in half. Um, I don't have any sticks, so I just prefer to just make a uh, bacon corn dog minis, you know? So go ahead and cut the bacon in half because we're going to be wrapping these hot dogs with bacon. Now you wanna go ahead and wrap it extremely tight, as tight as you can possibly get it. Um, the bacon will, like the fat will kind of stick to itself, so it pretty much should do the work for you. After that, you just wanna go ahead and do the same thing to all the hot dogs. Uh, I did have five hot dogs, so since I cut them in half, I have 10 of them here. And just go ahead and line this up on a uh, sheet pan. I'm using a rack, of course. Y'all know why I'm using a rack. I just, you know, I want the drippings to drip down in the pan and not on my food, you know. 
but you know we all do love bacon fat and just go ahead and throw those in the oven until the bacon is completely nice and crispy next we're going to go ahead and work on a corn dog mix i'm using again some jiffy cornbread mix just the yellow kind um yeah and then go ahead and just follow the directions which requires one egg a third cup of milk now just go ahead and mix that up you can use a whisk if you like i'm just using uh, you know a hand mixer just because i don't feel like doing any work today all right so this is when my recipe changes a little bit i've added an i added a third cup of water because you want it a little bit thinner than like traditional cornbread mix um just so it can easily coat it um next i'm going to go ahead and add a uh, fourth teaspoon of baking soda and a third cup of, um, what the hell is that? Flour, yes, all-purpose flour. Um, I hit a brain fart like a motherfucker there. All right, so now that the bacon is done, you know, the hot dogs are already done, but yeah, that's how it's gonna look. Now just go ahead and pretty much just dip everything in the batter. It's very, very, very self-explanatory. Now, my oil was heated to like 375, so yeah, I'm using a little, like y'all see, I'm using a little like skillet shit thing here. So yeah, y'all go ahead and y'all can just put it, pretty much heat this up on a stove, but I'm just using a skillet just cause this is all I'm frying today. I don't need to use too much oil. But yeah, you don't want to overcrowd your skillet or your pot or your deep fryer, whatever you're using. Um, and by no means, these things are not fucking pretty. <laughs> these things look like a goddamn bootleg, bootleg Twinkie. Like these, these, these are a little atrocious, but they're fucking delicious. And they're, they're real. They're so authentic. Like you just, it's better. You know what I'm saying? It's better than just like some, some microwavable corn dogs you'll get from the supermarket. Like these are fucking amazing. Yeah, but you know, just go ahead and drain those on the rack like that. Then after that, you can go ahead and eat up. These things were fucking amazing. And they have a little bit of a crunch to them. And I love that. Like that crunch is fucking, it does it for me. Like it makes me realize that these are real. Yo, peace. What's up everybody and welcome back to Tudo Kitchen. My name is Chef Lynn and today we're going to be doing another Jiffy Cornbread hack. Now the last one that we did did so well <laughs> and you guys gave me so much positive feedback that I decided to make another kind. Um, I'm doing a Southern Butter Pecan flavor and I really think that you're going to like this one. Maybe even a lot better than the last one. So let's go. All right, y'all. So we're going to start off by talking about these ingredients. What I have here is two boxes of Jiffy cornbread mix. I have about a half a cup of pecans, pecans, whatever you want to call them. I have four eggs, which we're only going to need two of them. We got some brown sugar back here. Again, only around a half a cup or so. Also have about a half a cup of sweetened condensed milk. Also some Bacardi rum, and lastly, some maple syrup. All right, so we're gonna go ahead by starting out and dumping our two packages of Jiffy cornbread mix in a bowl. Now, you guys know that when it comes to box recipes, I always tell you guys to make sure you get the lumps out just because they have a tendency of being really lumpy, but let's do that, don't skip that step. All right, now you guys know I also tell you to put a crater in the middle of all sort of baked good things and especially when you're incorporating dry and wet ingredients it just works a little easier we're going to start off with two-thirds cup of whole milk 
heavy cream or half and half. You can also put in two eggs. All right, now we're gonna add about a half a cup of sweetened condensed milk. All right, go ahead and mix that up nicely. Making sure to incorporate all your wet and dry ingredients evenly. All right, let's next move on to our cast iron pan. As you can see, I'm taking two tablespoons of butter. Um, it was room temperature butter and I'm just completely just smearing it all over the cast iron pan. Make sure you cover each and every inch of this pan. Now we're gonna go ahead and add our cornbread mix in there. All right, make sure you smooth that out a little bit. Now we're gonna go ahead and add our pecans on there. Now, you know, you could chop them up a bit if you like, but I just like to keep mine a little bit whole just for the aesthetics. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and take some of our brown sugar and sprinkle that on top. You don't need to use the whole thing, but just about half of it. Now we're gonna go ahead and put our cast iron pan in our oven at 400 degrees for about 15 to 20 minutes or until golden brown. And now we're gonna go ahead and put our other two tablespoons of butter in a pan and let that get nice and melted. And we're gonna go ahead and add a tablespoon of brown sugar in there. Mix that up, make sure, be careful not to let this burn. We're gonna now add about a shot of our Bacardi rum or about, about one ounce or so. All right, now that that's starting to boil, we're gonna go ahead and now we're gonna add in about a fourth cup of maple syrup. If you don't have maple syrup, then this recipe ain't gonna work. <laughs> you need to get maple syrup, guys. Um, go ahead and let that boil and bubble. And we're gonna also let it simmer until we got a nice sauce. All right, after about 15 or 20 minutes, we're gonna go ahead and take our cornbread out the oven and we're gonna start to cut it just like I'm doing now. I let it cool for about five minutes just because I don't like things that are piping out at the oven and then immediately cut it. You really shouldn't do that with anything. Um, but just take your time guys. It's a little bit harder to cut because there's pecans on top, but that's okay. If you just take your time, you'll literally get through this. All right, after you cut it in eight equal slices, we're gonna go ahead and take our sauce and just drizzle it all over the top. Do it however you like. You can start from the middle, you can start from the outside. I kind of like to make a little spiral. Um, we're not gonna completely drench this with it because it's not, it's not, it's not necessary, but there we go, guys. I hope you guys can enjoy this Southern Butter Pecan, and I hope I can change your outlook on Jiffy Cornbread and how to hack it. Enjoy, guys. Welcome back to the kitchen today. We're gonna to be doing yet another Jiffy cornbread recipe. Now, this recipe is gonna be a little bit different. We're gonna be doing sort of a brunch recipe. We're gonna be doing chicken and waffles. Now, I got a waffle maker over Christmas. One of my bestest friends in the world got me one and I was so excited to get it, but I didn't get a chance to use it yet. So I decided to make some chicken and waffles, but I decided why not use some Jiffy? So let's make it. For this recipe, we're gonna need salt, black pepper, garlic powder, a little bit of onion powder, and also some Cajun seasoning. I like to use the spice blend for any sort of basic fried chicken recipe. Uh, so that can be chicken tenders, chicken nuggets. Honestly, you could even use a fried fish too if you'd like. Now let's go ahead and season our flour with a little bit of Cajun seasoning as well as some garlic powder. We're gonna start to prepare our chicken tenders to be breaded. Uh, we're gonna put it in our flour first. Make sure you shake off the excess. 
Now we're gonna go ahead and move over to our eggs. Now, you know, once you start to get used to doing it, you'll just basically start to develop your own little method. But uh, for this, I'm using flour eggs flour, but you could use flour eggs breadcrumbs or flour eggs, even cornmeal if you'd like. Again, be sure to knock off and shake off all the excess flour. You don't want all the extra stuff in your uh, oil. All right, I got my vegetable oil nice and hot. As you can see, I tested it a little bit before I dropped them in. And I just, you know, try to find a space for your last one. But, you know, if you're making more, just make sure you use a pot that's the size for the amount of chicken tenders you have. All right, once they're golden brown, you can go ahead and remove them from the vegetable oil. I like to use the paper towel in a bowl method, you know, it's nice and old fashioned, but if you have like a cooling rack or something, that'll work. All right, remember guys, food safety is key. You wanna always make sure you're temping your chicken, always. This is the temperature I got fresh out the hot oil. For our waffle mix, we're gonna use one box of Jiffy cornbread mix. Make sure you get out any lumps if you do have any. We're gonna use two thirds cups of heavy cream, one egg, two tablespoons of salted butter, and also one tablespoon of vanilla. Go ahead and spray with your waffle machine down with any sort of nonstick spray you have. I'm using a, a butter spray. Go ahead and just put that in there. You can use any sort of waffle maker. Don't be pressed to use the waffle maker I'm using, guys. Boom. And just make sure it's nice and golden brown like your waffle maker's instruction says to make them. And we're gonna go ahead and move it over. Now, I'm gonna list the recipe below for my spicy maple syrup because I don't really wanna make a recipe for that just yet. But I really hope you guys enjoy. It's a quick and simple recipe and a nice and nice dope hack you can do with Jiffy Cornbread. What's up everybody and welcome back to Two Dope Kitchen. Today we're going to be making some amazing ass jerk chicken alfredo. Now this spice blend in particular kind of takes a lot of ingredients so and I don't really feel like just saying them all so I'm just going to list it here. Okay so you guys can use any chicken breasts, boneless chicken thighs. I'm just using tenderloins just because they were on sale. So just go ahead and use the spice blend on the chicken breasts or the chicken thighs, whatever you got, and just mix it up and season them generously because this is a very, very flavorful recipe. Now I'm gonna go ahead and drop some peppers and onions and also my chicken on some type of skillet pan, some type of nonstick pan if you have one. Uh, whether it's a skillet or you know the pans, whatever you got. Um, nonstick just works a little bit better in this case. Uh, you know, less smoke going on, just less things happening. So yeah, definitely uh, if you have a nonstick pan. If not, if you have a regular pan, then go ahead, use that too. And you know, this is all I'm doing, just putting them on the pans, just getting it some nice, beautiful color. Cause that is very, very important to me because all that color equates to flavor. Um, you know, may not always be the flavor that you're looking for, but it achieves some sort of flavor. And all right, I'm just kind of taking my onions and peppers beyond the sweating point. I don't really want them to just be sweated out. I actually want to get them some nice color as well as the chicken. Now you see how my chicken has nice, it's nicely seared. Like, you know, it's almost like it was on an outdoor grill. Like that's kind of the, the look and the flavor profile I'm going for, especially with something like jerk. I don't really think that baking 
like Jerk in a situation that kind of does Jerk any justice. I feel like Jerk always has nice grill marks, some type of sear, a bunch of layered flavor. And like, you know, just put it in the oven just or even like a fryer or something that's just not really giving it the justice it deserves. Mm-mm-mm. All right. So once you get all that nice, pretty color on there. You know, you just want to go ahead and take it off. Make sure not to burn it. You want to get it nice and colored, but not burn. Not dried out either, especially if you're working with like chicken breast. Um, so that's all you want to do. Just make sure it's cooked to 165 and you'll be good. Um, now the onions and peppers, because I, I have a stovetop griddle, I was kind of able to control the temperature on one side of, or the, or another of the grill pan. So, you know, just be careful with that. You might have to take off your peppers and onions a little bit earlier than the chicken if you don't have uh, a grill pan like me for the stovetop or like if you only have the electronic kind that allows you to only control one solid temperature. Now we're gonna go ahead and take one stick of butter and also some minced garlic and just pretty much just let that go. Um, listen, I think I have my temperature up just slightly too high, but you know how it is just walking away from shit. Don't do that. Just kind of make sure that your temperature is pretty low because you don't want your, your butter to burn at all. Like you really don't need that in your Alfredo whatsoever. And you just want to kind of let that just go, guys. Um, and once it's completely melted, then we're going to move on to the next step. All right, so now what I have here is around two and a half cups of half and half. Now, the reason why I'm using two and a half cups of half and half versus, you know, uh, some heavy cream or something like that. It's because I'm cheap as fuck and I don't really feel like spending a lot of money on heavy cream. So I'm just using uh, some half and half, which works just as fine. Trust me. And don't let anyone else tell you it doesn't work just as well. Half and half works beautifully for Alfredo. Just go ahead and, like I said, season it up with a little bit of salt and pepper. Now, this is where it's the most important. This is the most important part of this entire Alfredo recipe. You need freshly grated Parmesan cheese if you don't grade your own. Um, the reason why you need freshly grated parm is because like the fake shit comes with like some type of shit that doesn't melt well. I don't know what it is, but it does not fucking melt well. It's just fake. That's the issue. It's like plastic cheese. So fresh, the fresh stuff will thicken up water if it really had to. So you get what I'm saying? Half and half and some freshly grated out uh, parm or, you know, parm will just do it. So that's what you want to do. I had an eight ounce container there and you can just add half at a time. That's what I like to do. Mind you, my temperature is very low. Um, and afterwards, guys, this is what you kind of come up with, guys. Like, it, you get a very beautiful Alfredo sauce. And you just kind of want this to thicken up to a nappe consistency. Nappe consistency is pretty much pancake batter. Um, I kind of like mine a little bit thicker than that, just because I don't really pour my Alfredo on top. But yeah, I like to take a little bit of cayenne pepper and also a little bit of nutmeg. It just gives it a different level of flavor. I don't know what it is. A little bit of both will just does it. Um, and yeah, like as you see how thick this is really getting. And I'm just adding the rest of that container in there. Um, I like this to be nice and thick, nice and beautiful. Um, you know, it's, it's a very well holding sauce. It doesn't break. You know, you don't see any breakage of the butter or anything. Like this is a perfect Alfredo sauce, guys. Now, guys, we are finished. Jerk Chicken Alfredo. You can use this for any kind of pasta you like. And that is it, y'all. Today, I'm going to be teaching you guys how to turn this born as cheeseburger helper that's supposedly made from 100% real cheese. I'm going to teach you guys how to make, how to upgrade this and make this just a tiny bit better. You don't got to, you guys don't got to follow the instructions that are on a box. If you do, you're going to fuck yourself in the ass. Make... Follow what it says to add your own twist. Do something different. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and start off by cutting one onion up. Now, I'm using a medium-sized onion. If you wanna use something a little bit smaller or a little bit bigger, you're more than welcome to. Um, I just like to go ahead and small dice it up. You know, small-ish, I guess you can say. Um, yeah, and 
pretty much that's what we're going to be using this onion we're going to go ahead and just sweat this onion out um, we want this onion to brown a little bit but this just gives an extra layer of flavor to this recipe it doesn't call for an onion but guess what we're going to put one in there next we're going to put my favorite vegetable in the world bacon we're going to use just about a half a pack of bacon and listen don't be an idiot you see all this stupid shit i'm doing with my knife in my hand while i'm trying to deal with pulling shit out the pack that's a good way to cut yourself some people like to gesticulate with the knife while they talk and point at things this is a no so please don't be like me go ahead and cut up this bacon into dices now here's what i suggest i cut it too small um I actually suggest cutting them a little bit larger. Um, don't be afraid to maybe cut the bacon into like strips of like maybe, you know, cut it down in like larger, you know, smaller but larger strips. And we're pretty much just going ahead and start this in the pan. Um, we just render all the fat out of the bacon. Um, we're going to just be just pretty much browning the bacon. It doesn't matter. Um, just try not to burn it. My pan was up a little too high, but you can just go ahead and turn it down a little bit. Make sure, you know, not to burn it. Keep the bacon moving. And pretty much after you do that, um, we're going to start to add our onions to it. Now, what I love about bacon is that bacon produces its own oil, which means I don't have to add a single drop of any other type of oil besides the bacon fat. So everything is just cooked with flavor. Like, there's a smokiness between me and like in the entire dish, like the onions taste amazing, everything because the base layer, this bacon mirepoix, as you like to call it possibly. Now we're gonna start our mix. So I use salt and pepper, a teaspoon of garlic powder, seafood, and onion powder, and also a little bit of uh, a little bit of steak seasoning. Just go ahead and add your ground beef to this. Um, you don't want to let your ground beef like be too chunky so you want to make sure you just go ahead and break that up before you add your seasoning to it now you know y'all know how i love my spice blends and i really enjoy making spice blends for for things like this so just go ahead and add there it might seem like it's a generous amount but trust me it's just enough um just enough because we're going to be adding the seasoning from the hamburger helper as well um, just pretty much mix this until it's brown um, in this case I'm really gonna cook the ground beef all the way through this is not like you know a normal cheeseburger I might you know keep a little bit of medium or something going on like that uh, so yeah you just want to cook it well done just like that now I'm gonna go ahead and sh drain all the excess liquid out of the pan and I'm put it back on the, the heat now we're gonna go ahead and add one full can of beef broth. Now you can use beef stock if you'd like, I'm just using the broth. So now here's a little package that came in with the hamburger helper. Supposedly this is what contains the real cheese, but it looks something like fucking Cheeto dust to me, so I don't understand how that is 100% real cheese, but hey, okay. Um, yeah, just mix that up. Make sure you you know break down a little clump from the, the Cheeto dust powder. Uh, and yeah, it is. You just want to use the beef broth just to replace the water. It just adds more flavor. It's more delicious, and your whole house is going to smell amazing. Like your neighbor is going to be knocking on your door asking you what the fuck you make for dinner because it's going to smell that good. All right, so now we're just going to go ahead and let that simmer. Now we're going to add just about two cups of milk. Um, I'm using whole milk. Um, you could possibly use some heavy cream in this. I'm thinking I'm gonna do maybe like a heavy cream, whole milk type of mixture for now on. Um, now just go ahead and add the pasta from the hamburger helper box. And as you see, you know, you see it starting to form its own little like cheese sauce, you know? And that's what is amazing about this whole entire thing. Now, I just used about maybe three tablespoons uh, worth of tomato paste. I just want to thicken it up a little bit and add a little bit of depth of flavor with that, you know, kind of give it that little ketchup effect. You know, you know, like on the cheeseburger, I think it really will work and it just works perfectly that way. Now, you want to go ahead and turn your heat down to a simmer. Um, 
you want to go ahead and cover it and you want to do pretty much cover it until the pasta gets nice and tender um your sauce will start to thicken up naturally but you want to keep stirring it with throughout just because you don't want it to stick now i'm going to go ahead and add some shredded cheese there um if you like i just bought like some shredded cheese that was in the bag um i know there's a lot of people who are completely against that kind of cheese but you know i don't give a fuck i'm just doing this uh, just to make something quick for tonight, it's supposed to be basic. And if you'd like to shred your own, you're more than welcome to, but make sure you use sharp cheddar. It makes a difference in this recipe to use sharp cheddar entirely. Now, just pretty much just keep adding cheese to your dis discretion. So as cheesy as you want it, as little or as much as you like, you know, me, I like to see, str I like to see a stringy mac and cheese. That is my thing. Like it's nothing sexier than that kind of cheese point. Now I'm just adding some scallions in here. Now you can add anything else you like, but I'm just adding some scallions, add another death of flavor and some more color. Mm, mm, mm. This is amazing, guys. And I hope you guys didn't miss me too much because, uh, yeah. And I hope that you guys really enjoyed this recipe. Um, this was probably one of my favorites. It's super easy to make and it's just an upgrade, simple recipe, y'all. Uh. So yeah, I hope y'all enjoyed this. Bacon, cheeseburger, hamburger. We're gonna just go jump right into this one. So what you wanna do first is go ahead and melt a half a stick of butter or one fourth cup of unsalted butter in a pan. You don't want to use margarine or no bullshit like that. Then next go ahead and add one fourth cup of flour. Now this process is called making a roux. Um, a roux is a thickening agent that can be used for soups or sauces, gravies, etc., etc. This, in this case, we're using it for a cheese sauce. Now, the rule of thumb is usually you want to add a hot product to a cold roux or a cold uh, product to a hot roux, which I'm doing. I used uh, pretty much a pint of heavy cream. And just go ahead and give that a nice mix. Um, it's going to look really weird. I pulled out my. Uh, I pulled out my whisk for this one just to help break up any clumps that might have formed and just to help it, you know, just help keep it moving. All right, at this point, I've, I've added pretty much like a cup of milk. You wanna add whole, a cup of whole milk. I forgot to record that part like, like an idiot, but go ahead and just add that. And also take a minute to season it with a little bit of salt and pepper. All right, give that a nice little whisk again, cause you want everything to taste good. And I'm using milk as well, just because I don't want to use too much heavy cream. I want it to be rich, but not too rich. A lot of people like to use sharp cheddar, but I like to use mild cheddar. So I'm pretty much going to use a whole bag of mild cheddar for this recipe. Give that a nice little mix. Now I do recommend sharp cheddar because it does give you that flavor you're probably chasing. Um, I also like to use Kobe Jack because I feel like Kobe Jack gives me enough of that sharpness. Oh uh, yeah, we're gonna go ahead and start boiling our pasta uh, while everything is melting, by the way. I like to put a lid on it just so it boils faster. See, your cheese sauce to start melting a little bit, it should be really ooey and gooey, like like ooey gooey, gooey ooey, whatever the fuck you wanna you wanna say this cheese sauce is, that's what this cheese sauce should be. Um, it should be like a perfect consistency. Then I like to go ahead and just prepare my dish. I like to use butter. Some people use like spray on Pam or something. I actually like to brush on some butter in the actual casserole dish. And I go ahead and just add my noodles in there, my noodles, my pasta. Why black people always call everything noodles? I mean, every, I mean, I guess it is noodles. We'll be like, oh yeah, go ahead and get some macaroni noodles, some, some noodles, uh, you know what I'm saying? But go ahead and just go ahead and add your cheese sauce to it. Mix it up nice and good. Uh, oh man, look, look at that shit. Like that shit is really fucking delicious. Like it should be, this is cheese porn right now. Like this is straight R rated triple X cheese porn like kids close your eyes because this is porn i should get into cheese pornography i should just hold, do a whole segment of just cheese pornography just loads and loads of just cheese pornography oh my gosh i'm so excited up for this right now just go ahead and continue mixing it up um 
it gets crazy because not only are we going to just mix this up the way we're doing like it will spill over the sides a little bit because my casserole dish wasn't that that big um if you have a bigger casserole dish then use it just so it doesn't become messy but yeah just go ahead and add some kobe jack on the top if you like i do it personally because i like a little bit of a crust i don't i like a crust without breadcrumbs and yeah when you're finished it should be this delicious ooey gooey delicious ass mac and cheese So we're gonna start this recipe by cutting up a bell pepper. Now, listen, I'm cheating just a little bit because I bought these peppers from the store already pre-cut. Um, but listen, it would cost way more than a dollar to cut it all, to have four different kind of peppers, and we all know this. So yeah, we're just gonna go ahead and cut these, not too small, um, not for this recipe anyway. And next, we're gonna just go ahead and dice a uh, dice an onion. Now, I'm using a half an onion. Um, it's a pretty decent size. You can use any kind of onion you like. Probably not red onion though. Go ahead and heat up a pan. Now, I'm using vegetable oil. You guys know I like vegetable oil, but if you got canola oil, um, corn oil, anything will work. Um, just go ahead and throw some of that in there. Um, you wanna make sure you just get some nice color on this. Now go ahead and season this up. You guys know we gotta season every layer of every part of this recipe in order for it to just have that pizzazz. Now I added a little bit of garlic in there. I'm about a, about a tablespoon, should be good. And yeah, just go ahead and mix that up. Like you just wanna add some color in there. You don't want any burnt at all, to be honest. Now we're gonna work on our chorizo. Now this is one of my favorite kinds of chorizo to work with. It's already pre-packaged now, but if you, can get a hold of like some straight up fresh freshly made chorizo go ahead but this is what i have locally to me um i like my chorizo extremely spicy too yeah now go ahead once you take it out the pack go ahead and cut this up now you can take this out the casing and kind of have it like ground but i just prefer mine to just be diced up it doesn't really matter whatever your preference is now go ahead and throw that in there now this already smells amazing. Like chorizo smells amazing from the gate. You just wanna pretty much get some color in there. Make sure you render out all the fat from the chorizo. Now the chorizo fat is gonna be kind of red because of all the spices and things that are in the chorizo. We're gonna work on our spice blend. Now add a teaspoon of salt and pepper, a teaspoon of garlic powder, a teaspoon of cumin, a teaspoon of cayenne pepper, a teaspoon of adobo, a teaspoon of chili flakes, and a teaspoon of smoked paprika, or regular paprika if you have it. All right, and just go ahead and pretty much mix that up. Now we're gonna add uh, a half pound of ground beef in there. And we're gonna go also season our ground beef with our spice blend and the rest of the mixture. And just go ahead and mix this up. Now this is amazing, guys. Like, this is at the point when you realize that you have created something amazing. <laughs> like, it's not even my creation per se, but this is definitely my recipe. I never looked at anyone else's recipe. I know they exist, but yeah. I had some fresh cilantro in there. And again, guys, if you guys wanna see this full recipe, um, go ahead and check out my channel um, and my website at tutokitchen.com. And yeah, go ahead and add some corn in there. Now, adding corn, into the recipe is actually essential because it's that sweet that battles that heat and that's the perfect thing combo that you need like that sweet and spicy is awesome and it just goes well it just adds another layer of freshness to this recipe just making it just feel a little bit better it's, it brings it home a little bit better now i'm going to go ahead and add two cups of tomato sauce that's all you really need and we're going to just go ahead and mix this up now two is perfect because it kind of, once it renders down and cooks down a little bit, it kind of becomes almost pasty. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and add um, some lemon zest or lime zest, whichever one you wanna add, and we're gonna add some more fresh cilantro in there. Just go ahead. Now, I did add a fourth cup because I wanted to thin it out just a tiny bit, a tad bit, not too much, uh, but a little bit. Now, that's up to preference. Now, I don't like mine to be too chilly, chilly-like, but yeah, make sure you season that with a little bit of salt and pepper, guys. And listen, this is self-explanatory. You guys know how to cook pasta at this point. This is not any fresh homemade stuff. This is straight box dry pasta. So, you know, just drop it in the water with some oil, salt, and pepper. Um, just to, you know, that's, all, that's it. That's all you need to do. Just cook that down until it's perfectly al dente. And you guys know that is like perfect te texture. Pretty much when it sticks to a wall is what you want to do. 
All right, now we're gonna go ahead and just drain that pasta and we're gonna go ahead and toss that into a, with a little bit of salt and pepper at the end, even though it's a little seasoned, but you know, oil, salt, pepper. Now, what I'm using here is one of those things used for like a roast where you wanna carve something, but yeah, it can be, it can double as like a little fork for a spaghetti. And just go ahead and spoon on your, your, your mixture there, your chorizo and, and ground beef mixture. It's amazing, guys. Like, this shit smells awesome. It looks awesome. Now, just go ahead and add some, some mixed cheese on there. And just, yeah, just want to brown that a little bit. And there we go, guys. Taco spaghetti. Now, top it off with a even more fresh cilantro. And there we go, guys. Taco spaghetti. You know it's fucking delicious. All right, so first thing you wanna do is start off with just enough vegetable oil to coat a frying pan. Next, I small diced an entire medium-sized onion. You can use a large or a small, whichever one you prefer. Just go ahead and season that out with a little bit of salt and pepper. All right, so there's a lot of fucking mixing in this recipe. I'm just letting y'all know that. It's nothing but stirring until the very fucking end. Go ahead and add about a half teaspoon of minced garlic and once again, we're gonna be fucking stirring some more. All right, I used about three four cups of uh, bell peppers. Now I use mixed, but if you only have green or red or yellow, orange, whatever the fuck you got, just go ahead and use that. I just want it to be fancy for this shit. So whatever y'all would feel like doing, y'all do. So afterwards I added um, two links of hot Italian sausage. Um, it's take, I've taken it out the casing. Um, go ahead and just Google how to take it out the casing. I didn't make a demonstration video or you can ask them for it already grounded up. It's very easy. All right, so next what I'm adding is a half pound of ground beef. You can use ground turkey, but for this recipe, it just tastes better with ground beef. Season the ground beef, what you're gonna need is one and a half teaspoons of garlic powder. Next, you're gonna need one teaspoon of onion powder. Also, one teaspoon of cayenne pepper. All right, and also just use about a generous amount of Italian seasoning. I'm using about a tablespoon. Uh, Remember what I said about mixing, just go ahead and mix it all up until it's well done. Um, you don't want the beef to be anything lower than well done, just because you have pork in there as well. Um, I'm not using lean ground beef, so mine's is a little bit fatty, uh, you know, extra flavor. Um, I learned in culinary school, fat is flavor, so therefore I don't mind. I'm using a mushroom pasta sauce. Let's go ahead and add that in there. You can literally use any brand, ragu, whatever. I'm using Walmart brand. Just go ahead and mix it all up. Um, you don't wanna use more than a jar of pasta sauce because you don't want it to be too soupy because we are making a meat sauce. Let's go ahead and season that with a little bit of salt and pepper. Mm. All the flavors will marry each other. Like it's fucking delicious. So I like to add a little bit of white sugar just because tomatoes tend to be a little bit acidic. Um, just makes your meat sauce taste a little bit better. All right, in boiling hot water, go ahead and add your spaghetti noodles. It doesn't matter if your pot is a little bit shorter than the noodles because they will bend in eventually. Go ahead and add a little bit of veggie oil to that water. Also salt. See what I mean? They're starting to bend in. So once they start to get a little bit more flexible, just go ahead and like completely submerge all the noodles in. It should only take about six or seven minutes for them to get completely cooked. All right, I don't have a strainer because I was too dumb to go buy one. So I'm using a microwave cover lid and hoping that it'll work the same way. All right, next in a little small saucepan, I'm just adding about a cup of meat sauce, just because we're gonna mix up our pasta. We're gonna mix up our pasta and meat sauce together. Um, I'm not a huge fan of putting a shit ton of meat sauce in my spaghetti, 
but just enough and you know that extra fat that was in there it'll just help bind everything together like this shit is actually really fucking delicious all right just and just go ahead and top your spaghetti with a little bit of ground parm or you know shredded parm whatever kind of cheese you got yeah but y'all but that's it yo well thank you so much y'all for chilling with me again during this recipe and as i told y'all i will be delivering way more recipes uh for now on in this on this channel so just please be on the lookout for that y'all um yeah well until next time y'all peace What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Tito's Kitchen. I hope you guys all had a good weekend. Today, we're going to cut up this recipe by cooking off some bacon. Now, I've diced this bacon up about medium size. Um, it doesn't really matter what size you cut it, but we're just going to go ahead and render out our bacon fat because uh, we're going to be collecting it and using it for our recipe. Next, remove that bacon and be careful not to burn the bacon or the grease guys. Next, we're gonna go ahead and season our shrimp and our scallops with just some salt and pepper. Nothing too crazy for this recipe. Um, I like to add a little bit of extra vegetable oil in my pan with my bacon fat. And next, we're gonna go ahead and just sear those scallops off. Um, those are going in first only because I really want them to get a nice sear on them. Next, I'm just going to add my shrimp in. These will take no time. Um, they will be the last to go in and the first to come out. I really try to develop some sort of like organization in this pan, but I just said, uh, whatever. You just kind of put them in there. Remember, uh, last to go in, first to come out. Flip over all of your shrimp. And, you know, those don't need to be too crazy. Just put them all the way through. Give them some nice flavor with some bacon fat and, you know, all of that. Butter, oil, it's just nice so far. Go ahead and pull out all your shrimp. Next, we're gonna go ahead and turn over all our scallops. See, there's a nice little sear on those scallops. Not, not the best of the best, but you know, really, really decent. And they taste amazing. And you should just start to smell amazing for the beer. Go ahead and take that bacon fat and that grease and just move it over to another pan or a pot. Just a little, something a little bit easier to work with. Next, I add about a half stick of salted butter. I like to let this butter brown in there with the bacon fat. Then I add in some minced garlic, about oh, three cloves, three or four cloves. Uh, it, it's foaming up because of the bacon, guys. But yeah, go ahead and add some spinach. In there you could use kale too to be honest with you but i'm using spinach next we're going to go ahead and add some uh, sun-dried tomatoes then i'm going to add in some fettuccine mix that all up i have some white wine here you can use any type of white wine cooking wine whatever whatever you want to use and just salt that up just a little and add a little pepper too and just keep mixing it really this is a fun recipe and is relatively quick um, I have some grated parm here so I'm just going to go ahead and sprinkle that in there as well alright now I'm going to go ahead and add our seafood back into the pasta All right, and that's what you get. A nice developed, mixed, smoky, rich, delicious dish. Um, everything about this just screams, I want to smack your mama because this is too damn good. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I said that right, but yes. Enjoy that.
What's up everybody and welcome back to Tudo Kitchen and today we're going to be making another freaking pumpkin spice recipe in celebration of this beautiful fall. Listen, don't let nobody call y'all basic because y'all like pumpkin spice. This is really a delicious recipe so don't be ashamed of y'all basicness. Alright, so we're going to be we're going to be making a pumpkin spice ice cream pie. It's going to be freaking delicious. Alright, so start off for this blend we're going to use a teaspoon of cinnamon. Also, we're going to do a fourth teaspoon of ginger, a teaspoon of nutmeg, a teaspoon of allspice, and a teaspoon of ground cloves. I'm also using two tablespoons of cinnamon sugar. Go ahead and mix that up. Next, I have a bowl that I froze for like an hour. It doesn't look frozen, but it was frozen. Then I got one little pint-sized 16-ounce thing of uh, heavy cream. Make sure it's super cold because we're going to make it whipped cream out of this and mix it up. Um, start out with lower settings at first just to get a little bit frothy. And then once it starts to froth up real nice, then you can speed it up. And you see how it's starting to thicken up already? Oh, there we go. Looks just like shaving cream. Now that's, that's whipped cream for you right there. Flavorless whipped cream for right now. Next, we're going to add, uh, start off with uh, one half cup of uh, pumpkin puree. This is the stuff from the can, by the way, y'all. So if y'all got the cans, I don't know, any of those brands like Libby or whatever, the Dollar Tree brand or shot your supermarket brand, whatever. Then we're gonna add another half cup of pumpkin puree. All right, lastly, we're gonna add one fourth cup of pumpkin puree. We're gonna add all of our spice. Mix that up really, really, really good. It smells amazing. Pumpkin spice is amazingly, like it's a beautiful blend. Now we're gonna go ahead and mix that up. Now we're gonna add one full can of condensed sweet and condensed milk. This stuff is the miracle all. This is how you make ice cream, y'all. Like this is the secret ingredient behind ice cream, if y'all didn't know. Now go ahead and fold that up with, fold that in with some type of uh, spatula. Um, you can use your mixer to do it, but you don't really wanna mix up your whipped cream anymore. Um, so just go ahead and just fold it in just like that. Make sure you get every little ounce of it in the bowl if you can. It's the best to the best of your abilities. Next, we're going to add this beautiful mixture to a pre-made uh, pie dough or like pie crust, graham cracker. Now, I didn't want to, I could make my own, but I like the store bought ones. I think they taste really, really, really good. Like, I don't know. And I only paid a dollar for this at Dollar Tree. Go ahead and pour that in there and just make it nice and even on top. Just like that. This recipe is extremely easy, y'all. Honestly, this recipe cost me like three bucks total to make, maybe four. Four bucks to make everything, which is freaking delicious. It's a whole dessert for four dollars. Go ahead and add some more cinnamon sugar to the top. You can make your own cinnamon sugar blend, but um, I have bought some a long time ago, so I just had some on handy. I like the pre made kind because it comes with this little top, you know, and that's important. You know, the ones I have, the little pie pans I have at the house don't have tops and stuff, so yeah, you know, you can put it in there and just put it in the freezer easy, just like that. You can store it easily. Go ahead and freeze that for like up to five hours and afterwards it should look just like this i would say freeze it for about five to eight hours i did it overnight so mine's had about a good 12 hours to to really set and become delicious but yeah oh my god it looks like it's baked it's so crazy but yeah i just end up deciding to take it out of the tin so i can cut it a little bit better and i can show you guys how delicious this looks without the metal Ten being around it like it's it smells and looks delicious like just go ahead and cut you a nice big piece just like that and there we go pumpkin spice ice cream pie recipe you're gonna need four fucking tablespoons of all-purpose flour now I heard self-rising flour works best but I don't really give a fuck because all-purpose flour is what I got Next, you wanna use three tablespoons of unsweetened baking cocoa. Now, this shit does look like Swiss Miss hot chocolate, but if you use this as hot chocolate, you will regret it. Next, add one fourth cup of fucking sugar, one fourth cup of fucking whole milk, 
a dash of fucking vanilla, one fucking egg. I'm sorry I'm taking fucking so much, but I enjoy it. Now go ahead and add some Nutella. I'm using three tablespoons of Nutella. You can use a little bit more or a little bit less, whichever you prefer, but I say add a little bit more because guess what? This is a fucking Nutella mug cake, damn it. And listen, just it takes a long time to get this shit out of the spoon because it's like peanut butter kinda. So just fucking forcefully get it out of there. You gotta tell it to get the fuck out the spoon. Get the fuck out the spoon, Nutella. Now go ahead and just give that a nice mix. Now it's gonna come a little bit out of the mug. Um, there's no way around that because it's kind of small no matter how big your mug is. I'm using almost a 12 ounce mug and nothing is really changing. But it is what it is. Um, go ahead and use that. Some people are gonna tell you to use like a small whisk. I don't know what the fuck a small whisk is. I just got a normal size whisk, but I do have a shit ton of forks, spoons, and knives. So if you wanna use a fork, please do. Oh, I almost forgot. Um, I added three tablespoons of vegetable oil. Now you can use butter, but I find vegetable oil just more convenient. Now just go ahead, give that another mix. Do you see that color? Like it actually looks really fucking delicious already. Mm, 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 mm. All right, so what you need is five fucking Hershey Kisses. Uh, watch this trick. Ta-da! Go ahead and add that to the fucking batter. Give that, push it in, make sure it's not on the sides, but you just kind of want it more in the middle. Now I put it in the microwave for 30 seconds, and after 30 seconds, it's starting to do a little bit of something, but not much. Now I'm gonna put it back in the microwave for 15 more seconds, and it looks pretty decent. Now I'm gonna try for 15 more seconds, and we are pretty much done. You don't wanna cook it more than that because this is a lava cake, and you want the middle to be molten, and hot and delicious. Now go ahead and add some powdered sugar on there if you like for garnish, some beautiful powdered sugar. I love powdered sugar, y'all. Now just go ahead and get you a spoonful and let's see the moment of truth, y'all. Oh my gosh. This is like a fucking orgasm. What the fuck? Oh my Lord, this is fucking delicious. Yo. This recipe is fucking delicious and I really think- What's up everybody and welcome to Two Dope Kitchen. Yo, today we're gonna be making a super fun and easy recipe. This shit is so dope. We're gonna be making ice cream bread. First, all you need is one pint of melted ice cream. Any flavor would do. Also, you're gonna need one and one fourth cups of self-rising flour and self, I emphasize self-rising. All right, then next you can just literally add any toppings that you want. Like I'm using sprinkles and fucking M&Ms and Oreos, um, but just go ahead and give that a mix. Um, this is kind of the gross part. I'm not too much of a fan of how this feels in my hand because uh, it's pretty sticky and it just, uh, yeah, it's not good. But yo, if it has this consistency, then go ahead and add a little bit more flour Afterwards, you should have a dough ball. That's still pretty sticky. Next, you go ahead and spray the inside of a loaf pan. I lined it with some uh, parchment paper and you will see why. Uh, go ahead and spread that dough in there. Um, you wanna spread it evenly so it cooks evenly. And you kinda want it to have a rustic look, so don't be afraid to just make it look nice. I mean, rustic, like. It wants to kind of be like a baguette, but you still want it to cook evenly. So you do have to spread it, but like you don't have to spread it so flat perfectly across. It just has to spread evenly. But it will be rustic looking, just warning you. Oh, this is going to be crazy, yo. Like we really are making bread from fucking ice cream. But yeah, go ahead and put the dough in the oven for 30 to 40 minutes at 350 degrees and afterwards oh my gosh when you bring it out it really is fucking bread like that is the craziest thing i've ever seen in my whole fucking life yo um 
I don't know why I'm so amazed, but that shit is so crazy. Oh, but you see what that parchment paper was for? It's so you can just easily lift it out. Next, you just go ahead and take a bread knife or any type of knife you got, but a bread knife works best. Just go ahead and cut it. Just cut it. It will be kind of hard on the top. It will be amazingly soft inside. Afterwards, you shall have delicious, sweet candy cookie <laughs> baguette. Uh, wee wee. <laughs> well, listen, y'all. Thank you all again for tuning in and chilling with us here at Two Dope Kitchen. Um, please like, share, subscribe, comment, uh, try this yourself, send me pictures, follow me on my social medias, uh, donate to, you know, some foundation, all types of shit, you know, whatever you want to do, yo, please be cool, y'all. <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding. I'm all, I'm talking crazy, yo, but until next time, yo, peace. What's up, folks? We are back with another bomb ass cookie recipe. Let's begin. Go ahead and start off with some Pillsbury Devil's Food Cake. Now, we're gonna go ahead. You guys already know the method. I've made enough fucking cookies at this point. Two eggs, one third cups of vegetable oil, and that's it. All we do is mix it, get it all together, make it into a nice solid dough so this shit will be amazing. All right, so. Listen, I know most of you guys are probably thinking this is not impressive, just a chocolate cookie. Who gives a fuck about a chocolate cookie? Listen, these are gonna be a little bit better. Add you some extra oil if it's a little bit hard to work with, not too much, but just add it as you need it. But yeah, these are gonna be crazy good, like absolutely good. And if you love like the combination of peanut butter and chocolate, you're gonna love these even more. So I have some regular milk chocolate M&Ms that I'm gonna go ahead and just throw in there. Um, this is for color mainly, but uh, yeah, definitely a nice one. Then we'll go ahead and throw some peanut butter, uh, peanut M&Ms in there. Now these little fuckers are hard to work with. So I like to cut them in half just cause they're so thick. They're really big to kind of put in the size of these cookies especially. So just go ahead and cut them. These little tricky fuckers are very, very hard to cut in half, but you know, you can do it. And, you know, you can also throw these in like a food processor or something, but I didn't feel like doing all of that. It was just much faster cutting them. Um, go ahead and try one. I mean, because we've never tasted these before. All right. So go ahead and add those into the dough. And also, we're going to just go ahead and add some creamy peanut butter. Now, you can, if you want to hack this recipe, just go ahead and use some crunchy peanut butter because it kind of just completely does that but i don't really like crunchy peanut butter for real i really prefer creamy so yeah and it just works better when it comes to mixing it so yeah just add about a half cup of peanut butter in there and you hear the way i say peanut butter peanut butter peen, peanut butter yeah fuck <laughs> but yeah just go ahead and mix all of that now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna make these cookies smaller i'm using a tablespoon of dough um if you want to make them bigger, you're more than welcome to, but I feel like these are like perfect bite-sized cookies, like really two or three bites and you're fucking done. So yeah, a tablespoon should pretty much make, uh, I don't know. It made roughly around, I want to say 20 cookies or so. So yeah, definitely see what you can rock with with that. I made about 24 cookies, I should say. So I guess what, two dozen cookies? I mean, these came out fine. Um, oh, also make sure if you want to flatten them down a little bit, but yeah, throw them in the oven for uh, 15 minutes uh, on 350 degrees and this is what you should come out with. Beautiful, amazingly, your house will smell amazing. Like peanut butter and chocolate is the perfect, like if your house stinks, this shit will make it that much better or it could make it worse. You know, it could just be stink on top of peanut butter and chocolate, but hey. Like these were fucking amazing. You guys will love these. These are super easy. You can get your kids involved with making these. It's super easy. I think you guys will love them, y'all. And yeah, just put them in your cooling rack to cool down, and that's just about it, y'all. Chocolate peanut butter M&M cookies. What's up, everybody? And welcome back to Tudo Kitchen. And tis the season for UGG boots and hoodies, cause fall is finally here, people. And we all know. With fall comes pumpkin spice. So today I'm gonna teach you guys how to make your very own Starbucks pumpkin spice latte. Go ahead and start off with two tablespoons of ground cinnamon. Next, we're gonna add a teaspoon of ground ginger, a teaspoon of nutmeg, allspice, and ground cloves. 
go ahead and mix that all up. Now this is way, way, way more than what you're gonna actually need in this recipe. Um, but I like to just make enough because it's I mean it's fall, so we're gonna be making plenty of pumpkin spice stuff. Go ahead and open up this can of mystery pumpkin. I'm not gonna reveal any businesses. Ain't nobody paying me on this platform. And yeah, try to open it correctly, please. And go ahead and just add, start off with the fourth cup of water and a saucepan. Bring that up to a boil. Now we're gonna add a fourth cup of the pumpkin in there. Um, this is pumpkin puree, by the way, guys. Um, make sure it starts to boil. It'll start to look like baby food, like baby sweet potatoes or something, but yeah. Bring that up to a boil. Next, we're gonna add a tablespoon of our uh, pumpkin spice. Optional, you can add like a teaspoon or a tablespoon of vanilla. Next, I'm gonna go ahead and add a fourth cup of corn syrup. For all of you guys who are gonna criticize me for using corn syrup, I don't really care. You can use sugar if you like, but I'm using corn syrup just to speed up the process. Cause this is instant, you know? This is supposed to be instant-ish. Go ahead and bring it up to a boil. It should start looking like that. Now we're gonna add a fourth cup of whole milk. Um, now we're, we're pretty much making like a creamer and a syrup at the same exact time. Like at the same damn time, y'all. Let that come up to a boil. Then we're gonna go ahead and strain it in our cup. Now you can add as much as you like, but you don't want the pumpkin puree to actually be in the coffee. You just want like the milk syrup stuff, you know? So go ahead and add whatever kind of coffee you like. I'm using some instant coffee because this is supposed to be like a dorm room type of recipe, you know? Go ahead and add some whipped cream to that. Add a little bit of cinnamon sugar. Add you a cinnamon stick and you're done. I hope you guys really enjoyed this recipe. And if you would like more pumpkin spice recipes, y'all let me know. Yo, until next time, peace. All right, y'all, so we're gonna start off with some sweet potatoes here. I just cooked them pretty much for 30 minutes until they're completely, completely soft, soft enough to be able to smash them with a spatula or a spoon or a knife or your hands or whatever the hell you got. Um, it pretty much works best if you do it that way. Um, you don't want any hard bits in there at all. Uh, but yeah, we're gonna cool this down for about 10 minutes in the refrigerator. Next, we're going to start off with a cup and a half of some brown sugar. We're going to also use a half cup of vegetable oil and blend that all up and add two eggs there. And we're going to go ahead and blend the eggs up with the oil and the sugar, just like that. Already, this smells delicious. I mean, oil and sugar and eggs. Come on, it's like, it smells amazing. <laughs> but yeah. Then next, we're gonna pretty much, after we do that, we're gonna add one and three fourth cups of flour. Now I'm using all purpose flour. You, you wanna make sure you fold that in with the spatula. Um, don't blend this, actually fold this in. It's important because we're in the process of making a loose dough. And also I added uh, one and one third, or not one and one third, one third cups of water. Go ahead and fold that in too. You're not going to need your blender anymore after this. You can just completely use your, uh, use your spatula. You don't need to use your mixer. But now I'm going to go ahead and add a teaspoon of baking powder. Fold that in just like that. Now this should be like like a looser dough. I also have a fourth teaspoon of salt, a half teaspoon of cinnamon, and a half teaspoon of nutmeg. And I wanna go ahead and fold that in. This is gonna be amazing. Like, it smells like a fucking French toast. Like, it's amazing. Now, this is the weird part, but go ahead and add the marshmallows in there. It does something to this bread that just makes it fucking delicious. Like, I can't even describe to you how good this, this fucking bread is. It's amazing. Mix it in just like that. And we're gonna add one full cup of uh, mashed sweet potatoes. I just used two half cups, but you know, yeah. One full cup of the mashed sweet potatoes. Now I'm using a standard glass loaf pan. If you have a metal one, that'll work.
part two, but make sure you spray this down. You need to make sure this entire thing is extremely lubricated because you do not want your bread to stick. Um, I'm using just some like standard cooking spray. You may use like a Pam or something, canola oil spray, whatever you got. And go ahead and pour the dough in there and do not spill it on the side like me. You don't want to waste any of this amazing deliciousness. You want to make sure when you put it in there that you even it out. Pretty much just like that. Flatten it out in the loaf pan just so it cooks evenly. You have a nice even loaf. You don't want a lopsided piece of bread. That's so weird and disgusting. Next, I'm adding some sliced almonds to the top. When this bakes, these are going to get nice and toasted and they're going to taste fucking delicious. Like, I don't know what this does. You can even use pecans or like walnuts, but the sliced almonds work. They look pretty too on top of it. Next, this is the last and final touch. I'm adding some cinnamon sugar to the top. Just like that, oh my gosh, yeah, this is about to be off the chain. Like, this is about to be really amazing. Go ahead and bake that in the oven for an hour and 15 minutes on 350, and there we go. Just like that. Go ahead and take a little spatula or a, you know, like a small butter knife and just pretty much loosen it up on the edges. And if you sprayed it nice, uh, a nice even coat, you should pretty much just be able to pop this right out of the loaf pan. Just like that. Don't worry about you know too much of the almonds falling off because it will stick and it's going to be amazing. It looks amazing. And go ahead and cut it. And this bread, honestly, is a strong contender for cornbread. Like, fuck that, it's Thanksgiving. Like, this is about to be maybe uh, pretty much a soul food recipe for me. So, y'all, I really hope y'all enjoyed this recipe. And please have a happy Thanksgiving. Please eat all the food that you can. And until next time, y'all, peace. All right, for this recipe, I'm gonna make use of these two apples I've had in my refrigerator for about eight goddamn weeks. First, I'm gonna cut these apples in half. Now, this step can be done second if it's easier. I'd like to peel my, my apples before I cut them, I mean, after I cut them, but some people like to do it before. Um, next, just go ahead and pluck the seeds out. I'm plucking the seeds out versus coring the apple because I wanna keep as much of the apple intact and to save as much apple, I'm being cheap as hell. I have two apples, so I gotta make this shit stretch. Just go ahead and cut the apples any way you like. Now, some people like them really, really small. So other people like them in whole ass slices. Personally, me, I like it around a medium, a medium dice. You know, small, a medium small. If that's a real, that's a real size. That's pretty much where I like it at. All right, so now we're gonna start our brown butter. And in our brown butter, pretty much it's exactly how it sounds, browned butter, which is, you know, just letting the butter cook a little while, get a little bit brown before you add in the apples. Once you go ahead and add all the apples in there, that smell of apples and butter is fucking amazing. Now just go ahead and toss all of your apples in the butter and it really does come out fucking amazing when you do that. Um, you want to make sure each and every one is completely coated and smelling amazing. Now we're going to start our spice blend. Add a tablespoon of cinnamon, a teaspoon of nutmeg, and a teaspoon of allspice. Just go ahead and mix that up because we're going to add this into the apples. And just mix it up. Do the same thing you did with the butter. Make sure each and every apple is coated. You don't want to miss a bite in this. Like It's very important to be very particular and, you know, we're gonna add some water. Um, we're gonna add water at multiple stages um, of this recipe because it's kind of going to make like a, a syrupy sauce. Add some more water once that water kind of evaporates a little bit. This is to help the apples soften up as well. Now I added a fourth cup of brown sugar, and you know this is for sweetness. Then you can add white sugar. But let's be realistic, like, it's gonna taste way better with fucking brown sugar. Everything brown, this is a brown skin recipe. This is a very brown skin recipe, so this is what we doing today, all right? Now, the sauce should start kind of thickening up on its own, but add a tablespoon, or fuck, a teaspoon of vanilla, um, 
and also I'm gonna add a teaspoon of cornstarch. Now this is the wrong way to add cornstarch to a recipe. You should have probably added it to the water and then mixed it up, but I was just being a dumbass. So this is how you save it. Add some hot water, some warm water to it, and pretty much we're gonna stir this vigorously so we can be able to get rid of the clumps. You don't want any clumps in it. That's nasty as hell. But the cornstarch is to thicken up the mixture like that. So now you're gonna have almost like a, I don't know, it's almost like the fucking inside of a, mic, a mic pie or whatever the fuck they call it. So now I have this leftover pie though from my last fucking recipe. Um, and I decided to use it and I'm gonna roll it back out. I don't waste shit in my kitchen. Um, I don't know if y'all waste shit in y'all kitchen, but I don't really waste shit. Like if I have some leftover scraps, even the tips to like chicken wings, I save them. But yeah, go ahead and take a glass um, or whatever you got that's maybe a circle. I'm using a glass because that's just about the right size for what I need for my uh, for my uh, for my um, little muffin tin I got. And I don't know why the hell I cut out seven. That was pretty stupid because I only have a six thing muffin tin, but it's whatever. So I guess I did waste something today. Yeah, and then pretty much inside of a greased muffin tin. Uh, now emphasize grease and I'll take, you know, some sp spray some Pam or something in there. Just go ahead and stuff your uh, your pie dough in there. Oh, and for, what I forgot to tell you guys is that I poked them with a the fork so they don't rise in the oven. Next, we're gonna prepare our cinnamon toast crunch. Uh, that's exactly what you do. Just put them in a damn plastic bag and beat them. Beat them like a, uh, you know, like you want to beat your baby daddy. You know what I'm saying? And go ahead and put your apple filling inside. Now I did put the pie dough in the oven for about 10 minutes just to get it looking nice. Pretty much that's how it goes. And then I add some of that beautiful, delicious cinnamon toast crunch to the top of these pies. Um, it's not done yet. We're gonna put it back in the oven for about another 15 minutes. After that, it should come out nice and golden brown and amazing. Like, these things are fucking delicious. I'm not even joking with you, like, they're, they're amazing. Like, I don't know what it is, but it's something about these things that are awesome. Yeah, and after you do that, you should have this little mini tart. I'm gonna put that back, it's a little too fucking hot. Today are some lemon pound cake cookies. Go ahead and empty all the lemon cake mix into a bowl. Next, you guys know the process, add two eggs, and then after we add the two eggs, we're gonna go ahead and add one third cups of vegetable oil. Now just for a little pizzazz and a little pop, go ahead and just zest the lime now or lemon. If you don't have this, a lime or lemon, and you don't feel like doing it, then don't do it. Then just go ahead and mix this all up because um, we're gonna be forming our dough, a really easy recipe. Now I'm sorry that I am making so many baked goods this month, but it was intentional because this month I'm theming every month based around something. This month is focused on baked goods. So that's why I haven't really fried anything for real and stuff like that. It's just all focused around baked goods. But yeah, once it's once it's formed into a dough like that, then pretty much you're done. You already you guys already know this is a super easy ass recipe. Now go ahead and line a baking sheet with some parchment paper or um, one of those silicone things if you got them, but you know, just use some parchment paper, it's easy, not wax paper. Now, I'm being really extra today, and you don't have to do this. Completely disregard this step if you don't have a piping bag, but I'm just, I'm just being extra, and I just thought to do something different and to just be cool and to waste everyone's time. <laughs> like, just go ahead and just put, you know, put the dough into the pastry bag, and we're just gonna pipe. The, the, the cookies like I just want them to look different and cool I guess like they're not gonna look too different and too cool but you know hey I'm not too good at pastries and baked goods but whatever um yeah I, I just decided to do something different because they're kind of flat I can't really fit the full dozen so I can only fit about 10 cookies but that's okay though now put this in the oven for about 10 minutes at 350 degrees now you want to watch these because these are a little bit thinner than my other cookies all right, after you pull them out, they should look like a little spiral cookie, kind of like a big ass uh, butter cookie, you know, the ones that come in a tin. But yeah, take the cookies off the hot pan and after they cool down, you wanna just go ahead and ice them. I'm using a normal vanilla icing that, you know, it hardens after a while. It's fucking amazing. These are gonna be 
fucking dope. Like you can use like a cream cheese icing, anything, but I'm using just the normal vanilla icing. And then that's it. That's really it for these. And these are very comparable to Starbucks. I swear, like these are fucking amazing. Yo, I really enjoy these. And I think you guys will fucking enjoy these too. Kitchen today, we're gonna be making something super cool. We're gonna be making lemon and blueberry French toast, but in the oven. This is a really, really, really easy recipe and it's also crazy delicious. Um, pretty much everyone can get involved making this recipe. Um, I think you guys enjoy, so let's begin. Okay, so we're gonna start off with a few ingredients we have here, not a whole bunch, um, but I am using some brioche bread that I found um, at Aldi's. Um, you can use any sort of bread. It might even taste really good with some Hawaiian rolls if you can't find brioche bread. Um, so I have some fresh blueberries here, also three eggs, and I have also some brandy here too. Um, one lemon that we're gonna zest, uh, half a stick of butter or so, and some brown sugar. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with about two to three tablespoons of some unsalted butter. Um, we're gonna let that melt down. Then we're gonna go ahead and add our fresh blueberries in there. Um, I guess you can say sweat out your blueberries a bit, but you know, just to start to let them juice a bit in the pot. Now we're gonna go ahead and deglaze all of that with our brandy. You can use any type of brandy too. Um, it doesn't matter. You can even use whiskey if you'd like. Um, just go ahead and mix them up. Be sure not to let them burn. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and zest the lemon. You can use uh, just any sort of like shredder if you have one or a microplane, whatever you have. But we're just gonna go ahead and zest about pretty much two to three tablespoons of this lemon zest. Now we're gonna go ahead and add our brown sugar in there. I'm using a half a cup of brown sugar. Um, if you wanna take it down to a quarter cup, that's okay too. Um, now I like to go ahead and slice my bread up into like nice dices uh they don't have to be slices or anything like that um because we're going to be pretty much putting them in a muffin tin so whatever size you want to cut them up that's perfectly fine i really like using brioche bread because it just absorbs it you know i would use that or challah bread that's really where i draw the line when it comes to french toast and i'll occasionally go with texas toast all right now i'm going to go ahead and take a quarter cup of cinnamon um, and just sprinkle that all over the top. Mix that up nicely. Then we're gonna take our three eggs and beat those and we're gonna go ahead and pour those over the top. I used almost a loaf of bread for this, by the way, guys. Um, now just mix that up nicely, you know, incorporate everything like you would make, you know, any sort of like bread pudding or French toast type thing. All right, now let's go ahead and add our blueberry mixture in there. It's amazing. I love how everything just incorporates pretty much immediately and the color that you see behind these blueberries are fantastic. Okie doke. Now we're gonna go ahead and grease up our muffin tin. If you don't have a muffin tin, just go ahead and put this in some sort of loaf pan or just something so you're gonna basically be making monkey bread and I'm making my own little mini versions. So go ahead and use whatever. If you have a muffin tin, use it. If not, use something else. All right. There we go. And it should all fit. I'm using a jumbo size. Um, you might have to use a smaller or bigger, whatever you have. But put that in the oven uh, for about 15 minutes on 350 degrees. And while that's in the oven, we're gonna go ahead and start working on our glaze. Um, we're gonna use a cup of powdered sugar. Um, next, I'm using some vanilla creamer actually, um, instead of heavy cream. Um, and you can use that and I use just about maybe a quarter cup of vanilla creamer and it works just as well It's two birds with one stone basically and now I'm going to also use a quarter cup of uh, cream cheese um, I don't say this step is optional. You need the glaze the, the glaze really helps bring this entire dessert together. It's amazing All right, and afterwards there we go go ahead and drizzle it up with that glaze and as you can see, it looks amazing, guys. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, please let me know how this came out. And until next time, y'all. Peace.
What's up everybody and welcome back to Two Dope Kitchen. Today we are back with another bomb ass box cake cookie recipe. I'm going to be making strawberry shortcake cookies. Alright, so first thing you want to do is empty all the contents in a bowl. Um, yeah, and then go ahead and add two eggs. You know this is a simple ass recipe. And then we're going to add one third cups of vegetable cream. Now go ahead and, you know, I, I like to just, you know, mash the yolks first and then I like to just mix it up. Now this is super easy and we know it's super fucking easy. Honestly, if you would like, you could probably replace the vegetable oil with butter and they, these might come out even better. So I would try melted butter if you guys have it, if you guys want to. I think I might do that in my next one. And just go ahead and mix this up. Now, I have some Pillsbury strawberry cake mix. Easy. Next, we're going to blend up some mini golden Oreos. Um, you can use a regular size. I'm just using mini just because it's easier to blend. And just pretty much blend these into these are, these are crumbs, basically. Now, if you want them a little bit thicker, you can. Um, but I just wanted them crumbs. That's it. I'm just gonna go ahead and add it in the dough and mix it up. And honestly, this smells exactly how it looks. It it's amazing. Like this is this is pretty. Like even if you want to, just go ahead and taste a little bit of the dough. Like it's it's spot on strawberry shortcake. Like this is super fucking spot on. I really think you guys will really enjoy this shit. After you pretty much mix it to this point, this is what you need to do. You guys already know this. We're pretty much going to make four rows of three. Uh, make sure they're pretty even. If you want to make smaller cookies, then go ahead. You know, just pretty much do the math. You can probably do four rows of four if you do tiny. If you do tinier cookies, and just put this in the oven at 350 degrees for 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes, you just want to check on them. Uh, just to check on them to make sure they're not burnt, make sure everything's going good, they're pretty spaced out evenly. Then you put them back in the oven for five minutes. And then after that, you pull them out and we're going to put them again on a cooling rack. Uh, this just helps the cookies cool evenly. You want them, you know, you don't want them to like overcook because they can continue to cook kind of if they're on the tray. And don't drop your cookies, y'all. All right, now we're gonna work on our buttercream. Go ahead and put three tablespoons of butter, um, softened butter. I was a dumbass and didn't put any softened butter. This was kind of softened, not soft enough though. But I emphasize softened butter. You're just gonna go ahead and whip that completely. Um, you, you want it completely whipped. Um, no, no type of hardness. Then we're going to add a cup and a half of uh, confection sugar or powdered sugar. This recipe for this buttercream is exactly enough. Then we're going to add one tablespoon of milk and one tablespoon of vanilla. And we're going to mix this up. We're going to add more milk, but I just want to add the milk a little bit at a time. I don't want this to be too soupy. I want it to be the perfect consistency. Now we're going to add one more tablespoon of milk, mix that up again. Now I am using whole milk, um, if you have like 2% or something like that, then you're more than welcome to use 2%. Then you want to mix it up even more. And then you want to add one more tablespoon of milk and you want to pretty much just whip it up perfectly. Now you want to go ahead and pretty much just use a butter knife or I have this little spatula thing I don't know what the hell it is but you just go ahead spread it on the cookie perfectly and yeah it, it, it's perfect <laughs> like these just like that I mean I'm pretty terrible at, at fucking um, frosting shit cupcakes cookies but hey now I'm gonna add some mini chessman cookies these cookies Pretty much are like the cherry on top of this fucking recipe. These are amazing. These are shortbread cookies. Probably some of the best shortbread cookies on the fucking market. Next to the ones that are in a tin. I love those. Now we're going to refrigerate these for about 30 minutes. And afterwards, the icing should have set. It should be nice and firm. The shortbread should be in place like glue. 
Oh man, these, these cookies are fucking amazing. I'll just go ahead and take a bite. And there we go, strawberry shortcake cookies. What's up everybody and welcome back to Tito Kitchen. Today, we're gonna start off by cracking three large eggs into a mixing bowl. Doesn't matter which bowl you use. Uh, okay, don't get any eggshells in this recipe. Next, we're gonna go ahead and add three and a quarter cup of heavy cream. You can use half and half or whole milk as an alternative. Also, a half a cup of sugar. Mix everything up, um, just enough to incorporate the ingredients and to break the yolk. Next, we're gonna go ahead and add a tablespoon of cinnamon. Same deal, just enough to incorporate the ingredients. Also, a tablespoon of vanilla extract. All right, now I'm using three packs of pecan swirls as our bread. Um, odd, I know, but it's gonna be delicious. Now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna grease a loaf pan with some unsalted butter. Um, don't skip out on using this because your bread pudding will stick. Now this step is optional, but I like to just go ahead and line the bottom with some pecans. I don't know why. Uh, maybe because I sometimes I want to do it upside down, but you know, I don't know. It's just a habit from, for bread pudding for me to do that. Now you can fit all 18 uh, pecan swirls in a uh, standard loaf pan. That's what I'm telling you to use a loaf pan. Even if you have to use an aluminum one, uh, just same deal. Make sure you grease it up uh, with the butter and then you, sh you should line them all up with the pecan swirls. Now, the reason why I don't cut them is because when I like to scoop them out later, I want them to re retain their swirled shape. And when you cut them up, obviously they won't be swirls anymore. Um, Cause I mean, if not, you can use any, anything really. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, take the custard and pour it over the top. Now, because I didn't cut them up, it's gonna take a lot longer for the custard uh, to be absorbed uh, by the uh, pecan swirls, but it's okay. We're gonna take about three hours, cut, cover them up, put it in the refrigerator, be patient, y'all. It's gonna, it's gonna pay off. Patience is a virtue in this one. Now, after about three hours, put it in the oven at 375 degrees for about an hour, and afterwards, you should have a finished product. Um, and that finished product should be a really, really delicious bread pudding. Um, this bread pudding, see, look at that. Um, it It is phenomenal. Now you see why I don't get rid of the shape because it looks really cool. Now we're gonna start our brown butter sauce with a half, half stick of butter. Now we're gonna also use a half cup of brown, brown sugar. I can't get my words together today, you guys. We're gonna go ahead and stir this up really nicely. And this bourbon brown butter sauce, the reason why we're starting with the half stick of butter and the brown sugar is because once we add in that bourbon, it is going to bubble. It's going to bubble really nicely, but then afterwards the, the bubble should subside. And once that happens, you go ahead and add a little bit of cream. Now this brown butter sauce is a sauce. It is not a really thick caramel. Um, it's not anything like that. It's just a sauce. Um, it's something to drizzle right on the top, but we're working with all of this on pretty much like medium, low, low, medium, I guess. Um, as you can see, um, our bread pudding deflates a little bit, but that's okay. It's, it's taking its shape and just go ahead and pour that brown butter sauce on top. Oh man. Um, like again, it's not a thick caramel. Um, reason being is because we're going to be adding in an icing later. Um, any sort of icing that you want to create. But yeah, um, afterwards you can put it in a plate, a cup, bowl, whatever. And, you know, again, I like to sprinkle some more pecans on top, um, some chopped pecans. And I'm gonna drizzle it with some, a little bit of icing and I'll put the recipe for that in the description. Uh, but thanks guys. Um, I know I've been gone for a little bit. And just wanted to make something that I thought was pretty cool. Um, you can make with pretty much junk, dessert out of junk food. <laughs> Um, yeah. What's up everybody and welcome back to Two Dope Kitchen. Today we're gonna be making some super easy ass donuts. We're gonna be using some pre-made biscuit dough. Now I always have a problem opening these damn things, but yeah, just go ahead and open up these containers. I bought this for a dollar. So like literally this is recipe has literally only cost me one dollar. That's it. 
So go ahead and take your dough and just separate them all. I have the smaller ones. Now, if you have the big ones, that is perfectly fine. So you can do the exact same thing. I have like the size that is probably a little bit bigger than a silver dollar. Now I have this little thing I use to pipe icing in. So this is perfect for making the holes in them. But you know, you can use like a bottle cap if you have the bigger biscuits or anything like that. Just go ahead and pretty much just make the holes. Now, like honestly, you can see the donuts happening already. All right, so this is what they're supposed to look like. And that's pretty much the entire recipe. Super easy, super cheap. And now we're gonna go ahead and heat up some vegetable oil and just go ahead and drop them in there. And it's that simple. You wanna work fast though, cause you don't wanna burn your donuts. I did manage to kinda burn one a little bit, but not too much. It was pretty good. I, I moved pretty quick for this. So make sure you just go ahead and throw all your donuts in there and you wanna flip them. Um, and it's really that simple. Like this is probably the easiest donut recipe you, you can ever make. You know, no yeast required, no making or kneading dough, no forming anything, no flour required, just literally pre-made biscuit dough. It can be Pillsbury, I'm using some off-brand. You can literally use whatever you got. You know, this kind of makes me think though, I'm actually maybe considering making some cinnamon roll donuts. Y'all let me know if y'all want me to try this. I'm gonna go ahead and use some cinnamon roll dough. Well, go ahead and throw your donuts in a bag. You know, I'm just using just a plain little grocery bag. You can use like a Ziploc bag or something. And I just threw that in there with some powdered sugar and that's it really. Like treat it like chicken, shake it up. You know, like if, if you're from the hood, that's how you coat it. And that's it. You really got some amazingly powdered donuts for just $1. What's up everybody and welcome back to Two Dope Kitchen. Today we're going to be making some Pillsbury yellow box cake cookies. Now pretty much everything that's needed to make a cookie is in cake mix. All you have to do is take away some ingredients. So we're going to go ahead and put some of this damn cake mix in the bowl. Now I thoroughly enjoyed this. Now add two eggs, also a third cup of oil and that's it. That's all that you have to do for this fucking recipe. And I promise you, these are probably some of the best cookies you'll ever have. They're perfectly soft, perfectly golden. It's just that perfect, like it's not too hard, not too soft. I don't like cookies that are so soft that they just fall apart as soon as you touch them. I like cookies that have a little bit of a, a body to them. And these cookies have that. And the beautiful thing about this is you can do this with literally any type of cake mix, probably with the exception of angel food. But other than that, you can probably do this with any type of cake mix, period. I'm using some of these little like, uh, these little chocolate candy things. These, I don't know. I just had some of these just around the house when I do cupcakes and shit. So I decided to just throw it in there. You can throw literally whatever you want to throw in these things. Sprinkles, nuts, uh, raisins, if you roll that way. Whatever, whatever you like to put in these damn cookies, you can put in these cookies. And again, you can use any type of cake mix. I'm going to be actually probably doing a series just making different cake mixes because this has completely blown my mind and I love this shit. This is amazing. So now what you want to do is pretty much just line a, a pan with some parchment paper. I emphasize parchment paper, not wax paper, parchment paper. It won't burn in the oven. And just pretty much, I'm going to make a dozen of cookies here. So, you know, um, what you want to do is you want to do four rows of three. Now this took a little while to do, but you know, just make sure you get the right size. Make sure they're pretty consistent in size and they're going to come out perfectly. And you wanna make sure you space them out enough so they don't run into each other. But this is pretty good for not spreading too much. This is actually a really good recipe. It's probably one of my favorite cookie recipes out. I'm gonna experiment with all different types of flavors. Now just put this in the oven for 10 minutes. Then we're gonna come back and check the cookies after 10 minutes. And we're gonna put it back in for another, fifth, or another five. So it'll be 15 minutes total. And afterwards, you should have these amazing golden brown cookies that, you know, fucking taste amazing. They smell amazing. The whole house smells like I'm cooking a damn cake, but I'm cooking cookies. This shit is crazy. And, you know, these these are just like basic confetti cookies. Like, you know, you could throw some icing on on top uh, if you want to put some of that frosting shit that you might get from like the supermarket, you know, the supermarket cookies, any of that. Like these taste amazing. I made a big one too. I don't know why, but I just made a big ass one just because. 
And there we go, box case cookies. What's up everybody and welcome back to the I'm kitchen I'm today. I'm so we're going to be making a dope ass Cinnabon inspired funnel cake recipe. This recipe is fucking amazing and completely fucking delicious and I know I say this about a lot of my recipes but I ain't lying about this one. Alright, we're going to start off with some box pancake mix. This is just your standard, you know, Aunt Jemima. This is some generic bullshit, bro. I'm adding a cup of the pancake mix, also a teaspoon of cinnamon, a teaspoon of nutmeg, and also a tablespoon of brown sugar. I'm adding a fourth cup of water at a time just because I don't want to make this too loose. I actually prefer it to be too thick than too loose because you can always add more water, but you can't take away the water. Um, yeah, that's why I add a fourth cup at a time. You know, if it gets stuck in the whisk, you know, just add a little bit of water and loosen it out there, bang it on the side of the bowl, just like that. And I'm adding, you know, like I said, I'm adding a fourth cup at a time. This is how it looks. You want it to be a perfect nappe consistency, and that's not nappy, nappe, and that's pretty much when it forms ribbons, which, you know, uh, if you were to lift it up, it kind of sits on itself. Consistency. Now we're going to work on our icing. I have a cup and a half of powdered sugar, two tablespoons of margarine, also a teaspoon of flour, or fuck, uh, vanilla, and just go ahead and mix that up. Now I'm just adding uh, one fourth cup of water. Now you can use milk instead of water. Actually, I recommend using milk, but if you don't have any milk like me, you can just use water and it'll come out perfectly the same. It'll taste just as good, I promise. And you also want this to be a perfect napkin consistency. heated up to 375 degrees and this is why it's called a funnel cake um you know you want to kind of make it come out of a funnel just like that this is probably the easiest way to do it just fill up your funnel um i have kind of like a medium sized funnel um, just fill that up and just go to work now i'm using a small saucepan so i'm able to fill up my whole my whole pan and that's the, the reason for that is because I want it to form a perfect circle, not some irregular ass shape. I want a perfect ass circle. All right, now flip this down. Make sure you, you want it. Be careful, because this will burn really fast. Um, and I'm just draining this on a cooling rack. Now, also another thing, funnel cakes, which most of you guys should probably know, that shit gets really cold pretty quickly, so kind of make them to serve like you know it's not really something you want to you know just have sitting there forever but yeah you want to do the same thing as the first one just go ahead and drain it uh, and yeah that's how you make cinnabon inspired funnel cakes these are fucking amazing just go ahead and drizzle some of your icing on i'm using my whisk just to drizzle it on um this is the best way to do it, and it tastes fucking amazing. It, there's nothing better. Y'all, I hope y'all enjoyed this. Peace. Get your wings this crispy in the air fryer let me show you how okay so we're gonna start off by seasoning our chicken with some salt and black pepper next we're gonna use some garlic powder as well as some onion powder um, I'll make sure that I put the full measurements in the description below also we're gonna use some cayenne pepper now you could also use some paprika at this point if you want, maybe even some adobo. 
all right next we're going to just use some vegetable oil um, i like to use vegetable oil just because it really does help the chicken uh and the cornstarch really stick together all right now we're going to just go ahead and sprinkle on our cornstarch um not a whole lot but just enough to coat all the chicken all right mix that up nicely as you can see everything starts to combine very well it becomes almost a little pasty but that's good that's exactly what we want that's going to turn into our nice crispy crust later on all right let's go ahead and wipe off our workspace let's start off with a pan um when i fry chicken in the air fryer i like to use aluminum foil under it with a little bit of oil just because it kind of helps i don't know i don't know it's just some dumb dumb stuff i do and it really does work it, it tends to make everything i do air frying wise work very well and i also have one of these little racks that i put on when i air fry um you guys will see why i use this little setup because i really have like a convection of an air fryer situation going on but just go ahead and line up your uh line up your chicken wings and we're gonna go ahead and put it in our oven now first and foremost again i have a hamilton beach uh convection oven which has a convection setting which if you guys didn't know air frying is just convection cooking um we're gonna go ahead and start off with 375 degrees and just turn that on um i like to just put my chicken on there now my process involves a lot of rotating and it's just rotating the entire time probably about every 10 minutes um and you just keep rotating <laughs> rotate 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 and that's what i'm doing here and again i've done this about every 10 minutes or so and after a while this is what you get <laughs> damn what's up motherfuckers yes that's right i'm back and better than ever i have been gone for a very long ass time i know this but i promise you every time i come back on the fucking scene i will bring fire every single time and that's what i'm about to do for y'all today listen i'm not just gonna come back with some bullshit you know some some dumb shit some some uh, gluten-free options or some shit like that. I'm coming back with fucking homemade orange chicken wings. Who the fuck, where are you gonna get orange chicken wings from? You can get that little bullshit orange chicken nugget shit you get from the Chinese store. But orange chicken wings, that's a whole nother fucking ball game. All right, let's begin, y'all. All right, so first we just gonna go ahead and start out with a teaspoon of salt. I'm using uh, like a half pound of chicken wings, I think. I don't know, probably a pound, I don't know how much. It says we're gonna use a teaspoon of pepper also next I like to add a teaspoon of garlic powder a teaspoon of onion powder then my secret is I use one fourth teaspoon of fucking allspice then I add a teaspoon of uh, cayenne pepper um, just a generous amount of chili flakes it don't matter how many you use then my secret ingredient behind these is fucking sriracha. I'm not really using sriracha, I'm using sedoncha, but you know, it, it works the same. And go ahead and just finish the marinade with some olive oil or some vegetable oil. I'm using vegetable oil, but olive oil works too. Go ahead and mix it all up and uh, it's gonna be fucking delicious. Oh, make sure you fucking wash your hands before and after you handle this chicken because I don't want nobody saying Lanier, you did not tell me that I'm gonna get fucking salmonella because I'm telling you right now, wash your fucking hands. All right, let that marinate for about 30 minutes. Next, we're gonna go ahead and start off with our sauce. We're gonna have kind of start working on it. I'm using a quarter cup of uh, vegetable oil. Then I like to use this Kikoman rice vinegar. You know, the same people that make the soy sauce. Go ahead and add a quarter cup of that. You add a quarter cup of uh, soy sauce. I like to use Sweet Baby Ray's Honey Barbecue Sauce. Um, I'm only using it because I like fucking vinegar and honey and I don't have either, so I figured a barbecue sauce might just work just as well. Go ahead and add a little bit of uh, chili flakes and some garlic. Uh, I, use, I like to use fresh minced garlic. Uh, you can mince your own or buy the shit that's in the jar. I'm using a teaspoon of ground ginger as well. Go ahead and add two generous spoons fools 
of orange marmalade. Not the lemon shit, not any of that, but fucking orange marmalade. Go ahead and just mix all of that shit up really, really, really nice. Like, it's almost like, this is, this is like a bomb ass salad dressing to be honest with you. But we're gonna use it for our chicken. I like to add just an extra spoonful of orange marmalade just to give it that really, really, that really tasty orange pop, you know? It should be really thick. Like, it should be like a thicker consistency once you finish stirring it up. Next, take the mar mar marinated, blah, 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 marinated chicken wings and put them in a pan. Um, it's pre-greased, by the way. You don't have to, but just to be safe, use like a pre-greased pan, you know, with some Pam or some oil, whatever. And yeah, they should look fucking delicious before you even cook them. Uh, next, go ahead and just start heating up your sauce. By the way, I put the chicken wings in the oven for anybody who may not got that one. Just go ahead and heat it up, give it a nice little stir. Let it boil. Uh, it should be very nice looking, like almost like a fucking, I don't know, like a, like a syrup or something uh, when it's boiling. And then what you want to do is kind of just bring it down uh, to a simmer. But I like to boil it just because I'm getting rid of the vinegary taste out of it. You know, that just kind of helps get rid of the vinegary taste, but it still has the vinegar present. It's hard to describe. But yeah, after about 30 minutes, your wings should look really, really fucking nice. Like, even before you add the sauce to them. Now, this might throw you off for a loop, but I like to fry my baked wings. That's some weird shit, but it works, trust me. Like for extra crispy wings and to save on fucking oil, if you grew up in a black household, you will know that we fucking save chicken grease. Go ahead and just fry those today nice and crispy. Ah, uh, look at that. Mm, 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 mm. All right, now you can just go ahead and add your sauce to it. Like, this shit is fucking delicious. Like, A1 all day. Mm. Next, just go ahead and mix them up. You can use your hands to mix them up, but come on, like, that that's stupid. Like, you're gonna burn your fucking soul. I like to add some uh, green onions to it, you know, just to give it another little pop. Go ahead and mix that up too. And yeah, guys, I told you I'm coming back with some fire. We are done. That was the end. That shit is fucking delicious. I'm telling you, this recipe is off the chain. And I'm sorry I'm cussing so much, but I missed y'all so fucking much. Uh, I'm just excited. This is this is Tudo Kitchen being very excited, y'all. Well, listen, y'all. Again, I'm sorry for being gone for so long. Uh, but forget all that sobby shit. Until next time, yo. Peace. All right, so we're gonna jump right into this wing recipe with a tablespoon of salt. Next, I have some black pepper here, whole black pepper, that I'm gonna go ahead and grind onto my chicken because I don't wanna use the powdered shit. That powdered fine black pepper is no good. Not for this recipe anyway. Next, I have a tablespoon of garlic powder. And also I have a teaspoon of onion powder. And lastly, we have a half cup of vegetable oil or canola oil, whichever you prefer. And I'm mixing this up with my hands because I want everything to be completely incorporated onto these wings. Like, don't miss an ounce of flavor anywhere. Every bite should have an ounce of, like, should have a flavor bomb. Just be careful to wash your hands afterwards. Um, next, you're gonna add more black pepper. Do not put up your black pepper, because we're gonna be using this black pepper the entire recipe. I promise you that shit. Mix it up some more, just like that. Next, we're gonna line up our pan with these wings. Now, I like to bake my wings before I fry them, just because it's a tiny bit healthier to do that, because it doesn't sit in oil as long. And I'm gonna go ahead and put some more black pepper on top. We're gonna go ahead and toss these in the oven at 400 degrees. And after you're cooked about 90% of the way or about 15 minutes later, this is what you should get. Next, we're gonna go ahead and toss these wings into the oil. This oil was heated to 375 degrees. Um, it really should only take you about seven minutes to cook these wings to finish them off in the oil. Um, seven minutes will pretty much get them nice and crispy, give them that golden brown, brown look that you're looking for. Um, you know, these wings must contain melodin and 
<laughs> that's how they, you know, these are my melanin wings. That's that's really what they are. Um, they must be nice and crispy, and they just can't be soggy because Wingstop sometimes gives me some soggy ass wings, and that's not what I want. All right, so really, this is when the fun part starts. We're gonna go ahead and add some melted unsalted butter. Uh, unsalted because there's already enough salt in this damn recipe. You don't need any more salt. Um, unsalted butter. Go ahead and mix this up. Now this makes these wings extremely rich and delicious and makes these wings significantly better than wing stops off the bat. Now we're going to crack some more black pepper on top. Now again, if you have fine ground pepper, it could work and I'm sure it tastes absolutely fucking delicious, but you know, this kind of works the best. And go ahead and add a tablespoon of lemon pepper seasoning. You know, when you merge that butter, the lemon pepper, the black pepper, and then you go ahead and with the rest of the seasonings that are in the wings, oh, this shit is awesome. Like, this is probably, this is better. I won't be going to Wingstop, and it's cost me significantly less. All right, go ahead and add you a couple of lemons in there if you'd like. And after that, go ahead and take a bite. If y'all enjoyed this recipe, y'all, y'all tell me. Until next time, y'all. Peace. All right, y'all. So we're going to jump right into this wing recipe by adding a tablespoon of salt. Next, we're going to go ahead and add a tablespoon of black pepper, a tablespoon of garlic, and also a tablespoon of onion powder. Now, we're going to go ahead and just add some cayenne pepper in there, you know, to your discretion, as much as you like. Go ahead and finish off the marinade with some uh, vegetable oil. You want to mix this up, make sure everything is nice and tight. You want to make sure you get it right because this has to be completely right. Um, make sure every every single piece of chicken is completely coated. Um, you don't want to miss anything. You want to flavor in every bite. Now go ahead and we're going to start our pan. Now, if you don't have a rack like I have, don't worry. Just make sure you spray down your pan because you don't want this chicken to stick to it. Just go ahead and add your chicken there and you know you know how we do just go ahead and completely add it you guys know i like to bake my wings first just because it just makes life so much easier you guys should know this by now go ahead and put it in the oven at 375 degrees for 20 to 25 minutes afterwards they should come out 100 percent done Yeah, so you guys see this. Um, they should be 100% done. Make sure you check them to make sure none stuck to it, which none did, because I, I, you know, oil mine's down first. Now just go ahead and add this to some hot oil. You guys know how we do it. We fry our chicken first. Second, um, because we want to achieve the maximum amount of crispiness, especially to stand up to these wet sauces. You know, um, a lot of people too often make sauces that are fucking chicken that is soggy with soggy sauce and just uh, it's disgusting so we're not going to do that today go ahead and just take your chicken out y'all um and go ahead and drain them on whatever you got um as you see here i am draining them on some paper towel we're gonna work on our sauce now go ahead and put it on one half cup of sriracha sauce um now we're gonna go ahead after we add our sriracha sauce we're gonna go ahead and add a teaspoon of ginger a teaspoon of crushed red pepper and a teaspoon of garlic now listen this honey you want to make sure you add it in increments don't add all a shit ton of onion uh honey at first just because if you do that you might make it too sweet off the bat and you got to compensate by adding more uh sriracha sauce and they just be a big mess like this is, you want to add it taste to add it to taste so if you like it a little bit sweeter, like I like it a little tiny bit sweeter, which is why I'm adding some more. Um, I want a perfect balance. I don't want it to be too high. I don't want to be too sweet. Let's go ahead and just mix these up. Make sure, you know, they, they're looking right. You know, it's just tasting right. It's smelling right. Everything about it. Like I said, make sure you give it a taste. Um, if, if it tastes good, now you can go ahead and just add a little bit of water to thin it out a little bit. Once you get it to where you want it to be at. You know, because the sauce is just a, t a touch bit too thick for my wings. So I just want to thin it out a little bit and go ahead and add some parsley into there. All right, after you add your parsley, now we're going to go ahead and get our, ring our wings ready, um, which are nice and hot. Go ahead and add some of this sauce on top. These are amazing. I'm not going to lie to you. These are, are fucking amazing. They smell amazing, they look amazing, they taste amazing, they are fucking amazing. And I thank you guys 
fucking love these. Actually, I know you guys will love these because, I mean, why not get in touch with, you know, some Asian, Asian cuisine, even though this, I don't even know if this is fully Asian, but hey, it's whatever, you know, we, we love this. I love it. So I know you guys will love it too. And pretty much after you give these wings a nice stirred mix, go ahead and top it off with some green onions or scallions, whatever you like to call it. Yo, I know you guys will enjoy this shit because I did because these are fucking amazing. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Tudor Kitchen. Today, we're going to be doing air fryer honey garlic wings. Now, although this recipe does take a little time and even a little bit of patience, I promise you, by the end, you completely will not regret it. So, with all that being said, let's begin. All right, so we're going to start off by taking a pound and a half to two pounds of chicken wings, and we're going to season those up. But first, we're going to snap them at the joints. I like to do this because it helps me to lay my chicken wings flat, but it also helps them cook quicker. Um, I'm also using only about eight red wings in this recipe, although I'm seasoning 16. But we're going to go ahead and season this up with some salt and black pepper. Also, we're going to use some garlic powder and onion powder. I'm also going to throw some chili powder in there. For these wings, I also like to use some ground allspice, um, as well as some ground ginger. Um, be sure to look in the description for the full measurements, guys. Also, I'm going to use a quarter cup of vegetable oil to get all those ingredients nice and incorporated. Mm, the smell's coming off of this already. Now we're going to go ahead and hit this with some cornstarch. Now I'm gonna hit it with some more cornstarch, guys. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and just take a little of that vegetable oil. Just rub that in. You guys know I like to do this when I air fry, only because it just helps to crisp up our chicken. Now I'm gonna grease the top rack. And again, I'm only using eight wings. Um, I did have 16 a season, but I'm gonna put those up for another recipe. Um, now let's put these in the oven at at their highest setting that your air fryer can go, um, only because we're gonna get these really crispy, guys. So somewhere around 425, 450 degrees will probably be acceptable, maybe even higher. Um, now this is just the first round of crisping. We're gonna go ahead and flip these, um, just like the last ones. And we're gonna put them back in there for probably another 15 minutes or so. We're gonna start off our honey garlic sauce with about a quarter cup of soy sauce. Also, we're gonna use some freshly grated ginger. I'm using about a teaspoon to a teaspoon and a half of this. Um, also, go ahead and put in a tablespoon of fresh garlic, as well as a tablespoon of hoisin sauce and a tablespoon of oyster sauce. Be sure to mix that all up and not to let anything burn. Now we're gonna go ahead and add two tablespoons of our honey. Remember, do this twice, guys. Now we're gonna also add a little bit of chili flakes in there. And lastly, I'm just gonna add about a handful of uh, green onion. All right. Now our wings are nice and crispy. Look at that. Now this is my favorite part. This is the time and patience part, guys. This is just, you know, just be patient with this. Just please take your time. You could even toss them in it, but I just like to be light and delicate. That's really it. All right, look at that. We're only used about half of it for the first side. Now we're gonna put it back in the air fryer and let that go for about five minutes. Now we're gonna flip them over and do the same exact thing. We want them to be nice and crispy. These are almost like sticky wings, guys. These are delicious. These could probably be pretty good boneless too. Oh, look at that. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. There we go, guys. Honey garlic wings in the air fryer like that. Now go ahead and top it with some sesame seeds or some green onions, some parsley, whatever you got, guys. Um, but the most important thing is to enjoy. I made a little bit of a sauce on the side here, and I'll go ahead and put that in the description as well. Damn.
What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Two Dope Kitchen. Did y'all miss me? Because I really did miss y'all. It's been a long-ass week, and today I am back with another dope-ass recipe. We're going to be making some Cheetos pizza. Now, for some of y'all that might think that this recipe is going to be completely disgusting, would you be mad if I told you it wasn't? Because this recipe was off the freaking chain. Yo, y'all got to see this. So what we're going to do first is we're going to start off with some of that pre-made Pillsbury pizza crust. Now you can make your own pizza dough if you want, but I'm not about to do all of that. It's supposed to be easy recipe. Now, you might have to fight with the can a little bit because Pillsbury has a problem with holding secrets and that's why they make it so hard to get it out. The next, you you know, use a spoon to make it uh, open up a little bit. Now lay out the dough flat. It's rolled up, so you wanna lay it out flat just like that on a, a nice powdered surface. Next, I'm, I'm using a bowl um, to cut a little circle because I want to. I want circle pizzas. I don't want a rectangle pizza or no stupid crap like that. Um, you can use a sharp knife like I'm doing, or you can use a uh, pizza cutter if you have one. Now, when you remove that extra dough um, and take that pizza, we're gonna go ahead and powder the surface again with some more flour. Now, that extra dough that I had um just go ahead and ball it back up just like i did and we're gonna roll it back out because we're making another pizza obviously now see there's extra dough even after doing that so if you want to make like a little tiny pizza then go ahead but i'm not about to do all of that again you can use a pizza cutter if you don't have like a really sharp knife clean up the edges as much as you can we're gonna repeat the same process, remove the bowl. You should see a nice, pretty decent circle. We're gonna go ahead and pre-bake that for about eight minutes. Next, I'm using the Cheetos puffs, not the crunchy ones, because the puffs just work better. I think they taste better too. I don't know, I, I guess that's a matter of opinion. But y'all know how I like, I love my food processors. So just go ahead and add it to the food processor. We're gonna turn it into essentially like a flour-ish breading type of thing. Next, we're gonna add one fourth cup of Parmesan cheese. You don't understand how good it makes this whole mixture taste by adding Parmesan cheese. These tops always give me trouble. Go ahead and blend that up. Next, we're gonna add one tablespoon of Italian seasoning and also a, a teaspoon of garlic powder and just mix it up. Next, I actually don't even know why I'm using butter to butter the pizza. Like, I, I don't really know. I think just butter, just butter it. So, I mean, follow this step, because I mean, it helps the, it helps the, uh, the, um, the mixture stick to the, you know, it, it helps the, the Cheetos stick to the crust a little bit. So, yeah, I guess it's not that big of a deal. Next, you know, I'm just using some store-bought tomato sauce. Um, nothing too crazy. Now, if you want to make your, again, if you want to make your own tomato sauce, then, you know, you can go right ahead and do that. I will probably do a recipe on how to make pizza sauce at one of these days. I just don't like pizza that much. And that's why I never really did one. But yeah, now we're going to add the mixture to it. Um, usually, I would just add it just around the crust. But why just do that? You can add it to the whole pizza. Plus, I made way too much. So that's why I'm adding it to the whole pizza. And it actually came out really delicious. It's like how the pizza places they have the parma on the table for you to use. Next, you just go ahead and use some mozzarella cheese, your standard pie. Now, if you wanna add some pepperoni, some sausages, bacon, all that other kind of stuff, then go ahead and do that too. But I'm just making some really delicious cheese Cheeto pizza. I love cheese, so I added a whole lot of cheese, like a whole lot. Then I go ahead and add some more of that mixture to the top because it's that good. Like it really is that freaking delicious, y'all. Now go ahead and bake it for 400, for about 20 minutes on 400 degrees. No, I lied, not 20 minutes, probably like 10 minutes. And there you go, Cheetos pizza. I bet you never thought you could do it, did you? But I love y'all. Listen, we're gonna use three of these bagels, that's it. Um, reason why I'm using three is because when you split them in half, obviously you're gonna have six pizza bagels. Go ahead and just organize them on your your pizza tray, uh, however you want to do it. Um, now we're gonna go ahead and prep 
our pizza sauce. Now, I'm using Prego pizza sauce, but I'm going to upgrade it because I never use anything just straight out the jar. I'm cheap, but I'm not that cheap. I'm using a half teaspoon of sugar. I'm using one full teaspoon of Italian seasoning. I'm using also a fourth teaspoon of red, red pepper flakes and a fourth teaspoon of garlic. Just go ahead and mix that all up. It's going to taste fucking delicious. It's gonna taste way better than what it did just coming straight out the jar. Now you don't have to use sugar, but I like using sugar. Now we're gonna prep our white sauce. Um, pretty much for the white sauce, you can go ahead and just add a little bit in there. Like honestly, it's probably like a half a cup, not even. Um, go ahead and just add pretty much the same ingredients. Only difference is no sugar and you just add salt and pepper. Go ahead and mix that up nice and easy. Now we're gonna go ahead and apply the sauce to the bagels. See, you see how it's nice and amazing already? Like, I like a thicker sauce too. I don't like really runny sauce, like on any anything Italian. It's really disgusting when people have super runny sauces. Like, it's not fucking tomato soup. I don't understand why the fuck people put tomato soup in fucking spaghetti or even put had the audacity to put fucking tomato soup on a pizza. Now I'm adding a generous amount of mozzarella cheese. Now you can use any type of cheese you like, but if you use any other cheese besides mozzarella cheese on these uh, pizza bagels, you're a fucking weirdo. But I'm not gonna judge you. Go ahead and just add the generous, like I said, generous amount of cheese. You want it very cheesy. And I also like to just top it off with a little bit of Italian seasoning. You can also use just like dried basil if you got, got it, but I like Italian seasoning. Now I'm going ahead and use some hot and spicy pepperoni because I'm hot and spicy. Go ahead and just add three. I, pretty much three mini pepperonis will fit. If you got one of them big ass pepperonis, then like you might only be able to put one. After about five minutes in the oven heated to 375 degrees, you should come out with these fucking delicious ass pizza bagels. Like this shit looks so fucking good. And it tastes just as well, just as good as it looks. I swear to God. Yo, if you like this, please like, share, and comment. And if you haven't already, subscribe. Until next time, y'all. Peace. What's up, everybody? And welcome back to Toot Up Kitchen. Today, we're going to be making a very special dish. We're going to be making buffalo chicken naan pizza. Let's begin. All right, so we're gonna start off by making our white sauce for our pizza. We're gonna use one tablespoon of salted butter. We're also gonna use one tablespoon of all-purpose flour. Mix that up nice. Uh, don't allow it to burn. Uh, so you wanna do this maybe on medium heat. All right, next we're gonna go ahead and add some fresh garlic in there. If you don't have any fresh garlic, just use some garlic powder, that's okay. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and add just about a cup of cream and just let that go for a little while. I like to use a whisk just to get everything going. Um, if you just are patient, everything will break up, but I'm not. <laughs> um, so after you can see, it's starting to thicken up. Now I'm gonna go ahead and add some oregano in there. Mm, it smells good already, my gosh. All right, now the last thing that's gonna bring this all together and thicken it all up is gonna be some Parmesan cheese. I'm using some grated parm. Uh, you can use fresh grated parm or you could just buy it from the store, that's okay too. All right, let's go ahead and put this to the side and let's start on our chicken. Now our chicken, I'm just gonna go ahead and throw some cornstarch on there. Nothing crazy, about a tablespoon. Now I'll go ahead and season it up with some salt, a little bit of black pepper, also a little bit of garlic powder and onion powder. Don't forget that. Nothing crazy, nothing extreme. Just go ahead and mix it all up now. All right, let's go ahead and get this started now in some sort of frying pan. Now you could just deep fry these, but I'm just being a little difficult. I'm just gonna go ahead and, you know, just kinda sear these in a pan with a little bit of oil, nothing too crazy. I just want them to, to be crispy, but I don't want them to be deep fried if you understand what I mean. Now, you could use chicken thigh, which works, but I just happen to add some chicken breast, so go ahead and use that too. As you can see, they're starting to crisp up a little bit. Um, I just keep moving them around mostly. I think I do this method to be difficult, to be honest with you.
all right as you can see it's starting to come together it looks pretty nice already to be honest nice crisp nice and crispy it's almost like seared but like crispy seared all right and now i'm gonna go ahead and start assembling my pizza now it's pretty self-explanatory for what you do for this point going forward you pretty much are just making a nice even pizza try to make it as neat as you can um, I like to spread my white sauce all the way out to the edges because I don't really like to have too much of a crust on my pizza to be honest because I don't really eat the crust um, especially with something like naan because it's just pretty much flat bread all the way through see I'm taking my time on this I just want I want everything to be nice and even you can use a spatula I'm just using a spoon um, whatever whatever makes it easier for you to do this process even a ladle I've seen some people do that I can't do the ladle method that's some real pizza shop, shop stuff all right now I'm gonna go ahead and just assemble my chicken really quick only thing I'm doing is just adding some buffalo sauce in there nothing crazy if you want to know how to make buffalo sauce just mix some hot sauce and butter together nothing crazy smells delicious all right now I'm gonna go ahead and crumble some blue cheese on top of my pizza um, I don't like this on the very top I actually don't like the taste of blue cheese from like an outside perspective I kind of like it when it's buried under things so I tend to put it under my toppings as opposed to as a topping all right now I just have some shredded mozzarella cheese now I did take the time to shred my own mozzarella cheese don't buy any of that store-bought stuff it's nothing but plastic just get like the block of cheese and just shred it yourself it takes a couple of minutes yum and we're gonna go ahead and add our chicken on top um, this is my favorite topping of course want to make sure we spread that out nice and evenly you don't want the chicken to cook in the middle of the pizza of course but we're just gonna go ahead and spread it once we portion out our chicken correctly all right put it in the oven for 400 degrees for eight minutes and boom there we go I'm just going ahead drizzle it with a little bit of ranch um, you can use blue cheese or nothing hope you guys enjoy this and I hope I can make your pizza night nice and special guys enjoy What's up everybody? Today we're going to be making some super crispy, delicious oven baked chicken legs. So we're going to start off with a spice bloom of one tablespoon of salt, one tablespoon of black pepper, one tablespoon of onion powder, one tablespoon of garlic powder, a tablespoon of adobo seasoning without salt, a tablespoon of thyme, a teaspoon of cayenne pepper, a teaspoon of allspice, a tablespoon of parsley, and also some Montreal cheap chicken seasoning. So we're going to go ahead and just mix this up. Don't worry, I will put all of those all of those uh ingredients in the description so you guys can have it for the spice blend because this is probably the only spice blend i use for oven baked chicken and go ahead and pretty much put a half a cup of uh, vegetable oil over the chicken just so it can crisp up in the oven and then i'm going to add half of my seasoning right now just half just so we can mix it up and then we're going to add half later this might seem like a lot but i do have about uh 12 chicken legs in here so you, and you want these flavorful you don't want these chicken wings to just be like nasty and bland i i really don't even like chicken legs like that so you really want to give them as much flavor as absolutely possible so yeah just add the rest of the seasoning in there and yeah it should look completely coated like you know chicken legs are just chicken legs they are blank canvas just like any other part of the chicken and you can make them taste however you want any flavor profile anything and these are probably one of the best ways to make them in my opinion i love them like these are simple but amazing yep and just go ahead you can let that sit for about an hour 
and then I pretty much just start to prepare my oven sheet and I add all the chicken wings in there. You want the condom have them facing the opposite way. Uh, so I guess you can stagger them uh, in the opposite directions. Um, on your baking sheet, if you don't have a rack, then you're gonna have to turn it a lot more just because you don't want the bottom to be soggy. But I like using a rack because it keeps it from sitting in its own juices. And just go ahead and add the remaining uh, the remaining oil that's left in the bowl. I, you know, just add all that all that seasoning, all that flavor in there. Just add it in there. All right, now put this in the oven for about 45 minutes at 350 degrees. All right, after 45 minutes, you want to test and tempt it and see where it's at. Um, you want the chicken to at least be at 160 degrees. Now, 165 is what you need to consume it at, but this is well over that. 160 degrees, it will carry over cook. Now, when you do that, only reason I'm doing that is because I'm going to be flipping these chicken. I'm going to be like turning these chickens, so it's going to be in the opposite direction. Just so I want both sides to be crispy. I don't just want the top side to be crispy and the bottom side to be soggy. That's weird as fuck. So we're going to go ahead and flip them all over and put them back in the oven for about another 15 minutes. Then after that, you know, you're going to go ahead and flip them again. And then after we flip them again, we're going to go ahead and turn on that broiler. Now, when we turn on that broiler, we want them to get super crispy. And after you do that, oh my gosh, they come out crispy like crunchy amazing fucking deliciousness like I, I can't explain this shit it's amazing and just go ahead and garnish it with some parsley and that's it y'all i hope y'all enjoyed this recipe and if y'all like to see more like this i really i know i've been making a lot of sweets lately and i think you guys will like this what's up everybody and welcome back to two dope kitchen today we're going to be making some turkey wings now just go ahead and season those up with a little bit of salt and pepper and then we're going to flip those over and pretty much do the exact same thing on the other side. Um, I am using smaller turkey wings. Um, I don't like the huge pterodactyl size so yeah that's pretty much it. And after you season them up with some salt and pepper on both sides then just go ahead and stick them in the oven and that'll pretty much be it for the recipe y'all. Y'all know I'm just fucking with y'all now. Nah. We're gonna go ahead and we're going to add some cayenne pepper. You guys know how much I love this spice. We're gonna use some cayenne pepper. I am going a little bit lighter on uh, the cayenne pepper on there than I normally would in most recipes. Then go ahead and just flip it over and pretty much do the exact same thing on the other side. After that, just go ahead and sprinkle it with a little bit of garlic powder on top. I'm just doing it on the, the more textured side skin and that's pretty much it. Then I'm gonna put some rosemary, some sage, and some thyme down. Now, for all my folks out there who participate in the herbal arts, this process looks very familiar. Um, I know a few people who might know what I'm talking about, but this is a very familiar process. And I get, I promise you, this is not it. This is, but you know, if you're good at that, you'll be good at this. So pretty much you want to take all of those herbs and pretty much just put them in the pot because we're going to go ahead and mince them pretty, pretty small, just like that. Um, you know, if your knife isn't moving this quickly, then you're probably doing something wrong. So you might want to go and look for um, a knife that has the speed in it. Then I'm going to go ahead and throw some parsley in there. I'm using curled parsley, not the Italian flat parsley. Curled parsley is essential because it's just easier to cut in my opinion. The next we're going to go ahead and drizzle some vegetable oil on top of the turkey wings because we want these to get nice and crispy in the oven. If you don't do this, they'll stick to the pan and they just won't be crispy and they'll be nasty and soggy and sticky and all the above. And then pretty much go ahead and sprinkle your herbs on top of the turkey wings. Now, like I keep saying, this process looks really familiar. This herbs, these herbs look a tad bit familiar, but this is not what you think it is. I promise you, I'm sure that wouldn't taste very good, but I'm sure it would feel very good. So go ahead and pretty much just do it on both sides. You know, um, this smells amazing. Like sage alone and rosemary. I believe they're in the same family. I know rosemary is in the same family as mint, 
but like I think Sage is too. Like Sage has a slight like minty, like like I think they're all in the same family. But like it smells amazing. Like you know between all three. Well, I guess you could say all four herbs. It smells awesome. And thyme, you know, thyme and chicken, thyme and poultry. Period. Turkey, chicken, whatever, just goes amazing. So go ahead and pretty much stick those in the oven for 30 minutes after you finish seasoning them. About 30 to 30 minutes should do it. 30 minutes on 375 should pretty much take care of what you need. After that, you should get some nice, crispy, amazing, delicious, awesome smelling turkey wings. Yo, this is a short recipe, y'all. I hope you enjoy. What's up everybody and welcome back to Tudo Kitchen. Today we're going to be making lemon and herb roasted Cornish ham. We're going to start off by seasoning our ham with some salt and black pepper. Next we're going to go ahead and use some garlic powder. Don't be afraid to season this ham up nice and generously. I'm going to also use some poultry seasoning. I've made my own but if you want to buy some that's perfectly okay. I'm gonna also add some crushed red pepper flakes and we're gonna go ahead and do the same thing to the back. Now in our cast iron, we're gonna get it nice and hot with some vegetable oil and we're gonna put our skin, our Cornish hen down, skin side down. We want it to sear and get nice and hot. We want, we want our skin side to get some color to it. We'll just flip it over and do the same thing to the back. Don't worry, it's leaving all that flavor behind, some of it anyway, and that's going to come back and play later. Alright, as you can see, both sides are pretty seared now. Go ahead and remove them from the cast iron pan so we can start working on our onions. Alright, I'm going to put a little bit more vegetable oil in the pan and I'm going to go ahead and add my uh, are my sliced onions. Now you can dice your onions, you can, I don't know, keep your onions a little bit more whole if you want, but I just like to kind of julienne my onions. Now I'm gonna go ahead and add some garlic in there. And for this, you can mince your garlic, you can dice them, you can slice them. I just, just kind of crush them. Now I'm gonna add my herbs in here. Um, I have different fresh herbs, uh, pretty much have like a poultry blend if you want to just kind of look that up, but I'll pretty much list what those ingredients are below. It's nothing but just some rosemary thyme and basically some oregano. Go ahead and add a half a lemon. I squeezed it and don't worry if any seeds or anything get in it because all of this is going to be made into a sauce, but it's not going to be directly used as a sauce to dip or anything. I'm just gonna go ahead and use some white wine. You can use any sort of white wine. I'm using white cooking wine. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and let that boil. Then we're gonna turn it down to simmer. We're gonna add a uh, half a stick of butter. When we add our half a stick of butter, it should start to melt and it will become a nice thick sauce that we're gonna go ahead and lay our hen on top of. Now we're gonna take our hen and put it in the oven. But before we do that, we're gonna go ahead and lay out some of our lemon slices in some of the various free spaces in the cast iron pan. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, any particular way. I just kinda like to lay them out like this. So if you wanna do it like this too, that's perfectly fine. Now we're gonna put it in the oven, uh, 350 degrees for about 30 minutes. About halfway through, at, at 30 minutes, we're gonna go ahead and baste it with some of that uh, lemon butter sauce. We're gonna put it back in the oven for about another 15 minutes. And afterwards, you should get a nice, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful hen. And at this point, you can eat it how it is, or you could garnish it with different things. Uh, I've decided just to use some dried parsley. Uh, Use some fresh parsley, you can use some green onion, it doesn't matter. What's up everybody and welcome back to Two Dope Kitchen. Today, I'm gonna teach you guys how to make one of my all time favorite finger licking smack your fat mama recipes. This recipe is called bourbon and brown sugar chicken. This is completely freaking amazing. Like when you bite into it, you just get this little joy in your heart. 
All right, so what you want to do is you want to start off with uh, some curly parsley. I also have some scallions here, and I have a few sprigs of thyme. Also, a stick of unsalted butter. You know me and my food processor, so I'm gonna go ahead and just add all the ingredients in there. We're gonna be making an herb butter. Now, I've made something like this before, so you guys know how this goes, blah, blah, blah. I'm not gonna fast forward through it for anybody who hasn't seen it before. Go ahead and add everything in there. You don't really wanna put the stems of the uh, thyme in there. Go ahead and mix that up nice and easy like that. I like to add a little bit of oil to it just to get it going. Because I want it to be as completely smooth as possible. Not too many big chunks from the uh, herbs in there. And pretty much we're just going to be whipping the butter, you know. Next we're going to start on our spice blend for the chicken. I'm using two teaspoons of salt. I'm using a teaspoon of black pepper, garlic powder, onion powder, also a little bit of cayenne pepper. Go ahead and mix that up. It's a very simple spice blend, but it's delicious. Next, we're gonna add just a little half teaspoon of uh, crushed red peppers. Go ahead and mix that up in there. Next, this is the fun part. This is when you show your chicken how much you love it. You know, you go ahead and slather it up with that herb butter there. You gotta make sure you get it in every little crack and crevice. So after you do that, you're gonna go ahead and put the spice blend on top. So make sure you get that on every little piece too. Like this, this butter will start to melt off a little bit in terms kind of pulling your seasoning off. So make sure you, 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 you kind of season it very generously. Make sure you get inside the cavity too. For some people that's weird. All right, go ahead and tuck the wings in and make sure it cooks nice and even. Next, we're gonna go ahead and start on our bourbon. Uh, brown sugar sauce we're gonna go ahead and add 200 milliliters of it which is a small bottle we're gonna add a half cup of brown sugar that's it that's all you need 200 milliliters and a half cup of brown sugar go ahead and mix that up until it starts to boil and all the sugar is dissolved look at that see It'll start to look like this. When it looks like that, now you wanna bring it down to a simmer. So bring it down extremely low. The boiling will start to get slower, which means that it's starting to turn into a glaze, which is exactly what you want. Now, the chicken is about halfway done, so now we're gonna go ahead and put our first layer of glaze on there. And by the way, the oven was heated to 350. Um, that's usually the standard for most chicken. Sometimes 365 for like frying, but since we're doing this roasted, we're gonna do 350. Get that glaze on every little piece. Now that is done, we're gonna go ahead and add our second layer of glaze. Put that back in the oven for about another seven minutes. Now this is the final layer and it's the only layer. You wanna put this in there for, for about two minutes. Turn it up to about 400. Mm, 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 mm. And after you've done that, it should look just like this. Completely freaking delicious. Yo, y'all enjoy this, all right?
What's up everybody? And in the spirit of Thanksgiving, I have another super easy recipe. These mashed potatoes are completely delicious and I know you'll love them. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start off by pretty much rinsing off some potatoes. I have some small Yukon Golds. Just go ahead and rinse them off with some cold water just cause you wanna get all the nasty dirt off and anything else, you know, it's just a good practice to rinse your vegetables and your fruit before you eat them. Even though I don't think potato is a vegetable whatever but yeah we're gonna go ahead and we're going to pretty much just peel them i mean this part is pretty self-explanatory now if you don't want to keep on all the skin then that's perfectly fine um i prefer to pretty much peel about three-fourths of the way just because i like that homey feel you know having like the skins in it, mashed potatoes that's amazing to me so yeah after i peeled them i went and pretty much just set them out of the way and I peeled all the potatoes and it took a little while because I have big hands and then I cut the potatoes into smaller pieces and after you cut them you want to put them in some cold water next I'm going to season uh, some water with a little bit of salt bring that up to a boil just like that next we're going to add our potatoes um, I did drain out all the cold water and that's just to keep the potatoes looking nice and pretty, you know what I mean? And after that, they should pretty much be done. I like to cook my potatoes thoroughly. I do not like my pot mashed potatoes lumpy. That's a personal preference as well, but I prefer mine's nice and smooth. Um, just go ahead and season it up with some salt and pepper just like that. Now we're gonna add a whole stick of unsalted butter. Now do not skimp out on this part. Don't use margarine. Don't use, I can't believe it's not butter or anything like that. Use a whole stick of real butter. It will make a difference, I promise. Next, I'm adding a pretty much like a, I guess you could say a tablespoon of minced garlic. Now, this is an important step too because, you know, why not use fresh ingredients? You know, it, it makes sense. Then now I'm going to add pretty much a fourth cup of cream. Now, you can use, you know, maybe less than a fourth cup. If, you know, that's personal preference. I keep saying personal preference, it really is. Mashed potatoes are different from person to person, but I like mine with like this and it's amazing. When you taste it, this is the best stuff. And then I'll go ahead and just add some gravy to it and that's pretty much it, y'all. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Hey, we're gonna start off with a couple cloves of garlic. I have no fucking idea how many this is, but go ahead and add some salt and pepper to it. A little bit of vegetable oil. Now you can use olive oil if you so desire, but I prefer to use vegetable oil because I'm very cheap. Go ahead and mix that up nice and easy. Go ahead and ball it up in an aluminum foil, making sure nothing seeps out. And I'm gonna put it in the oven for 45 minutes for under 350 degrees. Now go ahead, I have taken the time to large dice some tomatoes, I mean potatoes, I'm a such a dumbass. Go ahead and add that to the water. Now don't be a dickhead like me and add it to not boiling water because that's just stupid. I also have, it's salted too, by the way. So you look how dumb that looks. Now I've taken a little bit of time also to dice some uh, bacon up. Now we're gonna put this in the pan. We're gonna start rendering the fat. Oh my gosh, this smells so delicious. Like that smoky hickory flavor and this recipe is going to be so fucking good. Now, I, I went and I had small diced some onions and I added it in there. Normally I would add them at two different times, but I want the two flavors sold to connect. Like I want to make the perfect match right now. All right, now the roasted garlic should be done. Go ahead and add that to a food processor. We're gonna blend it up nice and fucking easy. All right, now I'm making way more butter than what I need for this recipe, but I'm only doing it because I want to save it for future use. I also like to add a little bit of Italian seasoning to it. Um, you can add fresh herbs, but I'm being cheap and lazy at the same time. So I'm just going to go ahead and use some Italian seasoning. When you blend it up, it should be pretty much a whipped butter. And whipped butter is fucking delicious and easy to just spread on shit. And that's why I love whipped butter. All right, now that the two soles have connected and have formed a perfect unity, you can go ahead and remove it from the stove um, because we're gonna be using it soon. 
go ahead look oh my gosh the potatoes are almost done actually shit they are done let's take them off and put them in the bowl all right this is this is the fun part and we're going to start off with some salt and pepper on the potatoes i'm about to say tomatoes again like an asshole go ahead and add start off with a half cup of sour cream mix it up please use a big bowl i use a small bowl and i should have used a bigger one but I was being an asshole. Add another half cup of sour cream so you can make one full cup. Now you can use more or less, but I prefer to use one whole because it just eliminates the need for heavy cream too. Also, I'm using a fourth cup of my roasted garlic butter. Mix that in there. Something attractive about looking at mashed potatoes, like mashed potatoes and sex go together. And <laughs> now I'm adding a half cup of grated Parmesan cheese. And I'm adding a fourth cup of milk. And I'm also adding my bacon and onion mixture. Oh my Lord have mercy. God help us all. Jesus. Now go ahead and mix that up. I'm using the spoon now to mix it up. Oh Lord have mercy. Go ahead and add some uh, mild cheddar cheese too. You can add sharp cheddar, but mild cheddar just works. And I put it in a casserole dish that was greased and I emphasize greased, okay guys? Don't put it in a non-greased pan. And add some more uh, shredded cheddar to the top. And after you do that, once you uh, spread it out nice and even so each bite can have a delicious mouthful of cheese. Go ahead and just prepare it. Oh my lord, that mercy it looks so delicious so far. Today. All right, we're gonna pull it off, then put it back on, and there we go. Fucking fully loaded mashed potatoes. Bon appetit. Yo, thank you for rocking with me with this recipe, y'all. Yo, until next time, peace. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Two Up Kitchen. Today, we're going to be making loaded broccoli and potatoes in the oven. Let's start off by drizzling the broccoli and potatoes with a little bit of vegetable oil. You can even use a little bit of olive oil if you'd like. Um, let's go ahead and season it with a little bit of salt, also a little bit of black pepper. Um, I'm going to also use a little bit of garlic powder. Or maybe a lot. And I'm going to also use some Cajun seasoning. If you don't have Cajun seasoning, use cayenne pepper. Next, I'm going to use some red chili flakes. Next, I've made a little bit of a herb seasoning here. I'll list the ingredients on the side. All right, I've minced some garlic too if you wanna just add a little bit more garlic for fre fresher flavor. Add a little bit more oil, just mix it up. You can mix it up with your hands if you like. Um, I just felt like using a spatula. Try to mix this up really, really well, um, just so it roasts nice and evenly. After it's nice and mixed, you can go ahead and just lay it out on some type of sheet pan or a roasting sheet or whatever you have in your house. It doesn't really matter. Um, if you have a roasting pan, that'd be pretty cool. But just just basically something, it can be on nonstick that it can lay out nice and flat. So it roast nice and evenly again. Then we're gonna go ahead and put this in the oven at 350 degrees for about 15 minutes. It should come out nice and roasted. Um, then we're gonna go ahead and add Parmesan cheese. Um, you can use store-bought, you can use grade your own, you could, whatever you wanna do. Next, I went ahead and grated my own uh, cheddar cheese. Uh, if you wanna buy some already shredded cheese, that's cool too. But you know, I always like to shred my own when I can. Next, we're gonna go ahead and add some chopped bacon. Now this step is completely optional. You could just leave it at the cheese, you could omit the cheese if you want. But uh, 
it's loaded for a reason, you know? Uh, next, go ahead and put this in the oven at 350 degrees for five, 10 more minutes and boom. Um, honestly, you can garnish it whatever you want with a little bit of parsley, some green onions, whatever. You could even put some sour cream on this if you wanted to, um, but enjoy guys. What's up everybody and welcome back to Tudo Kitchen. Today we're going to be making some sauteed green beans. Now this is a really quick and simple recipe. Let's start off by thinly slicing some sweet bell peppers. Also we're going to thinly slice a half of red onion. Um, you could use a white onion or a yellow onion. It doesn't really matter but I just prefer to use red onion. Okay in some sort of non-stick pan go ahead and get some vegetable oil or olive oil. Uh, make sure you get it nice and hot. We're going to go ahead and add our onions in first. All right, just get that nice mix just to get them a tiny bit translucent before we add in our peppers. Mm. This smells really delicious, honestly. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and add our fresh garlic in. Always uh, <laughs> wipe your garlic off, blade sharp end away from you. Um, I'm using some uh, frozen green beans. You could use fresh green beans, but I just happen to have some frozen uh, French cut beans in the uh, freezer. I just kind of like to mix those up. This is a really quick recipe. This is a, just a simple way to deal with some frozen green beans. All right, let's start off by seasoning with a little bit of salt, some black pepper, a little bit of garlic powder, a little bit of onion powder, also some cayenne pepper, and also I threw in some Italian seasoning in there. Give that a nice taste and bam, it's done. What's up everybody and welcome back to the Kitchen. Today we're going to be doing a very budget friendly recipe. We're going to be doing a Spanish style frittata with chorizo. Now I bought all my ingredients from my local Save-A-Lot which is basically like a budget grocery store and this is what I got. So let's begin. Alright so in the pack of chorizo it usually comes with two of them so I just only use one for this recipe. You can use one per six eggs. Um, I just mix it up just because I hate the way it looks when it's not mixed up. Um, I'm going to go ahead and saute that a little bit just to get it completely cooked. Alright, now I'm going to go ahead and move on to my red onion and I'm just dicing this down. Now this recipe is extremely self-explanatory um, and I won't humor you guys with uh, redundant information. You guys can absolutely add whatever vegetables you like. I am using just the standard fiesta sort of vegetables, basically red onions, peppers, and a little bit of tomatoes. All right. I like to dice my tomatoes this way by basically slicing them and then basically slicing them one way and then dicing them the other way, you know, tomato stuff. And plus, I like to use a firmer tomato when I'm dicing tomatoes anyway, guys. So. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and crack six eggs into a bowl. Um, again, for frittatas, it's make sure you use six eggs to every one fourth cup of dairy and whole fat dairy at that. I'm using buttermilk for this. Notice in this recipe, I'm not using a whole lot of salt, pepper, or anything like that. I'm just letting the chorizo do a lot of the salt salting for me. 
Um, now I'm going ahead and taking some of those hash browns that I got from Save-A-Lot. Um, those are really cheap too, I really like those. Um, you can do a whole lot of things with those. Um, but we'll probably make another recipe about that. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and spray a muffin tin down with some sort of nonstick spray. Again, if you don't have a muffin tin, don't be afraid to just put this in a cast iron pan. Um, I'm going ahead and lining it with my potatoes. I don't completely crisp my potatoes before I do it, just because I, I like them to be a little bit on the, like, you know, softer side. And then I'm gonna add my eggs in there, top it with some tomatoes, and again, this is crazy self-explanatory. It's basically like a little mini casserole. Um, I had an aunt that taught me how to make breakfast casseroles when I was a kid, and I never really forgot how to make them, and I've just been doing all types of variations and styles since. Um, it's just so it's so pretty when everything is put together. I love, I love like the combination of like peppers, onions, and like meat. I don't know, it's crazy. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and just top it with a little bit of cilantro. Um, I like to put it under the layer of cheese just because I don't know, I, it just works. All right, now I like to put my muffin tin on some sort of pan so it's easier to take out the oven, and I'm gonna top it with cheese before I put it in the oven. Now, I put this in the oven um, at about 400 degrees for about 15 minutes. And boom, this is what you get. Spanish style breakfast frittatas. Now, these are, these are minis and it's enough to feed. Now, the recipe is enough to feed 12 people um, if you make the entire dozen of eggs and wolf chorizos and etc. But this is what you got, guys. And I hope you guys enjoy. Oh, and don't be afraid to make this look pretty, guys. Peace. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Tudo Kitchen. Today, we're going to be making a spinach, tomato, and feta frittata. Now, this recipe is mad delicious and it is crazy easy to make. And I really think you guys will really enjoy it, so let's get to it. Okay, so we're gonna start off this recipe with about a quarter cup of vegetable oil or olive oil. And we're gonna use some diced onions here. Now, I'm just sweating out my onions until they get a little bit of color, not too crazy. Next, we're gonna go ahead and add our spinach. Now, I'm adding a lot of spinach because that's all gonna cook down and we'll season that up with a little bit of salt and black pepper. As it cooks down, I'm gonna go ahead and add my tablespoon of garlic. Now, I like to add that towards the end. Now, I'm using six eggs here and also a quarter cup of buttermilk. Do not skimp out on that, guys. Go ahead and mix that up. All right, now we're gonna take our sauteed ingredients and mix it with our egg buttermilk mixture. Okay, in our cast iron pan, we're gonna go ahead and grease it up with a little bit of nonstick spray. You could use a little bit of vegetable oil here or olive oil if you had to, not a big deal. Now we're gonna go ahead and put our egg mixture in there. Now I'm gonna top it off with a little bit of feta cheese. Also, I like to put a little bit of mozzarella cheese on there. This is completely optional, but I really love putting uh, mozzarella on there. I'm gonna go ahead and slice my tomatoes now. Um, I like to use a firmer tomato for this, so but it's completely up to you guys. It can be any kind of tomatoes too, guys. So just go ahead and lay that out nicely. It doesn't even really matter how you lay it out. Um, I'm laying it out pretty, like a pizza basically. Um, but I'm just seasoning it with a little bit of uh, Italian seasoning. And we're gonna go ahead and put this in the oven for about 15 minutes at 400 degrees and boom. We got a nice breakfast frittata. Now I'm gonna go ahead and cut this up into eight equal slices. This is a little bit harder to cut just because it's, you know, it's an egg dish, but no biggie. As you can see, there we go. Spinach, tomato, and feta frittata, guys. Hope you guys enjoy it. Peace. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Tudo Kitchen. I know I've been gone for a long ass time, but I am back and I am bringing some dope ass recipes as promised. Listen, we're gonna be fucking making some shrimp and grits today. Now, this is one of my absolute favorite breakfast foods. Like, breakfast dishes, you don't gotta be from the South to know what some good shrimp and grits is supposed to taste like. 
I think this is just a quick, easy, fast recipe. You know what I'm saying? That anybody can fucking make and make this shit delicious. Start off with a cup of water, cup it some change. Then next, add a fourth teaspoon of salt. You wanna let the water come up to a boil. Um, just so you can add your grits, it has to be kind of a vicious boil before you add. All right, so I'm gonna be using Quaker's old fashioned grits. You can use the instant if you like, but I'm only making about a serving and I think just the old fashioned just tastes a little bit better. Go ahead and add one fourth cup of that. Just go ahead and whisk it in at the same time as you're adding the cup in. You don't want it to clump up. That's the reason why you want to kind of whisk at the same time. What you want to do is go ahead and let that come to a, kind of come to a boil. Um, I just like to let it boil just for about a good minute and a half, two minutes. Then I bring it down to a simmer. Like I'm talking about all the way down. Next, we're gonna go ahead and work on our shrimp. Go ahead and add some butter in the pan. Let that shit melt down nice and easy. Um, go ahead and, you know, work with it. Play with the fucking butter. You know what people do. Then I'm using six extra large shrimp. Um, it doesn't matter. You can go ahead and cut the tails off, but I like to keep the tails on for presentation. Let's go ahead. I like to add a little bit of pepper. Um, a little bit of onion powder, also a little bit of fucking garlic powder if you want. Um, really just play around with the seasonings. Then uh, I'm going to be adding my favorite ingredient. I'm going to be adding fucking cayenne pepper. Y'all already know how I fucking get down with cayenne pepper. I'm going to add some cayenne pepper to that. Then we're going to add a little bit of obey to that. Then we're gonna add some fresh chopped parsley. You can use cilantro, but parsley just to me just, just works better for this recipe. Go ahead and mix that all up. Now we're gonna be cooking this for a little while. Like we pretty much almost want all the butter to seep into and to kind of form a crust around the shrimp. Oh, this little fucker won't flip over. All right, so there we go. Go ahead and just pretty much work it down. Like, be careful not to burn it. Next, we're gonna start working on our grits again, but just make sure you, you stir your grits kind of periodically. You don't want them to stick to the bottom. Then we're gonna just go ahead and flip all of them. You see how all the, the butter is pretty much gone on it, but it's also kind of forming a little crust around the fucking shrimp. Like, it's almost like fried shrimp. Yeah, go ahead and add some pepper to your grits. Next, we're gonna use a little bit of heavy cream. This is the secret behind my fucking shrimp and grits, heavy cream. Go ahead and give that a nice little stir. Don't be afraid. Look how creamy as shit that looks, oh my gosh. I'm using mild cheddar cheese. Sharp cheddar is just too, eh. I don't like sharp cheddar. But mild cheddar is what I like to use for my recipe. Go ahead and give that a nice little mix. Not too much, just about a little handful should be good. About a quarter handful. Because remember, we're only making this recipe for one person. Oh, also I didn't put salt in here, but if you like to add a little bit of, a little bit more salt, then you know, be my guest. And yo, we're fucking finished. Can you believe that shit? Like, this looks so fucking delicious. And I keep telling people that shrimp and grits, like step out of your comfort zone, like, who would have thought that fucking shrimp and grits can go together? But the person who came up with this shit, like fucking kudos to you, cause that shit is amazing. And yeah, man, like I really appreciate you guys for sticking with me and you know, sticking around through all of this and just allowing me to be able to really, I guess, just really be able to allow me to do my craft without worrying about people leaving because you know, this and that and blah, blah, blah. But listen, y'all, like as promised, I'm back and I'm going to have more recipes like this, more dope ass recipes. Yo, until next time, peace. What's up, everybody? Today, we're going to be making a recipe that I found online that I'm going to go ahead and tweak a little bit. We're going to be making pancakes out of cake batter. Let's begin. All right. So go ahead and empty your pouch of cake mix into a bowl. Um, you guys know how this goes. Just like the cookies, just go ahead and empty it in there. We're going to use a half cup of flour. Now we're also gonna add two eggs. 
as well as now the recipe the recipe calls for two and a half cups of milk I thought that was a bad idea so I just went ahead with two two cups I even I think that's a bad idea and then we're gonna go ahead and add a fourth cup of oil now I'm using a whisk instead of a mixer just because I don't want this to fly all, all over the place and I want to just be able to main, maintain a shit ton of control in this damn bowl because I hate when flour gets all over the fucking place so go ahead and just mix this up um, now I thought using strawberry cake mix was probably the best because I love strawberries with my pancakes and why not just go ahead and make a whole damn strawberry pancake versus just putting strawberries on top so yeah, go ahead and mix it up and you want to make sure that you are not over mixing because you don't want to be completely like get the clumps out. Actually, I think it like aerates it or something like have you ever seen like pancake mix kind of blow up or um, if you just let it sit there for a while, that's probably because you over mixed it a little bit too much. But what you're going for is a nappe and this is not quite there yet. So go ahead and add another half cup of flour. Now this is where they don't tell you because they only use one half cup of flour now i'm adding a half cup at a time because that's what it seems to be two cups of milk i told you i think is a bad idea so two and a half cups is definitely a bad idea but go ahead see you see i'm getting flour all over the damn place all right so go ahead and mix this up um you know i'm adding a half cup at a time because i want it to be completely nat pay and nat pay is when it forms ribbons now you see you see how you know it kind of lays over itself that's what you want so go ahead and add some oil to a pan you can use oil butter whatever you choose some spray i like to just use oil or butter whichever i have at the moment i just happen to happen to have some oil so i'm just gonna go ahead and use some of that uh vegetable oil now I'm using a non-stick uh, skillet. Now you want to go ahead and just turn down your turn down your heat a little bit for this because the sugar content in the cake mix will kind of make this burn, and you don't really want that, guys. So go ahead and add this to a pan. Um, and for this, normally I would just say make sure you go low and slow. Once it starts to bubble up, and you can work with it to go ahead and flip it. Go ahead and make that daring flip, and there you go. Um, be careful not to burn it because it is very 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 easy to burn these just because like i said just because of sugar content that is in these cake mix now this is actually a cool way though to make pancakes if you don't have all the ingredients to make your pancakes from scratch um or you don't have any like pre-made uh pancake mix you can go ahead and just use cake mix and pretty much just follow this and just recipe now I'm going to actually recommend that you go ahead, instead of two cups of milk, I would actually go ahead and use one and three fourth cups of milk. Um, you don't really, you know, one and three quarters is probably enough. You don't want to use any more than that. Um, yeah, and just go ahead and follow it from there. And you should have these perfectly beautiful uh, pink weird ass pancakes. Now you can try this with anything. Try it with some chocolate cake mix or some devil's food, whatever. There you go, guys box cake pancakes now listen guys i'm gonna be reviewing more recipes like this because i come across weird little recipes all the time and i like to try them so hope you guys like these and this is just like a little quick little recipe something interesting that you guys could try um it's definitely dope definitely too dope kitchen approve i approve of this i think this is so dope and when you tell people hey you can be like who says you can't have cake for breakfast say some corny shit like that all right y'all Don't be afraid to make this recipe your own. I'm also using some onion powder and garlic powder here. Um, and I'm also using like some steak seasoning. So whatever you got, go ahead and just use it. Um, also, use some oil just to bind everything together and make everything amazing. <laughs> like oil, I don't even know why we use oil to marinate steak, but it's perfect. It works. Just please do it. 
um yeah i'm using skirt steak just because it's a little bit cheaper but it's great for steak it really is now we're going to get a pan nice and hot with some oil um then we're going to add our skirt steak to it now this might seem like a lot of oil for the steak but i trust me it's not like i used a lot of steak like a whole lot of steak because i made a whole lot of tacos um with skirt steak they do cook pretty quick especially because you know we're slicing them thinner so what you can do is pretty much you want to kind of cook them to a medium well like don't cook them all the way through even if you want them a little bit under than that like that's perfect don't cook them all the way well because they will get kind of tough skirt steak is not the best cut of meat so you know it's kind of best to keep it at like a medium well don't do it all the way well oh man it smells amazing like it really does Next, we're gonna go ahead and saute some onions. I, I did um, dim, empty out all of that uh, juice left from the steak, um, added some new oil, and also add some peppers to it. Um, red and green is the traditional route when it comes to a, a, a cheese steak in general. You know, any type of cheese steak is going to have red and green onions. Now, you know, some people choose you know steaks without peppers, but you know, I prefer peppers on mine. Um, we're gonna go ahead and pretty much saute, saute these until they're pretty much a caramelized consistency. Um, like they will look amazing. Like look at the onions, like they're starting to caramelize a little bit. That's what you want. Mm, 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 mm. I love the smell of this little mixture. I really do. It's one of my favorites. Now we're gonna go ahead and start off with a little bit of banana peppers for our little banana pepper salsa. Um, go ahead. add that to a food processor now i want anybody who has anything to say about my damn food processor to shut the hell up because <laughs> we're gonna go ahead and add some cilantro to this now um this it, i just thought of this off the fly like this little you know banana pepper idea i had um it definitely was something oh also add some uh, crushed red peppers to it too but yeah this was something that i had just on the fly i was like this might be a really good topping um, next, go ahead and take some provolone cheese. Now, provolone cheese doesn't normally come like this. What you can do is ask the person at the deli to just slice you a thicker slice for this. So you can, um, pretty much so you can grate it. If you have a box grater or if you have like one of those little handheld graters, whatever you got, just so you can be able to shred the cheese, you know, because it's kind of hard to find like shredded provolone. If you can even find any, you might only find slice. So yeah, it's the best way to do it. It's really ribbony. It's amazing. Fresh provolone is awesome. All right, now I'm starting my little sauce. This is crazy because all it is is mayo and ketchup, but it works. Like this is what's on a cheese steak anyway. So this is what works. Like this little, I, I like to make it seem like it's fancy and call it a tomato a aioli, but it's really just ketchup and mayonnaise, but it's amazing. <laughs> like this is really amazing. I once heard of a person who dipped their fries in this kind of crap. And I was like, that's weird, but it tastes okay. Like, again, I'm also adding a little bit of cayenne pepper just to give it a little bit of a zing, like a little pop, but yeah. And I'm gonna warm up my tortillas. I'm gonna spray like a little pan or, you know, I have a griddle, so if you wanna use like a, you know, just a regular pan, then it's gonna take you a little bit longer, but you know. Now we're gonna assemble our tacos. Use a large plate if you have it. And first, we're gonna lay down our aioli. Next, we're gonna add our peppers and onions. Then we're gonna add our steak. Then we're gonna add our provolone cheese. Now, you can go heavy or light on this. Um, it is a cheese steak, <laughs> so don't just make it just a steak fajita. You know, um, now we're gonna add our um, banana pepper salsa. And there we go, Philly cheesesteak tacos. A, 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 a classic. What's up everybody and welcome back to Tudo Kitchen. And today, I'm gonna teach you guys how to make your very own fried chicken tacos. This is one of my all time favorite recipes. And I know I say that about a lot of recipes, but honestly, I ate about 
three or four, maybe six or seven of these tacos, and it's freaking amazing. You don't gotta go to no food truck, no restaurant. You can make these right at home for pretty cheap. So we're gonna start out by making a little bit of a pico. Um, I'm using, you know, bell pepper, jalapenos, cilantro, tomatoes, and a little bit of onion. Go ahead and dice those all up. Next, go ahead and season it with a little bit of salt and pepper. Also, a half teaspoon of garlic. Um, you can use a fresh lime or lemon, but I'm gonna just use some lemon juice, it's whatever. If you got that in your house, then go, you go for it. Now, we're just using that to bind all of these flavors together and make everything really pop. Now we're gonna work on our taco blend. We have a teaspoon of salt and pepper, a teaspoon of cumin, a teaspoon of chili powder, a teaspoon of garlic powder, a half teaspoon of onion powder, a teaspoon of cayenne pepper. Now we go ahead, just mix all of that up. It's gonna taste freaking delicious. We're gonna use all of the spice book. I'm not just gonna use a little bit. This is not to put away from later. This is to season your meat. Pause. <laughs> go ahead, we have some uh, chicken tenderloins here. This works best for this recipe. You can use chicken breast, but please, if you can get tenderloin, it works the best just because it's so nice and juicy because we're not gonna be cutting it up whatsoever. We're gonna eat this whole, and nothing's better than eating chicken tenderloin at home because it's so tender and amazing. Go ahead, and like I told you, we're gonna use this entire blend, so don't think that this is too much. This is actually perfect. Just make sure you evenly distribute it on all the tenderloins. And I have about a pound of tenderloins here, by the way. Next, go ahead and season some salt and pepper in your flour. Let's go ahead. Now, I've been through this whole breading thing a billion and one times, so this is pretty self-explanatory. Now, you guys all know it's in flour. And then next, we're gonna go ahead and put it in the eggs. Y'all know how this go. I fry too much stuff on this channel for y'all not to know how to bread stuff by now. But it is critical that you do take the time to do this and get it on each and every piece because you want that even crunch all throughout the entire tenderloin. Tenderloin is like the filet mignon of chicken, to be honest. Go ahead, I'm using panko breadcrumbs, by the way. And after you do all of that, we're gonna freeze this for about 35 to 45 minutes. Um, now we're gonna make our own hard shell taco. I'm using corn tortilla. Now if you, if you have flour, like a small flour one, that's cool, that's cool too, but I'm using a white corn. Uh, tortilla just to kind of keep it a little bit more authentic and keep it tasting pretty freaking good Now I'm doing this you kind of have to shape it in a fryer Which means you can only kind of cook one at a time But if you have one of those little tortilla shapers then all, by all means, please use it because I wish I had one Matter of fact if y'all want my information so y'all can send me one. I'll be happy as hell You want to do that till it's nice and golden brown once it starts to fry them all the sides it should harden up into the shape that you want it to be especially if you do it just like this but it takes time and patience this is not something that takes it, it cooks quick but it's a process just to shape it now we're going to go ahead and add our tenders to that same oil after you do all the tacos because it's clean oil we're only using you know the tortillas so you know there's no sense of making new oil for that now go ahead you can cook these all the way through in the in the oil you don't have to worry about putting it in the oven if you feel that you need to put it in the oven go ahead and toss it in there for about an extra 10 minutes after you pull them out after they're they're nice and golden brown like that but mine's cooked through pretty easily but go ahead and put it in there for about 10 minutes now we're going to start on our baby arugula salad that's going to go on the bottom so i have some apple cider vinegar right here go ahead and spray that on there just like that you can use any brand and also have some olive oil I'm using some sriracha and that is very odd for some people, but hey, it works like hell. Sprinkle it with a little bit of salt and pepper and also another little thing of garlic. This is, it's so flavorful. You don't understand how good this tastes just like that. There's so many different elements to this dish that makes it just taste freaking amazing. There's so many flavors. Now we're gonna work on our little, uh, our little spicy mayo or spicy aioli, whatever we want to call it. And this is very simple. I'm just using some mayonnaise and I'm also using some tapatio uh, hot sauce. Go ahead and spr sprinkle that on just like that. I use one fourth cup of mayo, by the way. 
Let's go ahead and mix this up. Now, this is completely optional to leave this out, but honestly, this sauce makes the taco. Like, this is what you taste. This is amazing. Like, some people may be like, oh, too much mayo, but hey, it's whatever. And now we'll just go ahead and assemble the tacos just like that. And from this point, it's just self-explanatory. Put the chicken tender in there. Just, oh my gosh. Whew. This, um, like, Lord, my mouth is watering all over again. Now go ahead and I have some, uh, some Mexican blend cheese. Now you can use some cheddar, white cheddar, whatever kind of cheese you want to use. But, you know, that, that little Mexican blend works. So go ahead and add the pico to it. Assemble it in this order, by the way. Don't assemble it in different stages. And now, you know what I'm saying? Use this, not sparingly. Enjoy the hell out of this aioli. And there you go. We're gonna start this recipe with the spice blend using a teaspoon of salt and pepper, a teaspoon of garlic powder, a teaspoon of onion powder, also a teaspoon of cumin, a teaspoon of chili powder, and last but not least, a teaspoon of adobo seed. Now you guys know that I love making spice blends when I'm, you know, working with proteins just because it just makes life so much easier. Um, so just go ahead and add your spice blend. I'm using some boneless, skinless chicken thighs that I've just gone ahead and just cut up. Um, you can use chicken breasts for this recipe if you prefer, but I think just chicken thighs just work out so much better. Now in some type of pan, just go ahead and, you know, get some uh, vegetable oil nice and hot so you can go ahead and throw some minced garlic in there. Be careful not to burn it. After you do that, add your chicken in. And really, it's, this part is self-explanatory. Only thing you want to do is go ahead and mix all of this chicken up till it's completely cooked, which doesn't take very long, you know. And when you're cooking this, you're going to start to form, you know, some flavor in the pan. You know, that that's not burn at the bottom of the pan. That's flavor right there. That's what you want to keep in the pan because what we're going to do after we get all of our chicken out of the pan is we're going to do something crazy where we're going to we're going to do something amazing. We're gonna go ahead and just add a little bit more oil into the pan. And now what we're gonna do is add uh, some of this deliciousness. We're gonna go ahead and add all of our onions and peppers in there. And the reason why we didn't use a brand new pan is because you want those flavors to transfer and everything is about layering flavors in order to make things the best of the best. Like nachos are such a simple concept to the point that you gotta get a little bit complex. So I'm going ahead and just adding some corn in here. Um, like, you know, you have to have those Southwest flavors. So, you know, some corn should do, you know, you can use frozen corn, canned corn, fresh corn, whatever kind of corn you got. I'm just using some frozen corn that I had in my freezer. Now you go ahead and just add that into the chicken. Um, Cause we're gonna be just mixing that up. So, you know, no worries. All right, now just go ahead and just give it a solid mix. Uh, I love, making anything southwestern because everything always just looks so fucking beautiful like the colors they just always pop no matter what southwest it is just go ahead and give it a taste and if you like it you know go ahead and add your black beans in there now now the black beans are optional but they are traditional to southwest flavors so you know you don't have to add them if you're not a big fan but i, I love black black beans so go ahead and just add your chips to a plate or pan if you have some type of like cookie sheet or something like that, you can do it in that, but I'm just using a plate because my all my plates are oven safe. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and add my mixture on top of the chips. Now you can use any type of tortilla chips you want to, like if you wanna use the triangular ones or you know the strips or even the mini ones, maybe not the scoops. But yeah, I'm just gonna go ahead and add some shredded cheese. This is a sharp cheddar and pepper jack uh, blend that I had, you know, just shredded myself. Um, you can buy those, you know, but yeah, I like to do it that way. Just add the rest of your mixture on there. And then after you pretty much add all of that of your mixture, then you can do this, which is optional. I like to add tomatoes to mine. You can also add some, some really, really nice jalapenos. Now, listen, guys, this is a perfect Super Bowl snack. Like, this is great for any, any completely amazing game day so go ahead and just put this in the oven i'm putting the oven on 350. um you probably want to just keep it in there for about seven to ten minutes and afterwards the cheese should melt the chip should be nice and crisp you know things should just uh, it's it's amazing they smell amazing too and go ahead and just dollop it with some sour cream now if you're not a big fan of sour cream i don't know what planet you're from but sour cream is delicious on nachos 
and just go ahead and top it with some parsley or some chives whatever you got yeah and after that you've made some perfect game day nachos and you know these are not just your normal traditional nachos but yeah these are amazing what's up everybody and welcome to two dope kitchen yo today we're gonna be making something super fucking special we're gonna be making jerk chicken spring rolls in light of super bowl 50 sometimes you just get tired of the same old buffalo wings or the same old potato skins so why the fuck would we do that we're gonna do something different because this is fucking two dope kitchen All right, people, so we're gonna be making our jerk marinade from scratch. So start off with three fourth cups of low sodium soy sauce. Next, I'm using about six to eight, uh, six to eight stalks of green onions. Also, I use one yellow onion. I use two to three jalapenos. Also, I like to use habanero peppers. Fresh thyme is a must, do not skip that. One tablespoon of garlic is also a must. All right, so the three spices that I'm adding to this is nutmeg, allspice, and some ground cloves. This is what makes up the jerk flavor. Also, I'm using two tablespoons of brown sugar. Go ahead and blend all those flavors together. Um, just blend it to it's pretty much a, a loose paste. All over the chicken the entire thing I am NOT touching that shit with my bare hands so use a spoon if you touch it it you will feel like this if you touch your face And I started to heat up a pan, um, make sure it is super hot, like extremely hot, not hot to the point where like your oil is gonna catch fire, but hot that you hear that sizzle. Listen to that sizzle. By the way, I'm using chicken thighs. I don't like chicken breast for this recipe. If you want to use chicken breast, you can, but to me, I just like thighs. I like dark meat. All right, so just go ahead and flip it over um, once it's been cooking on each side. Let it caramelize. It will caramelize. It will like kind of stick to the pan, so you got to kind of wiggle it off um, just because of the brown sugar, but that's what you want because that's extra flavor. Every little crust that it adds, adds another depth of flavor and it makes your dish that much more complica complicated and that much more complex. All right, you see that? All that little extra goodness left in the pan. Go ahead and add your mixture. Um, I'm at, this is a red cabbage and green cabbage mixture. Really, honestly, this is like coleslaw mix. I mean, I made this from scratch. I kind of cut all everything up. But you can buy coleslaw mix, this is everything in it. Only thing you wanna add is just red onion to it and you just use coleslaw mix. That's exactly what I use. Like they come, it comes pre-made like kind of like lettuce does like in the bags, the pre-made salads, but you can use just whatever. All right, so I'm not touching the chicken with my bare hands. I really don't want to feel like I've been pepper sprayed in the mouth. So I'm just gonna go ahead and, you know, pull the chicken with the fork. Um, as you see, I'm demonstrating how to do it. All right, so this is the fun part. Um, rolling your spring rolls aren't difficult, but, you know, with the ingredients being kind of greasy, be careful of them 
seeping through the spring roll, it is a possibility that that, that can actually happen. Um, yeah, but you want to add, you can add a generous amount or you can add a small amount. Really, it's up to you. It doesn't matter. To seal the spring roll, you need to use the egg wash mixture. All it is is just an egg. Um, some people like to use like water and flour. Or, so I just use one egg, that's it. Simple, easy, done. All right, so just go ahead and drop that spring roll into a fryer. Um, you're gonna have to turn the midway through. Um, but you know, just go ahead and drop it in there. Turn it over once it's nice and golden brown. Be careful not to let them burn. These are some tricky little fuckers, aren't they? Jesus. So after you're done, you have jerk chicken spring rolls. I have made a dipping sauce out of pineapples and mangoes. Um, the recipe will be in the description, but hey. As always, thank you guys so much for watching this recipe. And if you guys would like to see more, please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Until next time, peace. What's up everybody and welcome back to Two Dope Kitchen. Yo, today we're going to be making Meat Lover's Pizza Monkey Bread out of Pillsbury Crescent Rolls. First thing you want to do is take each crescent roll apart and roll it back up. Then what you want to do is you want to go ahead and cut each crescent roll into thirds, just like I have shown here. Alright, so what I have here is four tablespoons of melted butter. Also, I have one teaspoon of garlic powder and one tablespoon of Italian seasoning. All right, so what you want to do is just go ahead and pour that mixture over top of your crescent rolls um, in any type of bowl. I'm not using my hands because I don't feel like getting a messy, so I'm just using a fucking spoon. Y'all can do whatever the fuck y'all want to do, but I'm going to use a spoon. All right, so now we're getting to the good stuff. I have bacon, sausage, and also I have some pepperoni. Let's go ahead and add those into the dough. Uh, whatever order you like you can use as much or as little as you like of e any of the ingredients you can also add ham or anything else again I'm not using my hands I'm using a spoon but if you want to use your hands I'll pop it to you brother or sister all right so traditionally when you make a uh, fucking monkey bread you use like the circle cake pan shit I don't know we're gonna do something different. We're just gonna use a glass bowl because we're not about to pay for some shit we ain't got. Just go ahead and spray that, spray it down because um, you don't want your crescent dough to stick to it. Then go ahead and just add it. Just add all the pieces to it. They're gonna be covered with all the meat that you put in there. Um, so just add them all to it. Don't be afraid. They don't have to go in there in any particular way. Just make sure they cover all the edges. Yo, they look really good already. Like. They're not even fucking cooked yet. But go ahead and put that in the oven for about 15 minutes at 350 degrees. After 12 to 15 minutes, it should be slightly golden brown. Just go ahead and add your cheese to it. I'm using a pizza blend. Oh my gosh. Just go ahead and put it back in the oven for about another five minutes. Look at that. Oh my fucking God. Oh, you see how cheesy that is? And yeah, they're supposed to come out like nuggets. Because um, they're supposed to be dippable. You just dip it into like marinara sauce or something like that. Oh my gosh, look how amazing it looks, yo. Fuck this, I gotta eat one. This has been another dope-ass recipe. 
yo i really appreciate all the support and for you guys watching if you like this video please don't be afraid to drop a like please comment please subscribe if you have any suggestions want to see anything else let me know please share this with the world and i want to see y'all variations on this so and all right for this coconut shrimp recipe we need the three step battering method you know we use flour we use eggs and only thing different is we're using breadcrumbs and sweetened coconut flakes i'm using jumbo shrimp if you want to use something smaller then go ahead but you want to make sure you peel the vein if you they're not already done and just keep the tails on just for presentation next you want to go ahead and throw your peeled shrimp into the flour make sure it's nice and evenly coated you want to make sure it's all the way coated too even in the inside and in the splits then go from the flour you want to put it in the eggs and the reason why we put in the flour first is so that the eggs can stick to the actual shrimp and from the eggs you want to go ahead and put it in your breadcrumb and coconut flake mixture so you make sure it's nice and evenly cooked. You want to make sure that you pat the pat that mixture onto the actual eggs, onto the shrimp, so you can make sure it sticks. After it should look just like this. Go ahead and drop your shrimp into preheated oil. I have it preheated to 350. You don't want it any higher than 350 because the coconut flakes will burn really easily. Your fryer should be very hot before you put it in because you don't want them to soak up all that grease unnecessarily. And go ahead and just make sure you keep your shrimp moving in it. You don't want it to sit to the bottom and burn. Oh man, look at that. That shit looks so delicious, y'all. All right, so I have mango slices. You can use peaches because we're gonna be making a sauce. You can use peaches, but I prefer mangoes for this recipe. Go ahead and put that in your food processor or blender and go ahead and blend it all the way through. Make sure nothing is chunked whatsoever. It's completely soft. All right, next we're gonna add some crushed red pepper flakes. Um, I like to go a little bit heavy handed with this just because I do prefer mine to be a kick because this is kind of a spicy mango sauce. That's what this is supposed to be. Uh, go ahead, add a little bit of salt and pepper. And this is the fake sriracha. Listen, y'all, I'm putting it in my description to go fund me. I would really like to buy some new sriracha. Um, if you could please go support your boy, thank you. All right, so go ahead and add the sriracha sauce to, to the, the mixture. Um, this is what gives it that pop that we that we really love and what makes this, it just tastes so fucking good with the coconut shrimp, it's ridiculous. Yeah, that's gonna be a delicious ass sauce. I can tell y'all that already. Go ahead and taste it. It's not quite there yet. So what I'm gonna do is add some general soy sauce to it, right? Now I'm gonna tell you why I'm adding this. I'm adding it because it contains shit like soy sauce, ginger, garlic, all that kind of stuff, which I don't feel like adding individually. So if I had the sauce already, I'm gonna just put it in there. Yo, this recipe was so delicious, y'all. And I'm gonna tell y'all, y'all y'all really gonna enjoy it. What's up, everybody? And welcome back to Tudo Kitchen. Yo, today we are making fucking Hennessy pineapple shrimp kebabs. What's better than that? First order of business is to drink more than half of the bottle because you can't make this without being turned. Go ahead and add that to a sauce pot, whatever you have left over. I like to bring the Hennessy up to a boil um, just because I like to cook the bite out of the Hennessy. I like the flavor, but let's cook out the bite. Next, go ahead and add a quarter cup of soy sauce. Then we're gonna go ahead and just bring that up to temp because the soy sauce is kind of cold, so we're gonna keep bringing that up to a boil. Then I add a teaspoon of garlic. You can use garlic powder, but please use the fresh shit. Then I'm using a quarter cup of brown sugar. Just go ahead and mix that all up and let that come back up to temp again. Um, it's gonna, like this process, it's not gonna happen very quick, but just make sure you just keep it from burning. All right, next go ahead and add a quarter cup of pineapple juice. Um, yeah, I'm gonna just let that boil, come to a boil. And once it comes to a boil for about two minutes, then I go ahead and let it simmer. I like to use the skewers and 
You can use like toothpicks or something, but I'm just gonna use skewers. It just makes life easier for, you'll see why it, it makes life easier for this kebab. Then the way I'm doing it is I'm doing three shrimp to every skewer, stick, toothpick, big ass toothpick, whatever you wanna call it. Then I'm doing uh, three, three shrimp to four uh, pineapple pieces, and that's how it should look. I mean, it's I think it's very proportionate, very delicious. Yeah, and I mean, the way I do it is I line it up over like your standard like baking pan. Um, yeah, like your standard cake pan. I go ahead and just line them up because the kebab, the skewers were big enough to fit and you don't want them to kind of be on there because they will stick. It's kind of like almost like grilling in your oven, I guess, like they won't stay. But yeah, your, your mixture should be turning into a syrup, which is good. That's exactly what you want. Um, it should be on a simmer. Do not let it boil the entire time. Okay, you see how syrupy it is? Syrupy, oh, syrupy it is. All right, next go ahead and paint. Uh, just go ahead and paint your hitting mixture on top of your shrimp kebabs. Um, this process, you want to be very generous with how much you put because you want the flavor to be all throughout the entire kebab. You don't want the pineapples to just taste like it or just the shrimp, you want all of it. So when you get that same bite, and also this stuff in the oven will burn. So that's why I put them, line them up the way I do um, on the baking pan. It keeps it from touching the bottom of the pan, by the way, if you were wondering. Then after you finish uh, painting them all with the mixture, then you can just go ahead and put it in the oven. I have the oven preheated at 375, um, anywhere between 375 and 400. It depends. And I like to add a little bit of crushed red pepper flakes uh, right before I put them in there just to give it a nice little kick. You don't need to add any salt or pepper. Normally I would tell you to add some of that kind of shit, but soy sauce is very salty. We don't need to add that. All right, once it comes out the oven, it only takes about literally like 10 minutes. It should look very delicious. Yo, thank you. If you guys would like to see more recipes like this, please let me know. Until next time, yo. Peace. Today, I'm gonna teach you guys how to make Burger King's Cheetos chicken fries. Go ahead and add a half teaspoon of salt, a half teaspoon of black pepper, also a half teaspoon of paprika, and last but not least, a half teaspoon of granulated garlic. Go ahead and add one fourth cup of breadcrumbs to this mix. Go ahead and give it a nice little mix. Remember that this is ground chicken, so uh, just be very careful. I'm using a spoon at first, but I realized that it wasn't getting as mixed as I like. So honestly, I'm probably just gonna go ahead and ditch the spoon. Um, just because when you work with your hands, it's the best. Go ahead and just mix it up nice and well. I'm using ground chicken. Now this recipe could most likely work with ground turkey too, if that's more your style. But then it's not chicken fries no more, it's turkey fries and Burger King doesn't sell turkey fries. So if you wanna stay true to the recipe, please use ground chicken. Go ahead and roll it into a small meatball, um, probably about, uh, I wanna say like one, one fourth cup would make a small meatball and just go ahead and work that meat. You have to go ahead and completely caress the meat until it forms a little small turd. Now I said turd and not shit because I'm trying not to curse as much, but it is what it is. Go ahead and place your, your, your small turd chits and the flour and just give it a nice little toss. Make sure it's nice and coated on each side of each little piece of turd. Now this is delicious turd, delicious shit, delicious turd. It is gonna taste very good. Again, you wanna go ahead and give it like a nice little second coat inside the flour. It's completely 100% coated. And you guys know the drill. Just go ahead and put it in an egg mixture. Um, I have three eggs to a little bit of milk in there. You can use water too, but milk just, you know, I don't know, I just use milk. Then we're gonna go ahead and make our uh, final layer with a little bit of breadcrumbs. And we're gonna fill up our whole food processor with some Cheetos. This will probably be pretty damn good with hot Cheetos too, but I'm just trying to stay true to the recipe just because the recipe dropped today in most Burger Kings, so yeah. Um, this is also really good if you're not trying to, you know, cause I don't know, that artificial shit from Burger King is pretty trash, like just from any fast food place. So like whenever y'all can find recipes to 
to make yourselves, then y'all do it. Y'all let me know if y'all want me to make more like this. Go ahead and just add that into a pan. And I'm also gonna add a little bit more breadcrumbs just because I wanna give it some body. I don't wanna just use straight up Cheetos. Now you can if you like, but I mean, it really doesn't make a difference. I had a big ass bag of Cheetos anyway and I could use the whole thing and way more, but I just wasn't trying to do that. Go ahead and just add that to it. Get it nice and coated. I'm using a spoon at first. Um, I got this from uh, Healthy Junk Food. This idea of using a spoon when you make these because yeah, that is a, a problem that you deal with a lot. Uh, getting, getting your fingers all disgustingly coated and it's kind of nasty and it's kind of hard. So go ahead and test out your oil. It should be nice and hot. Go ahead and just add it to it. You know, we're back to this oil jacuzzi. You know what I'm saying? Uh, everything is really going to be fucking delicious once it's done. Like I actually, as soon as I dropped it, I knew that this recipe was a fucking success. And honestly, this would probably be the way I make chicken nuggets for now on. Like, who the fuck? Like, I mean, it's cool to have like breast meat for chicken nuggets, like cutting it in, in cubes and shit. But like, this is like, this stays true to fast food. Like, it's that same food with just knowing what the fuck is in it. And once you're finished, it's done. Go ahead and dunk it in some ketchup or some honey mustard or some barbecue sauce. And that should be it, y'all. Until next time. Peace. What's up everybody and welcome back to Tudo Kitchen. Today I have another banging ass series for you. We're gonna be doing a new series I came up with called What's in Your Kitchen. Pretty much this is going to be a series based around making something out of nothing and right here I have a few things. I have a pepper, about a quarter pound of ground beef, uh, an old ass can of baked beans and an onion. I'm gonna be making some delicious ass baked bean chili now for anybody who has anything to say about this not really being chili this i will put this up against anybody's chili period um pretty much i'm gonna go ahead and just small dice these onions and, and peppers um now again y'all this series is about making the best out of your situation and being able to take anything so later on during the video i'm gonna ask you guys again you guys tell me what's in your kitchen and I'll try to make it. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and add a little bit of vegetable oil to a pot. Now this is a one pot recipe. Um, I know a lot of people favor this just because it limits dishes and just lim it's just much easier to just do everything in one pot. So I'm gonna go ahead and sweat out these onions. Go ahead and add a little bit of salt and pepper to it. Um, to these onions and peppers, go ahead and just sweat them out. Um, I do like to get a little bit of color on them. So um, once I just go ahead and get them nice and coated in the oil, I just kind of spread them out and let them sit. And then I'm gonna go ahead and start to work on my seasoning for the ground beef, uh, my chili seasoning. So I add a teaspoon of salt, a teaspoon of garlic, a teaspoon of onion powder, and a tablespoon of chili powder. Next, I'm gonna go ahead and add my ground beef once they've got a nice little color on it. And just pretty much, we're just going to just chop this ground beef up with a spatula. If you got a spoon, whatever you want to do. I like to use a spatula just because I can kind of dig in there a little bit better. Then I'm going to go ahead and add my chili seasoning to it. Now, this chili seasoning is missing one ingredient, and that is uh, cayenne pepper, which I'm going to add a little bit later on. Uh, I just go ahead and mix this all up. Now, you can substitute like ground beef for ground turkey if you got it, or any type of ground, even ground chicken might be halfway decent with this. But for this particular recipe, I just happen to have uh, some ground beef. Now, go ahead and add your cayenne pepper. I'm adding a teaspoon of it. Just go ahead and mix that up. Now you can use like some like old burgers if you got them, like them frozen burgers, like cook them up and then chop them up. Like Wendy's does it all the time. Like I'm putting Wendy's on exposed mode right now because they use patties for their chili and it's still fucking delicious. And we all have at some point maybe had Wendy's chilies and I personally love it. So go ahead and add your baked beans to the pot. Now this particular one uh, is maple flavored. So this is a little bit sweeter um, for some people who may not like that. Um, the heat from the cayenne pepper and the chili powder does tame it down a whole lot. And it actually gives a really, really nice balance. 
and I'm pretty much just going to go ahead and add about a little bit of water. I put some water in a can, so um, just to add a little bit more liquid in there. Um, it doesn't take away from the recipe at all. It just adds to it and just, you know, make it perfect. I found some tomato sauce that, because I didn't have no tomatoes, I was like, you know what, this tomato sauce just might work. So I go, I just went ahead and just added uh, the tomato sauce, which actually helped it taste. It, it tamed a lot of, like, it really did help tame that sweetness down because it kind of gave a little bit of acidity to it. And I'm mixing this up. And if you love chili, I think you'll respect this. And I went ahead and added a tablespoon of Italian seasoning. Um, it just added just all the right herbs in all the right places. Like, it's just, it's just a perfect concoction for what you got going on right now. And just pretty much just let it simmer. Like, you know, chili is all about building flavors and kind of letting it go low and slow. And after about 45 minutes of simmering, go ahead and add it to a bowl and top it however you like, you know, to each its own when it comes to eating chili. Some people just eat it straight, like, out of, out of the pot. You know, I like to add cheese and, you know, if the cheese doesn't do it for me, I sometimes even add sour cream, you know, that's just me. So, yeah, go ahead and test it and try it in all ways. And if, again, y'all, if y'all like this and if you want me to let you know what's in your kitchen, you tell me. Until next time, y'all. Peace. Everybody and welcome back to Tudo Kitchen today. We're going to be making some amazingly delicious as Philly cheese steak spring rolls. Now listen, y'all know I'm from Philly. Y'all know I fucking love my cheese steaks. Now, I have some extremely thin sliced steak right here. Now, I sliced it myself. Now, if you can't slice it, then go ahead. Now, I have some seasoning from one of my homies. Uh, her YouTube channel is called Jersey is Naked. Uh, make sure y'all go check her out. She sells spice blends and they are fucking to die for. Like, these are amazing. Like, everything you need is in one fucking seasoning. Like, this is for beef, and I don't need salt, I don't need pepper, I don't need garlic powder, I don't need none of that. Everything I would use is in this one container, and I definitely think y'all should check her out. I'm gonna put everything in the description. Now, go ahead and season it generously and add some uh, vegetable oil in there and just mix it up completely. Um, it should be easy to work with. Again, y'all, I'm using thinly sliced steak. Now, if you can't find it already sliced, then go ahead and buy like the steak that you would get like four cheese steaks. They come in a box, you can use those. Those work just as fine. I just wanted to use some authentic steak here. Yeah, just go ahead and mix that up and that's really all you have to do. Now, we're gonna go ahead and move forward with the onions. We're gonna start cutting up these onions and making sure the onions are going to be nicely sliced, very thin. For this recipe, make sure that you don't have the onions too thick. I can't emphasize that enough, just because it's gonna make your life harder when it comes to rolling these up later. And yeah, you can't have a cheesesteak without onions, come on. Like, if anyone wants to tell you that anything differently, they are fucking lying to you. I'm telling you, you cannot have a cheesesteak without fried onions, at least. All right, now I'm gonna also pretty much do the same thing to these peppers. I'm gonna go ahead and julienne these peppers. Um, it is something very, very therapeutic about, like, prepping vegetables. I don't know if I'm the only person that feels like this, but I fucking love to prep vegetables. Um, it's just, I love the colors, I love the smells, I love how pure vegetables are, you know? It's just, it, it makes life easier. But yeah, again guys, we're gonna go ahead and julienne these peppers. Um, I'm using red and green bell peppers now. If you know, if you can find the ones in a jar, you know, go ahead and use those. Um, you can use banana peppers, you can use hot peppers. You know, whatever you want to do, it's kind of up to you, but, you know, I recommend just using my recipe. I'm using bell peppers. Just cut them up nice and easy because we're going to go ahead and saute these. We're going to just put a little color on them, um, and that's really it. Now we're gonna go ahead and add some vegetable oil to a pan, and we're gonna add all of our veggies in there. Um, this is the part when it gets really fun, just let that cook up a little bit. Um, now you wanna go ahead and add your bell peppers in there, get it nice and sauteed. Um, now this is the point when I would add like salt and pepper, but because I have this amazingly delicious ass spice blend, I'm gonna go ahead and use some of that spice blend in here. So 
Yeah, there we go. Hold on a second. Now I'm going to add some of that spice blend in there. Um, why, why not just add extra flavor to it? It doesn't matter. Um, yeah, you just want to make sure you keep it moving. Um, I'm going to go ahead and saute these up, make sure it's nice and nice and golden. You don't want them to burn. That's that's very important not to let them burn because they're going to continue cooking even when you add your meat. So you want to make sure that you prevent it from burning. Um, and yeah, just move it. And now, mind you, my heat is on high um, right now. Just because we're working on high heat, we're, we're moving fast. We're not and nothing is nothing is low. You know, this is not a process that, you know, can be a low and slow thing. This is very high. You want to make sure you cook all of this real fast. Yeah, and as you can see, what I'm doing here is I'm kind of breaking up the, the beef a little bit more in the pan as it cooks. Um, not too much, you know, the way I sliced it is pretty perfect for a cheesesteak. Um, but I'm just breaking up just a tiny bit more in here, just like that. Look, look at that. Oh my Lord, have mercy. That is so fucking amazing. Fucking delicious. Yo, if y'all can only smell what I smell right now, y'all would be like, this shit is so amazing. Like, I know y'all gonna love this when I make it because, come on, if you've had a cheesesteak before, you know, it, this is really popular anyway. But yeah, now I'm gonna go ahead and just take the spring roll, I'll put a slice of provolone cheese down, um, and just go ahead and add your, your cheesesteak mix in there, and that's what you wanna do. You wanna go ahead and roll it up first, kinda like a burrito. You know, make sure you seal it on all sides so no oil gets in it at all. Just make sure it's nice and tight. It should look kind of like a little bit towards the end. Now, I'm going to seal it all with the egg wash. Egg wash mixture I have here. Just a little bit of, just one egg and a little bit of water. So. Yep, and now I'm going to go ahead and drop that in the fryer. Um, now, if you have a deep fryer, this will work so much easier, but because I just have a pan, it's whatever. I'm just going to use this and drop all my spring rolls in there. And yeah, make, be careful not to overcrowd it. Um, this is perfect. I can fit about four of my pan without an issue. It's important not to let these burn. As you can see, you can physically see how fast these are burning. So don't let these burn. That's okay though. This gonna be this is gonna be fucking delicious. And go ahead and drain these. And there we go. Fucking blue cheese steak spring rolls. Like these can be found at any Chinese store in the fucking city. So I promise you, any, anywhere in fucking Philadelphia, you can find spring rolls. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Two Dope Kitchen. And today we're gonna be making a recipe that is absolutely not for the faint of heart. We're gonna be making an awesomely delicious triple stacker bacon grilled cheese sandwich. Now this freaking recipe is off the wall now i'm not just talking about like michael jackson off the wall i'm talking about like two dope off the wall this is freaking amazing yo so we're gonna start off with a whole lot of bacon um i'm using seven slices now if you want to use uh maybe like four or two or one or something like that then go ahead and kindly click out of this recipe because this is not for you this is a two up recipe and when we you're here we go big or go home you know how we do it here so go ahead and use seven or eight or nine pieces of bacon for this recipe go ahead we're going to go ahead and flip all the bacon over and make sure it doesn't burn but we do want to get that nice crispiness going on with the bacon that we all come to love now you can only imagine the smells that are in this room right now. This bacon is filling up my entire house with the wonderful scent of oink oink. Now go ahead and let the bacon drain. Now you can use like a paper towel and plate setup if you like, but you know I got my wire rack here and I use this for everything. Start off with a tablespoon of Italian seasoning, uh, a fourth teaspoon of cayenne pepper and garlic, and also a tablespoon of Parmesan. Uh, we're gonna blend this up this is for the sandwich believe it or not some people think i'm crazy but yeah this just makes it pop i don't know why i don't know how but it makes it pop and yeah it just makes the sandwich that much more like about that life 
Now we're gonna go ahead and butter some bread. I'm using Texas toast. Now if you only got regular bread, then be my guest and just go ahead and use that. Make sure it's white bread. Don't be, don't skimp out on me and use that wheat stuff. You know what I'm saying? What is wheat bread? We use white bread here, potato bread here, all the fattening things, cause this is what this recipe is all about. And just go ahead and you know, when I butter them, I put them down on all the sides. Now I'm buttering the opposite sides that I'm going to flip. You know, I don't put the butter in the pan first. Some people do, but I really don't like doing that. Now we're gonna go ahead and sprinkle our little spice blend on top of each piece of toast, just like that. Now we're gonna add two slices of Kobe Jack to every piece of bread. Well, only two of them actually, I'm sorry. Then we're gonna do uh, two slices. Now you can use sharp cheddar. It might be banging with some sharp cheddar. I'm not even gonna lie to you, even though y'all know how I feel about it. Wait, we gotta add the bacon. Now we're gonna add all of our bacon to all of the, uh, the bread, you know? That's how we do it. I like to crisscross it on there, make it look nice and purty before I eat it. Go ahead and put your middle piece in there. You know, McDonald's should buy this recipe off of me because honestly, this is better than a Big Mac. I'm not even gonna lie to you. The Big Mac is so dry, it ain't got no meat in it or nothing. This is this is awesome. Like, this is the best bacon and cheese sandwich you will ever have in your whole life. I promise. Over first so it doesn't burn on that side. We're gonna do like a little tiny grill method. I like to take some water and just spray it around the edges. Don't spray it on the bread and then cover it. That steam will help the cheese melt because it's such a big sandwich, it's kind of hard for it to melt on its own. Next thing you know, you can go ahead and take it off and put it on your plate and give it a cut and there we go. We got a bacon and cheese grilled cheese. That's so stupid, a bacon and cheese grilled cheese. I'm, I'm really dumb, I'm, I'm a dumbass. But yo, y'all gonna really love this. So if y'all enjoyed it, please drop a like and share. Until next time, peace. Folks, so we're gonna start off this recipe by rinsing the shit out of our potatoes because these things, like anything else that grows directly in the ground, are in dirt and shit, and you don't want that in this recipe, unless that's your style. But go ahead and dry these off. Um, we want to dry them completely because we want the skin to be crispy. Now we're gonna go ahead and poke the shit out of these uh, potatoes. Reason for that is because they cook a little bit faster in the oven when you do that. All right, now go ahead and throw some oil on there. Any type of oil is fine. I'm using vegetable oil. And go ahead and season it with just a little bit of salt and pepper. Mix these up, make sure they're completely coated inside, you know, every little angle completely coated with the salt and pepper. Now line these up on a baking sheet. Uh, if you have a rack, that'll be perfect because they'll cook evenly and a little bit faster. Um, but if you don't, you know, just put it on a normal baking sheet or you can even put it on aluminum foil. Now go ahead and put this in the oven. Uh, at 400 degrees for 50 minutes and afterwards they should come out pretty crispy and they should be pretty much about 85% done. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and work on our chicken. We're gonna go ahead and season this up with some salt and pepper. Um, and we're gonna also go ahead and throw some uh, garlic powder on there and also a little bit of onion powder. Now, I'm not giving you exact measurements because you can make this to your discretion. Now go ahead and just you know finish off the marinade with uh, some vegetable oil and give that a nice mix. I am using boneless, skinless chicken thighs. Now if you wanna use chicken breast again for this recipe, you are more than welcome to do so. All right, now go ahead and season it off with our, with our hot shit. We're gonna use some chili powder. We're also gonna use some cayenne pepper. All right, now mix this up. You know, it's gonna it's gonna be uh, smelling pretty nice. You know, it, it's gonna smell as nice as raw chicken with seasoning on it, but it's, it smells good. All right, now go ahead and toss this in a slow cooker or a pressure cooker. I am using a pressure cooker because I want this done in 20 minutes. If you have you know multiple hours on your hand, then go ahead and throw it in a slow cooker. Now for a slow cooker, you're gonna have to cook it for about two hours in order to get the same results. For a pressure cooker, it only takes about 20 minutes. So go ahead and pour your heart out with this hot sauce. I'm using down there the whole bottle. Now, you know, whatever brand is your favorite hot sauce, go ahead and use it. Um, and also I'm going ahead and just add a little bit of Chipotle um, sauce in there because I want it to be almost a smoky flavor going on. And, you know, I'm just going to kind of, you know, cook that up a little bit, add a little bit of water, then I'm gonna go ahead and close it. 
Um, now, you know, same, same deal. If you have a slow cooker, go ahead and, you know, but you just want to remember cook it for two hours versus 20 minutes. All right. Now we're going to work on our potatoes. Go ahead and cut them in half. Um, it's a pretty tedious thing to do, but you want to be careful not to destroy your potatoes and just go ahead and scoop out the insides. Now you can save the insides and make like a little small thing of mashed potatoes or something, or even make like, you know, I don't know, make something if you don't want to waste the insides. Cause that's what I did. I saved them to make some mashed potatoes and just go ahead. Now we're going to get back to our chicken and just go ahead and mash them. Now it's kind of pretty much pulled chicken. It's a hundred percent done after 20 minutes in the pressure cooker and definitely done after two hours in the slow cooker. You pretty much want to cook them until the chicken pretty much just falls apart, but not mushy. Now go ahead and add all that chicken to the bowl. Now this is when you need to completely make sure it's kind of broken up. It doesn't have to be perfectly stringy for every bite, but you just want to make sure most of, most of it's pulled. Go ahead and give that a taste. See if there's anything else you can do. Now we're going to work on our bacon. Now, you know, this, this is self-explanatory. Just go ahead and cut up some bacon, throw it in the pan. It's pretty simple. Everyone has cooked bacon from time to time. have done it at some point in their lives. Just want to cook it so pretty much it's brown. Yep. Be careful not to burn your bacon too, guys. All right, now this is when I changed the game for real. Now, instead of using butter, I'm using the bacon fat in place of the butter. You know, instead of like a traditional butter that's in a uh, buffalo sauce, I'm using bacon fat. It's amazing. Now we're gonna go ahead and fry our potato skins. Um, we're frying them because we want them to get even more crispy and you want them to be able to hold and stand up to the wet buffalo chicken. Um, that's why I, that's why I like to fry these a little bit harder than, you know, normal potato skins. All right, they should be nice and golden brown by the time you pull them out. Be careful to drain all the excess grease out. There we go now, you know, I'm letting those drain. Um, upside down of course and now we're just gonna go ahead and fill them up fill them up with all your buffalo chicken um, your buffalo chicken is going to be wet so that's the reason why I deep fry them but it's amazing like these are it's so rich like this shit is fucking amazing fucking amazing now go ahead and just top it with some sharp cheddar cheese and we're gonna go ahead and pretty much just be putting these in the oven um, so after we top it with the bacon, you know, just go ahead and put it in the oven that's heated to around 350 degrees. And there we go. Just like that. Um, these shits smell amazing. They look amazing. I can't wait to just completely devour them. Look, guys, I know you guys will love this shit. Like, and then after pretty much you... Put them on a plate or whatever you're gonna do them in. These are perfect for game day as well, guys. Go ahead and just dollop them with some uh, some ranch. You don't have to even be fancy with these. Normally, I would do some fancy shit. Don't even worry about that. Just dollop it on top. You can even do use the ranch as a dip, you know, because that's what I would have done probably too. Just use it as a dip. But yo, I know y'all gonna fucking enjoy these. What's good, family? We're gonna go ahead and start this recipe off with some peeled and thawed medium-sized shrimp. Go ahead and season this up with a little bit of salt and pepper. Um, I like to use, uh, I like to crack some black pepper myself, but if you just got regular ground black pepper, didn't do it. Um, also, we're gonna go ahead and season it with some cayenne pepper, and last but not least, we're gonna go ahead and use some garlic and herb Old Bay seasoning. Now, listen, don't skimp out on this garlic and herb Old Bay seasoning. This stuff is really fucking amazing, and I think y'all would love it. All right, so go ahead and mix this up with your hands. Um, don't be afraid to really get in there. You know, we're not going to over season these because, you know, I want a lot of other things to shine through with this recipe. So we're just going to season these just enough. All right. Now we're going to go ahead and just crack an egg in there. Now you could like put it in a separate bowl, but why do that? I'm just going to go ahead and crack it over the top because we're going to just go ahead and start this battering process off with the egg. You know, don't be afraid to really get in there and to make sure each and every piece of shrimp is coated. All right, now go ahead and take some of your pre-made cheddar biscuit mix. Also, go ahead and throw some of that powder in there and a little bit of cheddar cheese. Um, now, for this, you wanna kinda make sure that you can, if you can get finer 
shreds of cheddar, cheddar cheese, it might work a little bit better. All right, now go ahead and just pretty much throw your shrimp in there. This is very self-explanatory. We are trying to get this to be the best that we can absolutely get it to be. And you wanna make sure as you're mixing it up that you are taking your cheddar cheese and kind of almost forming it to the shrimp. So um, don't be afraid to just really get in there with this recipe. For this recipe, you really wanna make sure you just get in there. Like, don't, don't be light-handed with this. So after you do that, it should look pretty much like this. Now, I have my oil heated. So medium high. So as soon as you drop your shrimp in there, it should pretty much just start popping, start cooking. immediately now you want to be careful not to let this burn um so you want to just kind of keep it moving in the in the oil this is vegetable oil by the way but you can use canola oil or even corn oil if you like all right so after they become pretty much golden brown you just want to go ahead and take them out and drain them drain them with some type of uh paper towel bowl setup you know, really, Checkers has nothing on these. These are so much fucking better than theirs. And then you're gonna pretty much top this off with some more of that garlic herb oil base seasoning. Let's go ahead and give that a nice little mix. You know, finishing off with some nice little spices. Now we're gonna go ahead and top it off with some, uh, some parsley. And there we go, just go ahead and try it. What's up everybody and welcome back to Tudor Kitchen. Today we're going to be making some crab fried rice. So for this recipe we're going to start off with either some lump crab meat or either some claw meat. And go ahead and season it up with some salt and a little bit of black pepper. Um, also I like to use some Cajun seasoning. Um, you can even use some cayenne pepper if you have some. Um, also we're going to use some Old Bay um, or any sort of seafood season really. Um, also, we're going to use some crushed red chili flakes. And lastly, we're going to use some fresh minced garlic. start off our wok and get it nice and hot. You can use any sort of pan, um, but woks just make fried rice so much easier. Um, I'm using vegetable oil and I'm just going ahead and start off some diced onions. I'm also using some bell peppers. You don't have to use red and yellow. Um, you can use any sort of bell peppers you have, but I just happen to have some red, red and yellow on the end. All right, go ahead and season that up with some salt and pepper. to add our crab meat in there. This is why I like to use a wok because it's usually just big enough to hold everything. fried rice but I just personally like egg in mine. All right, set that aside. We're going to start our uh, sauce for our fried rice. We're going to use a tablespoon of soy sauce, a uh, little bit of oyster sauce, a uh, tablespoon of hoisin sauce. Just like to mix that up a little bit. Alrighty, we're gonna add that in. 
in the middle the same way we did with like our, like our eggs. stage if you like you could add some more soy sauce but I'm just gonna add some green onions and that's pretty much it What's up everybody and welcome back to the kitchen today we're gonna be doing one of my favorite schoolhouse recipes we're doing sloppy joes now this is a completely vegan friendly edition and i know that everyone is going to enjoy it so let's begin all right so let's start off by small to medium dice and a half a red onion if you don't have a red onion go ahead and use a white or yellow onion i just so happen Now we're gonna do the same thing for our bell pepper. Again, if you don't have multiple peppers, that's fine. I just so happen to have a bunch of different peppers. So I wanted to make a whole rainbow pepper thing going on. And you guys see why I love tricolor peppers? How pretty is that? Okay, so in a pan, a pot, or a skillet, we're gonna go ahead and add a tablespoon and a half of vegetable oil or olive oil and add our peppers and onions in there to make sure they get nice and sauteed. Um, we wanna go ahead and sweat those out before we go ahead and add our seasonings in. Go ahead and season it with a teaspoon of salt, a teaspoon of black pepper, as well as a teaspoon of garlic powder and onion powder, also a tablespoon of cayenne pepper also a tablespoon of chili powder. Now mix that all up and be sure not to let anything burn because it will taste like burnt in your recipe if you're not careful. So I'll go ahead and add two cups of vegetable stock. Um, while our vegetable stock is boiling, I just like to rin rinse off my lentils. You can use red, yellow, green, blue, whatever you like. I'm just so happy to be using yellow lentils. Now go ahead and mix those in. I'm gonna go ahead and cover those up for about 15 to 20 minutes, being sure to stir every 10 minutes. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and add a tablespoon of freshly minced garlic and then mix that up. Now, I've taken the liberty of making my own vegan uh, Worcestershire sauce. I'm only need a tablespoon of that. I'll go ahead and put that in my description, as well as a tablespoon of tomato paste. Mix that up really nice. Um, that's gonna really help develop this recipe as a tomato paste and that, uh, that Worcestershire sauce. Um, so please don't skip that recipe, guys. Um, we're gonna also add a tablespoon of brown sugar or coconut sugar. Um, I still happen to have some coconut sugar, so whatever you got, use it please, guys. All right, I'm also adding a half a cup of chili. Chili paste or chili sauce. Let's go ahead and cover that up for another 15 minutes or so. Um, I wanna make sure my lentils are nice and soft. So when they come out, oh man, look at this. It's almost like a vegan ground beef. This is delicious. And the smell is phenomenal. Boom, there we go. You can make a sloppy joe, you can make chili, you can make pretty much anything, but this is a vegan sloppy joe, guys. And I hope you guys enjoy. Um, it's a great game day uh, recipe. It's a great anything, guys. Enjoy.
What's up everybody and welcome back to Tudo Kitchen. Today we're going to be making rolled chicken tacos using ground chicken. We're going to start off this recipe by seasoning one pound of ground chicken with your favorite taco seasoning blend. It doesn't matter if it's a store-bought blend or it doesn't matter if it's homemade. I'm personally making mine from scratch only because I don't have any of the packets of taco seasoning, but if you have the packets, feel free to use it. All right, now we're gonna add some diced onions. I used about a half an onion, but that's because I had an insanely big onion. If you have a small onion, use the entire thing. Also, we're gonna go ahead and add some minced garlic. With a spoon or a spatula, go ahead and mix this up really nice. Uh, make sure that there's not really too many exposed parts uh, especially when it comes to onions you want everything to cook nice and evenly all right let's move this over to the skillet in our cast iron skillet we're gonna go ahead and get our vegetable oil nice and hot um, I like to throw my ground chicken in there uh, and spread it out pretty immediately so it doesn't start to burn Make sure you cook this all the way through, especially because you're using ground chicken. Um, for any ground meat in general, but especially because you're using ground chicken. Uh, make sure you cook it entirely, the entire way through. All right, after that's completely cooked, we're gonna go ahead and add our refried beans. Um, I'm using about a half a can. I like to add the refried beans when it's a little bit warm. Uh, when the, the chicken is still pretty warm because it kind of makes the refried brains uh, soften up a bit so it's easier to mix. Okay, now I'm adding some shredded cheese. I just had some taco cheese in the uh, refrigerator. If you have any of sort of cheese, especially pepper jack, go ahead and use it. Um, but just go ahead and mix that up too. Make sure that's completely incorporated. Okay, now this is completely optional, but I decided to zest a little bit of a lemon. I mean, a little bit of a lime in this mixture. Now, if you wanted to use a lemon, you could. Um, I just happen to have some limes in the refrigerator. Make sure you're tasting your food too as you go. Okay, so when it comes to store-bought tor corn tortillas, I tend to put them in the microwave just to make them more pliable. Um, I don't want them to rip, especially because I'm rolling them. Uh, so just make sure you check for any pre-existing rips or holes that might be in them, uh, especially when you microwave them. I like to spoon just enough of my mixture just to pretty much fill the middle. Um, and I kind of spread it out to about a quarter of the way to the edge. Uh, you don't have, you can kind of do this step however you like. Um, this is just how I found it easier to do. I tend to do this for anything I kind of have to roll, whether it's a burrito or a wrap or even a rolled taco. And make sure when you're rolling, you're rolling tight, but not so tight that it immediately starts to rip. I made that mistake pretty early on, and as you can see, the rips are pretty prevalent, but it's not bad enough that I want to throw this entire tortilla away. Just make sure for the another ones, and as long as it's not huge rips, you should be okay. Okay, in a pan or some sort of sauce pot, we're gonna shallow fry these. Um, now, I like to shallow fry them basically with the seam side down. Uh, I don't really want that, uh, I want it to kind of close on itself. It's what I do in order to prevent myself from having to use any sort of uh, toothpick or anything of that nature. Uh, just basically just using the, the taco's weight to fry itself. Go ahead and roll this over get it nice and golden brown before you pull it out guys look at that yeah and after you guys are finished you can dip it in literally anything sour cream or sauce i just happen to have some queso in the fridge so you get go ahead and use that guys well, 
What's up everybody and welcome back to the kitchen. So what I have here is some diced chicken breast and also some ground chorizo sausage. Um, I also have some diced red onions here and also some green and yellow bell peppers. You can use any color bell pepper you like. Um, also I have some minced garlic. I've also taken some time to turn my chipotle peppers into a paste, but I just did that by just mincing the chipotle, canned chipotle. Um, I'm going to go ahead and season my chicken and my sausage with just some packaged uh, taco seasoning. You can, you, you can make your own, but I just used some that I had in hand. Go ahead and mix it up nicely. Alright, next in some sort of wok or some sort of cast iron or some sort of pan, we're just going to go ahead and start our meat. Um, we don't have to add a whole lot of uh, vegetable oil in there because our chorizo sausage will make a lot of its own oil. Start mixing this up. Uh, you want to make sure that everything's completely cooked. It's a little. It's going to be a little bit harder to tell once everything starts turning red because of the chorizo, but just kind of keep, you know, kind of spread it out and keep it going. And I've diced it small, so it does cook relatively quick. It'll be all right. All right, let's just get some color. I just let this sit there for a moment, and then boom, as you see, it's pretty much starting to look like, almost like a ground beef chicken mixture, but it's chorizo chicken mixture. If you wanted to do this with ground beef, you absolutely could. All right, let's go ahead and add some more uh, vegetable oil in there now, and we're gonna just mix our red onions in there. Kind of the same that we do with a lot of like heat glazing methods. Uh, just get all that flavor from the chorizo sausage mixed with the onions. And we're gonna also add our bell peppers in there. Mix that up nicely. All right, go ahead and season that with a little bit of salt. Doesn't have to, you don't even have to add any black pepper. Just, you know, give it some just flavor. All right, we're gonna add our minced garlic in there. go ahead and add half of my chipotle paste um, just just to see how everything goes you can add it um, all at one time but I just kind of like to add it uh, half at a time uh, after it's all incorporated I add the other half all right add your corn and beans in there now and this smells amazing guys and we're gonna go ahead and add all our meat back into it Now I have some yellow rice. Um, you can use white rice if you like, but I prefer yellow rice for this recipe. It's kind of like a fried rice or something. I don't really even know what to call this, but I just call this like a Spanish style rice, you know. Uh, delicious, delicious stuff. Mix that up nicely. As you can see, it's a beautiful color. I'm gonna go ahead and add some cilantro in there for flavor, also for aromatics, and also just just for taste, you know? If you don't like cilantro, you don't have to add it. You can go ahead and add some parsley instead. All right, and go ahead and plate this up and boom. Um, now you can eat it just like this, but I like to garnish it with just a little bit of sour cream and hot sauce. Um, I'm using like a bit of a taco sauce. Um, if you wanna add some cheese in here too, you could. Um, you know, finish it with a little bit more cilantro and boom, we're done. Hope you enjoy, guys. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Tuto Kitchen. Today, we're gonna to be making some other pork chops. So we're gonna start off this recipe by seasoning our pork chops with a little bit of salt and black pepper. Don't be afraid to season these nice and generously. Okay, once you've seasoned them up with salt and pepper, we're gonna go ahead and move on to a, just a little bit of garlic powder. Again, make sure you coat all the sides, guys. Even though we're gonna be rubbing this in, you still wanna make sure you get a nice amount of seasoning on your pork chops. Next, we're gonna move on to some onion powder. Now 
You could use granulated garlic and or onion if you would like. All right, next we're gonna go ahead and move on to some thyme. I'm using dried thyme. If you have some fresh thyme, use that. And I'm gonna also finish it off with a little bit of cayenne pepper. All right, I like to just go ahead and put a little bit of oil uh, just to be able to help the, the seasonings bind well to the pork. Rub that in nice. Like, like you're giving a pork chop a nice massage, you know? All right, let's turn over our pork chops and we're gonna start over uh, pretty much with the same seasoning blend and do that all over again, guys. Now we're gonna go ahead and start our uh, dredging mix. Um, I'm only using flour. Um, if you'd like to use something else, you could, but I just prefer to use flour for these processes. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and season this up with a little bit of seasoning salt, um, as well as a little bit of garlic powder. Now we're gonna go ahead and pretty much do what we do with everything we're about to fry. Let's go ahead and get it nice and coated on both sides. Um, don't skip out on seasoning your flour, guys, because you'll notice if you don't season your flour, I promise. Okay, once they're all seasoned up, they are ready to be moved to the cast iron so we can pretty much fry them up. Take off the excess. Now, in a cast iron pan, I had some vegetable oil, pretty much getting it nice and warm. Um, you don't want it too hot because you don't want it to burn. Um, also, we're kind of shallow frying this, so not a whole lot of oil either. Again, guys, uh, if you want the full recipe, uh, it'll be in the description. Um, you pretty much want your your pork chops to pretty much get a little golden um, on the top. See, you see what happens when you let your oil get a little too hot. Mine's didn't necessarily burn, but it did get a little bit more golden than I would have liked it to be. But we can still save this because now we're just going to have a darker gravy, which is perfectly fine. All right, now let's go ahead and remove this from the oil, and so we can start working on our peppers and onions. Now, I could do this in the same pan, but I honestly like to start off with a new pan when I'm doing my peppers and onions, just so they can do, develop their own flavors themselves first. Um, so yeah, just go ahead and dice up or chop up or however you like uh, some peppers and onions. I'm just using some red onions and some green peppers I had on hand. If you want to use any assortment of onions and peppers, that is perfectly fine. Now I'm going to go ahead and add pretty much two tablespoons, two to three tablespoons of uh, butter. Um, I'm using salted butter. Uh, you could use unsalted, but I do prefer to use butter, uh, salted butter for making some sort of gravy or rooms or anything. Okay, now we're gonna go ahead and add pretty much two to three tablespoons of flour as well. Um, we want this to get nice and incorporated. Uh, I like to let this go for a little bit because I want my gravy to get a little bit darker. Um, so I do let this go for a minute instead of such a, uh, such a light gravy. Yeah, let that, uh, let that cook for a little bit in a pan and you want to go ahead and season it out with just a little bit of salt. You can add black pepper too if you'd like, but I just, you know, I, I've added both of course, but if you just want to add salt, that's really the main ingredient you need to add for seasoning up your peppers and onions. Also, I'm adding just a little bit of garlic powder in there. Um, some onion powder and also I'm going to go ahead and add some uh, more dry thyme I'm gonna also add some cayenne pepper in there now I'm just pretty much seasoning this roux up in intensely because I didn't use uh, any of the leftover flour uh, from the pork chop so we're pretty much making our own flavored roux again not a big deal Now I'm gonna go ahead and add about a cup and a half of chicken stock. Um, you could use beef stock, but I do prefer to use chicken stock when I'm making gravy for pork chops. 
All right, now I'm just gonna go ahead and put uh, my pork chops back in the pan. Um, as you can see, the gravy's already starting to thicken up. Uh, but pretty much after you put those in there, you can go ahead and let them get nice and soft, you know, coat them a little bit. Um, or coat them a lot of it because this is a smothered pork chop recipe. <laughs> but yeah, we can just go ahead and pretty much cover them entirely. And we're gonna go ahead and put our top back on um, after it's covered. We want the steam to start kind of cooking it itself. All right. And after about 15, 20 minutes of just kind of stewing in its own gravy, you'll pretty much have some amazingly flavorful and nice and tender juicy pork chops. Um, they're actually so tender, I can kind of cut them with a fork, um, as you can see here. But yeah, y'all, hope you guys enjoy. What's up everybody and welcome back to Tudo Kitchen. Today we're going to be making pan sear chicken thighs with a side of green collard greens and mushrooms. Now as you can see I'm chopping up some fresh herbs here. I'm using some thyme, a little bit of rosemary and also some fresh parsley. I'm going to go ahead and add about a tablespoon of some minced garlic. Also just sprinkle in some crushed red pepper flakes and also about a quarter cup of vegetable oil. You can also use olive oil instead of vegetable oil if you want, um, perfectly fine. Now I completely forgot to record the scene where I put all my seasonings in so I'll just go ahead and list them on the side here. Alright, here I got four chicken thighs. I'm going to go ahead and take that same spice blend that I made. Now it's basically a poultry seasoning that I made specifically for like anytime I pan or any type of poultry so um, I'll put that on the side there. Nothing too crazy. Now you want to generously season, season the top and the back. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take some of my uh, garlic herb mixture and put that on top. Now I really just like to put that on top before I put that in the pan. Um, and that's only because, I don't know, I, I don't know why I do it, I just do it that way. Um, now I'm going to go ahead and get some vegetable oil nice and hot in a, a cast iron skillet. And I'm going to add our four chicken thighs in there, skin side down first. Um, this is an electric stove problem where you got to kind of move it around a lot. but. Be sure to just rotate your chicken thighs. As you can see, some of the herb seasoning did come off the top, but that's okay because the bottom will catch it. I promise. Look at that. See? All right, now I just want to go ahead and really brown both sides and that's really it. Now we're gonna go ahead and add our diced onions in there. Um, I'm using about another quarter cup, quarter, quarter to a half cup of diced onions. Go ahead and get those nice caramelized. Now we're gonna go ahead and add our chopped collard greens in there. Now you can chop them a little bit smaller than this if you'd like, but I just pretty much did a rough julienne. All right, now I have some sliced portobello mushrooms here. I'm just gonna go ahead and dump those on top. Now I'm gonna use that same spice blend I used for the chicken and just put that right on the mushrooms. A-okay. Now you can see they're starting to cook down a bit and our collard greens are starting to cook down. Now I'm gonna go ahead and add a cup of chicken stock, also a cup of white wine, and I'm gonna let that go ahead and simmer until the white wine starts to basically cook the alcohol out. Now I'm gonna go ahead and add about a cup of heavy cream. All right, and I'm also gonna add about a half cup to a cup of Parmesan cheese. Um, at that stage, you can also add a little bit of shredded mozzarella if you like, but um, I'm just gonna add my Parmesan cheese. All right, I'm gonna let that boil and simmer. And now we're gonna add our chicken thighs back into the pan. I guess you can say this is a one pan recipe because it kinda is. 
Now let's go ahead and take this and put it in the oven for about 30 minutes at 375 degrees and this is what you'll get. Man, make sure you get some of that extra collard greens and mushrooms. Now you can plate this over some pasta, you can eat it by itself, however you like to do it. Whatever your style is, that's how I'm going to do it over some bow tie pasta. Hope you guys enjoy it. What's up everybody and welcome back to Tudor Kitchen. Today we're going to be doing one of my favorite takeout dishes. We're going to be doing shrimp and broccoli. Now this is a crazy easy recipe to make so let's just get to it. We're going to start off with just the broccoli head. Nothing crazy. Um, I didn't get too too big with this. I'm just making it for myself really. So um, you can use, use some fresh broccoli. If you want to use some frozen broccoli that's okay too. Um, but Please, if you can, just try to use some fresh broccoli. Now, I just like to break it all up and cut them from the stem and just break it up into smaller pieces. Um, nothing too crazy. You don't really don't have to think too hard about that. Okay, so we're gonna season our shrimp really simply with some salt, some black pepper, um, also some garlic powder, and I just like to throw in a little Cajun seasoning for a little bit of spice, you know, a little kick in there. I'm also using jumbo shrimp here, so whatever size shrimp you want to use, but I like to use jumbo for when I do like my fried rice and stuff. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and just basically um, blanch our uh, broccoli. I don't really want to cook them too heavily because I'm gonna be cooking them also in our sauce a bit. So um, just enough to just get them some color on it. Also get them a little bit tender, but not too crazy. You don't want them to be soft at all. After we take our broccoli out, we're going to melt our some butter so we can add our shrimp. Um, we're going to also add some minced garlic in there. The smell that's coming from this pan is ridiculous. Um, well, we just want to make sure we cook our shrimp thoroughly, but we don't want to overcook it. All right, now we're going to add a quarter cup of beef broth. I'm also adding two tablespoons of soy sauce, a tablespoon of hoisin sauce, a tablespoon of oyster sauce and we're just gonna mix this up the sauce is coming together already um, we're gonna also add a tablespoon of brown sugar to really help tie it together mm, 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 mm. now we're gonna go ahead and just sprinkle some chili flakes on there this is better than takeout like why pay for that when you can just really make it at home um, here we got some uh, green onions again and we're just gonna go ahead and put some uh, our broccoli back in there Mix it up and there you go guys, we got shrimp and broccoli. I really hope you guys enjoyed this and maybe make this tonight if you guys got the ingredients. It's really good. Um, but until next time y'all, peace. What's up everybody and welcome back to Tudor Kitchen. Today we're going to be doing another trending recipe. We're going to be doing a rat hat. I'm doing a cheesesteak edition, so let's begin. All right, so we're gonna take some freshly sliced beef that's super thin and season it up with some salt, black pepper, a little bit of garlic powder, and lastly, a little bit of onion powder. Now we're gonna go ahead and mix that up. Make sure you get it completely incorporated in there. And we're gonna move this over to our cast iron pan where we're gonna get some oil nice and hot. Let's go ahead and add our thinly sliced beef in there. Um, now it's a little bit hard to cook in this method, so you kind of have to use a cheesesteak spot method, which is a double spatula method. It works just like this. It helps to separate, but also sear the beef at the same time. All right, let's go ahead and move that to a bowl, because now we're gonna saute or fry our onions. No raw onions on a cheesesteak, guys. Like, y'all should know better, no raw onions. Only fried, not caramelized, but fried. All right, now we're gonna cut our tortilla straight down the middle about halfway, create this little Pac-Man looking thing. Now we're gonna take a little bit of mayonnaise and paint that over the top. Now I'm gonna add a handful of my cheese steak. Don't worry if it's a lot because cheese steaks are sloppy. Now we're gonna go ahead and add our fried onions, a little bit of sweet peppers because I don't like to use raw bell peppers. Nobody in Philly does that. If they do, they're lying to you. Now we're gonna also use some provolone cheese. You can also use some American cheese if you like. Now let's just go ahead and quarter this off. Let's 
try to move this over to a George Foreman grill or even a grill or if you don't have one of those just use a pan it's perfectly fine let's grill it and boom this is actually kind of cool it's like a cheesesteak quesadilla or something it's pretty dope hope you guys enjoy this is really good um, and this is pretty much as authentic of a cheesesteak quesadilla as you're gonna get enjoy guys What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Tudor Kitchen. Today, we're going to be doing yet another air fryer recipe. We're going to be doing Philly cheesesteak spring rolls. So, let's just get to it. Let's start off by seasoning some thinly sliced ribeye with some salt and black pepper, as well as some garlic powder, also some onion powder. Be sure to mix this up really nicely. I like to use my hands at this stage. It just helps break up things a bit. Let's move over to our cast iron pan. We're going to get some vegetable oil nice and hot. Um, I want to go ahead and add our ribeye in there, but I like to lay it down as flat as I can. Alright, I already showed you guys this method for breaking up the cheesesteak meat, but this is pretty much the go-to method for breaking up cheesesteak meat, whether that's beef or chicken or any other cheesesteak meats. Alright, let's go ahead and add our uh, diced onions in there. Um, I like to add that in pretty much halfway while it's done. We're gonna also add in some sweet peppers. You can also add in some hot peppers at this stage if you wanted to, but I'm just using sweets. All right, again, we're using this method to break up everything. As you can see, my sweet peppers are getting nice and broken up using this way. Look at that. All right, let's move over to our spring rolls. We're gonna go ahead and brush the edges with some egg yolks. I'm only using a half a slice of provolone just cause I don't really want a full slice, but go ahead and use the full slice if you want. Um, and lay out as much meat as you want or as little. Um, I like mine's a little bit on, a little bit going towards the egg roll size, but you know, if you want it a little bit skinnier, add less meat. Um, but however you want to do it is fine. You just want to make sure that your meat doesn't come out. So you want to make sure you really tuck and roll really tightly. And as you can see, that egg yolk helps seal it to itself. Boom. All right, now whatever kind of air fryer you got, you just wanna go ahead and grease it up a bit. Um, I'm doing this on my rack. Um, just line them up, how, whatever kind of air fryer you got. I like to also spray, spray the tops, just, you know, just to help it crisp up a bit. All right, I'm gonna adjust my settings to 425, turn into convection, get it going. Um, we're only gonna bake these for about 15 minutes and then we're gonna go ahead and rotate. We're pretty much going to be rotating every 10 to 15 minutes um, or at least until they get golden brown. And afterwards, this is what you're going to get. This is beautiful. I really love these in the air fryer. Um, it's a little bit healthier than doing it like deep frying. But there we go, guys. Hope you guys enjoyed this recipe. It's one of my favorite bar foods, um, but enjoy.
Come kiss you, boy. I'm hungry. Welcome back to Two Dope Kitchen. Today, we're gonna to be making some bourbon teriyaki salmon. So I'm gonna start off this recipe with some vegetable oil, a little bit of salt. We're gonna use some coarse black pepper. Now, I would only suggest using coarse black pepper or a pepper that you grind directly onto the salmon. Do not use any sort of fine uh, black pepper. We're gonna also add some Cajun seasoning. It doesn't matter what brand of Cajun seasoning you use. Um, I just happen to make my own. We're gonna do the same exact thing on the other side. Um, just add some vegetable oil. Um, and also we're gonna make sure we season it up. take this to the pan now in a non-stick pan um, we're gonna get some a vegetable oil pretty hot before we add in our salmon we don't want to add in our salmon to a cold pan skin side down of course now, as you can see it will start to sizzle and cook immediately all right I'm using a non-stick pan so I don't really have too many issues with my skin sticking but I do like to make sure that like a nice amount of the oil does get under. Um, now at this stage, you wanna add some butter and also you wanna add some garlic if you don't have any garlic herb butter or any sort of infused butters. Um, but I just happen to have some garlic herb butter so I didn't really have to, I didn't really want to put any fresh garlic in because I had some already infused in my butter. So we're gonna start our teriyaki sauce. We're starting a saucepan with a little bit of oil, a little bit of fresh garlic. We're gonna also use some fresh ginger. You can use garlic paste or ginger paste if you have that as well. Next, I'm gonna add some scallions. Now I'm gonna go ahead and add my brown sugar. Also some soy sauce. Go ahead and mix that all up. You can see the glaze forming already to be honest. Now we're gonna add some oyster sauce. And we're gonna also add some hoisin sauce. Now we're gonna add lastly our crushed red pepper. And really, our glaze is already there, but we have one more ingredient to add. The bourbon. Now you can use any sort of bourbon you'd like. Uh, I just am just using some Jim Beam. But if you're gonna just be cooking with this and you don't plan on drinking it, definitely just get some cheap bourbon. Not a big deal. All right, now our glaze is finished. Garnish it up with some sesame seeds or something, some parsley, whatever, whatever you like. All right, guys. All right.
right, so we're going to jump right into this one. I'm seasoning two fresh salmon fillets with a little bit of salt and pepper. That's all you need for this because these are fresh and the flavor of these are amazing. All right, so I'm going to flip these over. Now, if you want to keep the skin on, then you're more than welcome to. I like to keep it on just because I like to eat the skin. That's some weird shit, but I really love eating the skin. It is delicious. Um, next, we're going to work on our crust. Um, I have some crushed almonds right here. Um, you can buy some fresh ones and like put them in the blender. Also have some seasoned Italian breadcrumbs. I have some butter so I can bind it all together. I have a tablespoon of thyme. Also a fourth teaspoon of uh, fresh garlic. And go ahead and mix all of that up. Now to make, to cut through the richness and the fattiness, I'm using some lemon zest. It really makes everything pop. I mean lime zest, I'm so dumb. You can use lemon zest too, actually, if you want. But I like, I'm using lime zest because that's what I had at the time. This shit is amazing. Like I'm not joking with you whatsoever. Next, we're gonna go ahead and prepare a pan with some extra virgin olive oil. Please use olive oil. Don't use, don't use uh, vegetable oil this time, y'all. Yeah. I know I tell you I vegetable oil all the time, but please use olive oil. It just tastes much better and it just fits everything perfectly. Go ahead and get that nice and hot. Then we're going to put our fish in there. It has to be extremely hot. I'm telling you this. It's to the point it's almost starts smoking. Not smoking bad, but smoking. Um, you want to get a nice little beautiful sear on that fish. And this is the problem you're going to deal with when you keep the skin on. Um, especially if you have a non-stick pan like me. Uh, the skin will start to come off, but for someone who doesn't know, like if you don't know how to fillet a fish or like to remove the skin, this might be the best way because it's just gonna come off. It's gonna peel off easily versus having to cut it and possibly cut the flesh of the, you know, of the salmon and all that stuff. See, I, I like it crisp up, it's so delicious. I'm, I know I'm weird, I really am weird, but it's delicious, like it's amazingly delicious. Oh shoot don't allow your fish to do that like this is fresh salmon it is not cheap do not let your salmon break but yeah go ahead and add your crust to it to the top um now i did turn off the heat even though it seems as though i did it i did turn off the fire um because we're going to put this whole pan in the oven now you can transfer this to like a a uh some type of baking sheet or something but i don't i like to touch the fish as less as possible you know um, but I'm just packing on my crust tightly and I'm going to put it in the oven and when it comes out It'll look nice and golden brown like that and that is delicious now Just go ahead and add some parsley to the top You can add some chopped cilantro or something and there you go almond crusted salmon fillets Welcome back guys today. We're gonna start off with the spice pan. We're gonna use two tablespoons of salt one tablespoon of coarse black pepper two teaspoons of garlic powder, maybe three, two teaspoons of onion powder. Also, we're gonna use a teaspoon of cayenne pepper, a teaspoon of paprika, and a teaspoon of Cajun seasoning. Also, a teaspoon of adobo, and lastly, a teaspoon of lemon pepper. Now go ahead and mix this all up. Um, nice and incorporated. If you have a few clumps, that's okay, I guess. Just try not to have them in there. Try to get those out. Next, we're gonna go ahead and use this on our salmon. Now, this is like a very, very, very developed seasoned salt that is to be used for a number of things, in particular seafood, um, like fish and whatnot. Um, but remember that it is pretty salt heavy. So just keep that in mind. So you could also just use this and then maybe hit it with a little bit of garlic powder or something like that if you wanted to. But honestly, you could just do like I'm doing and just only use that. Now I like to drizzle my skin with just a little bit of oil before I put them in the pan. Um, and now I have my cast iron skillet heating up. It is getting hot, you guys. Now it's not on high, but it's somewhere around like medium high. If you just want that joint hot and you want to be able to add your salmon to the pan and when you add it to the pan skin down uh it should start to immediately start to see you'll hear it it's loud um and when it's ready it will uh, it will flip it will let you know when it's ready 
I promise you. I promise you it will let you know. You can go ahead and test it. You can see, you can feel how crispy the skin is. Next, I'm gonna add a half stick of butter. Let that entire stick of butter start to melt. Um, don't worry, now we're gonna add about four crushed cloves of garlic. Also, I'm using a little bit of shallots here. Next, I'm using some fresh sage some fresh rosemary, some fresh thyme, and a little bit of fresh parsley. <clears throat> parsley. Um, now this is the stage where you kind of treat it like a steak. You know, this is butter basting essentially. So, you know, just really letting those ingredients cook in the butter. And then I'm incorporating those ingredients on top of my salmon. So not only is my skin getting super flavorful, but it's getting even more crispy. So like, y'all, y'all just keep watch. Like, this is the way to do it. Um, look at that. Keep it going. All right, now that's pretty much it. Um, you can take them out of the pan. You don't want to overcook your salmon, so. You know, after you butter base them, they are pretty much done. Because remember, we started off on the skin side, so we pretty much cooked it halfway on the skin side. So yeah, guys, um, that is a nice herb butter salmon. And as you can see, my skin is crispy. You might want to use a knife. But yeah, salmon flakes is delicious. What's up everybody and welcome back to Tudo Kitchen. Today, we're gonna be making lemon pepper salmon with a nice butter sauce. So I have here a small little salmon filet, nothing huge. Um, just one of those like little five, six dollar salmon, uh, individual salmon you can get from the grocery store. Um, just go ahead and cut that in half. Next, I'm just gonna go ahead and season it up with some nice kosher salt. Now I'm gonna go ahead and just put some oil on it. I forgot to put this on first. If you wanna put it on first, go ahead. Do it in a different order, but just add some oil, some salt, some pepper. And don't be afraid to season this nicely, but make sure you season, even, season evenly as well. I'm gonna go ahead and add some garlic powder. This is not a super crazy recipe, y'all. Super simple, super easy to make, and super quick. Now I've made my own herb seasoning. I'll put the recipe for that below. Um, but if you don't have an herb seasoning, just use like potentially like Italian seasoning mixed with garlic powder basically. All right, now go ahead and take a lemon. We're just gonna go ahead and zest it on top. If you don't have a lemon zester, you can attempt to use the smaller side of a cheese grater. It should work basically the same way. Go ahead and rub that in. It's super easy. Like, as you can see, we're pretty much halfway done with our recipe already. Um, only thing we haven't added just yet is our seafood seasoning. So pretty much any sort of old bay. Um, but basically just do the exact same thing to the back side, the skin side. All right, now let's go ahead and put these in the oven uh, at 400 degrees for no more, no more than 15 minutes. All right, now we're gonna add a quarter cup of lemon juice. Um, I'm also gonna add a quarter cup of white wine. Also, I have some shallots and uh, garlic chopped up here. Um, if you don't have any shallots and garlic, uh, at least shallots, make sure you use yellow onion or white onion. Um, now, we're just gonna pretty much let our mixture start to simmer. We're gonna add a half a stick of butter in there now. Um, now this is on low to medium heat, so you just want it to go really, really low and slow. Um, it'll start to form a nice thick butter sauce after it melts and starts to thicken up, as you can see here. Now everything will try to separate, but you just keep it moving and that's it. All you gotta do is keep it low, keep it moving, and it will start to emulsify, which means basically just kind of combine together. Then boom. 
look at this we have a nice butter sauce to go on top uh, so delicious now you could add some extra things in your butter sauce too like maybe a little parmesan if you wanted to um whatever but um i hope you guys enjoy y'all this was a really delicious recipe really quick really easy um yeah y'all kitchen today i'm going to teach you guys how to turn this boring ass box of jiffy cornbread mix into something that could easily rival the best homemade cornbread whenever i'm using something that is mm, i would say like store-bought and i want to alternate it i just usually just look at the ingredient list and kind of go from there but i'm using two boxes of jiffy cornbread mix for this recipe and the particular store i bought them from they were a little bit lumpy so just just get rid of some of the lumps that's okay um the little lumps are going to be there but the big lumps you definitely want to get rid of not a big deal though for the small ones next i like to make a little bit of a divot in the middle um i make that divot so i can easily incorporate my wet ingredients i'm using two eggs for this because i'm using two boxes of jiffy cornbread mix next i replace the heavy cream i mean the, the whole milk with heavy cream so i'm using two thirds two thirds cup of heavy cream instead of the whole milk and also I add two-thirds cup of sweet and condensed milk this stage is not actually optional if you're following this recipe that's the secret ingredient which really makes this go to the next level now I'm using a spatula just to fold the ingredients I don't really like to whisk them or mix them so if you have a spatula please try to use that now I'm using a 10 inch cast iron pan for my vessel but you can use any sort of pan that it'll fit in um, yeah, I'm using two tablespoons of butter. Try to get all of that butter in the pan. It's important, every single drop of it. Next, we're gonna go ahead and just put our batter in this cast iron pan. Again, if you have like a muffin tin or even a nine by 13 pan, uh, that's perfectly fine. Yeah, go ahead and just, you know, even that out. Now I've preheated my oven to 400 degrees. Um, so I'm gonna take my cornbread mix and I'm gonna put it on the bottom rack. Now I'm putting it on the bottom rack starting off because I want it to just to start to get a nice, a little bit golden. Um, I did that for about 12 minutes. So now we're gonna take a half a stick of butter and we're gonna start to brown that in the, in the saucepan. Now I'm using a fourth cup of brown sugar and also a fourth cup of honey. We're gonna turn this into a glaze. This is gonna be a bit of a glaze butter, a butter glaze, honey butter, a brown butter honey glaze. Ah, there we go. I like that. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and just mix that up, and we're gonna. I'm doing this on about medium heat. Now I like to also add a tablespoon of vanilla in there, just for some added flavor. After about 12 minutes, 12 to 15 minutes, you want to go ahead and. Put your cornbread maybe away from the direct heat just so it can start to get nice and done in the middle and as we can see it comes out perfectly clean after about 20 minutes total in the oven um, now if you notice the position of my my little holes with my fork it's perfectly almost perfectly in in line with how i will cut my cornbread as you can see they disappear voila <laughs> Now I'm going to just, I was able to cut it into eight perfectly sized pieces. So yes, keep that in mind. Um, now let's go ahead and take our brown butter glaze and we're just going to pour it over the top. Mm. So amazing. Like I didn't actually realize it would taste this delicious. Really like you couldn't tell that it wasn't homemade to be honest with you. Well, look at that. Go ahead and try to get you a slice and go ahead and test it out because it's just look at that 
it's moist, it's warm, sweet. Now go ahead and get you a bite. Welcome to episode two of What's in Your Kitchen. Today I'm gonna to be using some leftover hot dogs I got. I also have a little bit of bacon left. And I also have just this box of Lonely Eyes cornbread mix that I planned on doing nothing with. Um, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and take these out and I'm just gonna just cut these in half. Um, I don't have any sticks, so I just prefer to just make a uh, bacon corn dog minis, you know? So go ahead and cut the bacon in half because we're going to be wrapping these hot dogs with the bacon. Now you wanna go ahead and wrap it extremely tight, as tight as you can possibly get it. Um, the bacon will, like the fat will kind of stick to itself, so it pretty much should do the work for you. After that, you just wanna go ahead and do the same thing to all the hot dogs. Uh, I did have five hot dogs, so since I cut them in half, I have 10 of them here. Just go ahead and line this up on a uh, sheet pan. I'm using a rack, of course. Y'all know why I'm using a rack. I just, you know, I want the drippings to drip down in the pan and not on my food, you know. But, you know, we all do love bacon fat. And just go ahead and throw those in the oven until the bacon is completely nice and crispy. Next, you're gonna go ahead and work on a corn dog mix. I'm using, again, some Jiffy cornbread mix, just the yellow kind. Um, yeah, and then go ahead and just follow the directions, which requires one egg, a third cup of milk. Now, just go ahead and mix that up. You can use a whisk if you'd like. I'm just using, uh, you know, a hand mixer, just because I don't feel like doing any work today. All right, so this is when my recipe changes a little bit. I've added, an, I added a third cup of water because you want it a little bit thinner than like traditional cornbread mix um, just so it can easily coat it. Um, next I'm going to go ahead and add a fourth teaspoon of baking soda and a third cup of um, what the hell is that flour yes all-purpose flour um, I hit a brain fart like a motherfucker there all right so now that the bacon is done you know the hot dogs are already done but yeah that's how it's going to look now just go ahead and pretty much just dip everything in the batter it's very 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 self-explanatory now my oil was heated to like 375 so yeah i'm using a little like y'all see i'm using a little like skillet shit thing here so yeah y'all go ahead and y'all can just put it pretty much heat this up on a stove but I'm just using a skillet just cause this is all I'm frying today. I don't need to use too much oil. But yeah, you don't wanna overcrowd your skillet or your pot or your deep fryer, whatever you're using. Um, and by no means, these things are not fucking pretty. <laughs> these things look like a goddamn bootleg, bootleg Twinkie. Like these, these, these are a little atrocious, but they're fucking delicious and they're, they're real, they're so authentic. Like you just, it's better, you know what I'm saying? It's better than just like some, some microwavable corn dogs you'll get from the supermarket. Like these are fucking amazing. Yeah, but you know, just go ahead and drain those on a rack like that. Then after that, you can go ahead and eat up. These things were fucking amazing. And they have a little bit of a crunch to them, and I love that. Like, that crunch is fucking, it does it for me. Like, it makes me realize that these are real. Yo, peace. What's up everybody and welcome back to Tudo Kitchen. My name is Chef Lynn and today we're gonna to be doing another Jiffy Cornbread hack. Now the last one that we did did so well 
and you guys gave me so much positive feedback that I decided to make another kind. Um, I'm doing a Southern Butter Pecan flavor and I really think that you're going to like this one, maybe even a lot better than the last one. So let's go. All right, y'all. So we're going to start off by talking about these ingredients. What I have here is two boxes of Jiffy cornbread mix. Have about a half a cup of pecans, pecans, whatever you want to call them. I have four eggs, which we're only going to need two of them. We got some brown sugar back here. Again, only around a half a cup or so. Also have about a half a cup of sweetened condensed milk. Also some Bacardi rum. And lastly, some maple syrup. All right, so we're gonna go ahead by starting out and dumping our two packages of Jiffy cornbread mix in a bowl. Now you guys know that when it comes to box recipes, I always tell you guys to make sure you get the lumps out just because they have a tendency of being really lumpy, but let's do that. Don't skip that step. All right, now you guys know I also tell you to put a crater in the middle of all sort of baked good things, and especially when you're incorporating dry and wet ingredients, it just works a little easier. We're gonna start off with two thirds cup of whole milk, heavy cream, or half and half. You can also put in two eggs, All right, now we're gonna add about a half a cup of sweetened condensed milk. All right, go ahead and mix that up nicely. Making sure to incorporate all your wet and dry ingredients evenly. All right, let's next move on to our cast iron pan. As you can see, I'm taking two tablespoons of butter um, it was room temperature butter and I'm just completely just smearing it all over the cast iron pan. Make sure you cover each and every inch of this pan. Now we're going to go ahead and add our cornbread mix in there. All right, make sure you smooth that out a little bit. Now we're going to go ahead and add our pecans on there. Now. You know, you could chop them up a bit if you like, but I just like to keep mine a little bit whole just for the aesthetics. All right, now we're gonna go ahead and take some of our brown sugar and sprinkle that on top. You don't need to use the whole thing, but just about half of it. Now we're gonna go ahead and put our cast iron pan in our oven at 400 degrees for about 15 to 20 minutes or until golden brown. Now we're gonna go ahead and put our other two tablespoons of butter in a pan and let that get nice and melted. And we're gonna go ahead and add a tablespoon of brown sugar in there. Mix that up, make sure, be careful not to let this burn. We're gonna now add about a shot of our Bacardi rum or about, about one ounce or so. All right, now that that's starting to boil, we're gonna go ahead and now we're gonna add in about a fourth cup of maple syrup. If you don't have maple syrup, then this recipe ain't gonna work. <laughs> you need to get maple syrup, guys. Um, go ahead and let that boil and bubble. And we're gonna also let it simmer until we got a nice sauce. All right, after about 15 or 20 minutes, we're gonna go ahead and take our cornbread out the oven and we're gonna start to cut it just like I'm doing now. I let it cool for about five minutes just because I don't like things that are piping out at the oven and then immediately cut it. You really shouldn't do that with anything. Um, but just take your time guys. It's a little bit harder to cut because there's pecans on top, but that's okay. If you just take your time, you'll literally get through this. All right, after you cut it in eight equal slices, we're gonna go ahead and take our sauce and just drizzle it out over the top. Do it however you like. You can start from the middle, you can start from the outside. I kind of like to make a little spiral. Um, we're not gonna completely drench this with it because it's not, it's not, it's not necessary, but there we go, guys. I hope you guys can enjoy this Southern Butter Pecan, and I hope I can change your outlook on Jiffy Cornbread and how to hack it. Enjoy, guys.
What's up everybody and welcome back to Tudup Kitchen. Today we're going to be doing yet another Jiffy Cornbread recipe. Now this recipe is going to be a little bit different. We're going to be doing sort of a brunch recipe. We're going to be doing chicken and waffles. Now I got a waffle maker over Christmas. One of my bestest friends in the world got me one and I was so excited to get it but I didn't get a chance to use it yet so I decided to make some chicken and waffles. But I decided why not use some Jiffy. So let's make it. For this recipe, we're gonna need salt, black pepper, garlic powder, a little bit of onion powder, and also some Cajun seasoning. I like to use the spice blend for any sort of basic fried chicken recipe. Uh, so that can be chicken tenders, chicken nuggets. Honestly, you could even use a fried fish too if you'd like. Now let's go ahead and season our flour with a little bit of Cajun seasoning as well as some garlic powder. We're going to start to prepare our chicken tenders to be breaded. Uh, we're going to put it in our flour first. Make sure you shake off the excess. Now we're going to go ahead and move over to our eggs. Now, you know, once you start to get used to doing it, you'll just basically start to develop your own little method. But uh, for this, I'm using flour eggs flour, but you could use flour eggs breadcrumbs or flour eggs, even cornmeal if you'd like. Again, be sure to knock off and shake off all the excess flour. You don't want all the extra stuff in your uh, oil. All right, I got my vegetable oil nice and hot. As you can see, I tested it a little bit before I dropped them in. And I just, you know, try to find a space for your last one. But, you know, if you're making more, just make sure you use a pot that's the size for the amount of chicken tenders you have. Once they're golden brown, you can go ahead and remove them from the vegetable oil. I like to use the paper towel in a bowl method, you know, it's nice and old fashioned, but if you have like a cooling rack or something, that'll work. All right, remember guys, food safety is key. You wanna always make sure you're temping your chicken, always. This is the temperature I got fresh out the hot oil. For our waffle mix, we're gonna use one box of Jeffy cornbread mix. Make sure you get out any lumps if you do have any. We're gonna use two thirds cups of heavy cream, one egg, two tablespoons of salted butter, and also one tablespoon of vanilla. Go ahead and spray with your waffle machine down with any sort of nonstick spray you have. I'm using a, a butter spray. Go ahead and just put that in there. You can use any sort of waffle maker. Don't be pressed to use the waffle maker I'm using, guys. Boom. And just make sure it's nice and golden brown like your waffle maker's instruction says to make them. And we're gonna go ahead and move it over. Now, I'm gonna list the recipe below for my spicy maple syrup because I don't really wanna make a recipe for that just yet. But I really hope you guys enjoy. It's a quick and simple recipe and a nice and nice dope hack you can do with Jiffy Cornbread. What's up everybody and welcome back to Two Dope Kitchen. Today we're going to be making some amazing ass jerk chicken alfredo. Now this spice blend in particular kind of takes a lot of ingredients so and I don't really feel like just saying them all so I'm just going to list it here. 